projects, but really building this IT delivery engine and then flowing work through that engine in a healthy way. And then technology, which is all about building things in a loosely coupled, tightly aligned, cloud-enabled cloud way and shifting left in our uh, build uh, dev test environment so that we get um, speed, better security, better compliance. And, you know, the other thing we spend a lot of time thinking about from an IT perspective is IT being a driver of culture change. And, you know, your culture is sort of the only really unique thing that you have. Um, people can steal your technology or they, they try to. That's just kind of what happens over time. But it's pretty difficult to steal somebody's culture, right? Um, it's not easy to get the operational excellence of a GE. Or how does Amazon go from selling books to being AWS? because they have a good culture of problem solving and engineering. And so, you know, having, um, if you think about sort of culture as a function of how work gets done, and the shortest distance to engaging employees is generally what's in their hand or what's on the desk, then how well we're delivering our function in IT is not trivial. It, it's actually core to creating a high performance culture where people are enabled to do the best work of their lives. And that's really how we try to think of our our role here. The other thing is, you know, this kind of idea that the product is the experience and the experience is the product. I think, you know, when I think about my own work experience, when I started work, I think there was generally a, an acceptance that enterprise things are complicated. Uh, but new people coming to work have a very different set of expectations. And their feeling is, you know who I am, you know what I do, and you have hundreds of millions of dollars to work on this problem. It should actually be better than what I have in my personal experience. And so, um, you know, every minute that people spend kind of struggling with some IT system or, or, you know, doing something that's other than what you hired them to do or the thing that they're passionate about doing is detracting from the work experience. And so IT really plays an outsized role in answering the question, what is it like to be part of this organization? Or what is it like to work at this company? And so this idea that um, today's best is tomorrow's minimum, and that that's a constantly moving goalpost, pe what people perceive as a good frictionless experience is really informed by the experiences that they're having in their personal lives. And that experience is always moving forward in the direction of simplification, despite the fact that actually the environments that we're all running is getting more complicated. So you have sort of two opposing dynamics. Our world gets more complicated, and people want us to make it simpler, which means our jobs are getting harder. We just can't expose that difficulty to the end users. So this is how the IT department is organized in Cisco. Uh, each one of these wedges of the pie represents one of my direct reports. Well, except the one that says CIO. That's me. But uh, all the other ones. And you notice the one that is in green, I highlighted in green because one of the first um, changes that I made when I became CIO was creating a new function that reports to me as a centralized function for um, experience, research, and design. And that's really because the whole strategy for how do we deliver a differentiated, great user experience to our people um, is informed by this idea of leading with design and experience in everything that we do. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But when I say design, um, yes, I mean what it looks like. But I mean much more than that. I mean, um, well, let me just back up for a second. So generally speaking, I, I want these agile teams to be cross-functional and have what they need to put things into production. With the exception of design, which I hold as a central function that reports to me. And then I act as the product owner on that team's backlog and make decisions about how that team's time is best spent. So we have requirements that come in that are our own requirements, right? No one from the business is giving us requirements for the phone system or how we do device provisioning or things like that. But then we also get requirements from the business. Um, and they can be very large or, or, or not so large. But all those things come into this funnel. And I mean the full stack of design practices to include research and analytics, content, strategy, UI, UX, and then, yes, visual, so that what comes out the other end is a great experience for people, and that we then collect feedback uh, you know, in line, through surveys, through trying to watch people do a task completion or otherwise, and that works its way into this virtuous loop of continuously improving the experience 
in the form of new requirements. Um, but, but that's really sort of the, the way that the design team is structured. And then getting after becoming an agile organization, and this is much more involved than um, just saying we're agile or taking some agile training classes, but it's actually organizing the teams person by person, bottom up into what we would consider to be a quote, well-formed agile team. And so we've, for the most part, we embrace um, the Spotify model and Scrum. So you've got the 12 Agile principles here. Those are kind of well understood. But the program is really bookended by hardline workday organization reporting on the left, or my left. Yes, your left too. And then uh, a set of measures and um, KPIs and tooling on the, on the right there. And then the whole program sort of supported by, it's actually an extension of the experience and design team, the agility team, uh, that looks at um, uh, you know, spans and layers, are teams well-formed, agile coaching, facilitating, and sort of helping the teams um, work in this way. It's like anything else. You, you get good at what you practice, and we have to develop this muscle. So when I say a well-formed agile team, what do I mean? Uh, I mean a couple of things. One is um, the so-called two-pizza rule, right? No team should be bigger than two pizzas can feed, so six to ten people. Uh, I mean that these teams are cross-functional and have all of the skills that they need to put things into production with as few dependencies on other people as possible, um, and that they're stable, that this is not a revolving door of constantly changing people, right? This is not factory work. This is complicated. It takes time to learn our environment, to learn the tools, to understand how we put things into production and how we do things. Um, and so generally the makeup is four developers, two testers, a product owner, a scrum lead, maybe a subject matter expert, and a designer who's been assigned to the scrum team for the duration of the thing that they're building. Um, oh, and if I had been here a couple of years ago, I would have said it's really important that this team is co-located sitting shoulder to shoulder. Uh, now I say it's important that they be plus or minus three hours time zone co-located. Just because if you're 14 hours apart or something, it's okay to move work around. It's just not great to fragment a team. So uh, in terms of how we're organized as a department, those green silhouettes at the bottom each represent a scrum team. Groups of scrum teams form a component. You can think of a component like a system. Uh, you know, I don't know, Salesforce or uh, SAP or Oracle or something. Groups of components create a component family. A component family is a, is a function, like quote to cash. And then uh, groups of components form a domain, and each of my direct reports are domain leaders. And that's sort of how we've done the, the uh, breakdown of Agile roles. This is my monthly operations review that I review with each of my direct reports one-on-one -on -one for an hour every month. And uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about what are the kind of golden signals that we really should care about. It's, it's actually easy to overmeasure, uh, and then you're collecting so much stuff that no one's really looking at it, and it's not part of the management system. So we tried to really be um, efficient and, and not measure anything extraneous. And where we've landed is uh, these are the things that will really tell us if we're getting better or not and making progress towards our goals. Um, Throughput is measured as the number of things that got delivered in a given two-week sprint or iteration. Um, so those are stories in JIRA. Velocity is the amount of work that's getting done as measured by story points coming out of JIRA. And all of the teams are using the same uh, modified Fibonacci sequence for story pointing. But generally speaking, it's sort of t-shirt sizing of small, medium, large that's getting translated to a point value. Cycle time how long does it take us to do something? And then the reason you have more than one series there is we're also measuring how long does it take to do the testing and how long does it get things into production, which tends to be a good proxy for automation and reuse and other things. There are areas where, like in the ERP space and stuff, where you might have prolonged testing periods with the finance teams or otherwise. Uh, backlog health, the reason we have broken this down into story backlog and feature backlog is sometimes one of the things you see is that the team's ready to take work and the backlog is actually not refined because the business hasn't done their part of it to be clear about what they're actually asking us to do. And so, um, you know, we want to have a backlog that's got, you know, 
sort of two to five sprints worth of work ready for the team to pick up there. And if that's not there, then what happens is the team goes to pick up work and then they say, hmm, I don't really know what this means. Let me spend two or three days going back to the business and asking what they really meant, which is not efficient. Uh, defects is the one that's qualitative here. That's sort of self-explanatory. Deployments to production is a good, uh, that, that's really the only leading indicator. All these other ones are kind of lagging indicators. Uh, the leading indicator is, can you put things into production every day? You know, that's a sort of good goal to have. It's not that you'd always want to do that, especially not on like a big finance system or something, but if you can, then you've solved a whole bunch of technical challenges, and that's a good goal for the team. Uh, critical incidents in meantime to recover are self-explanatory. Uh, so this is sort of like, you know, what I really ask the team to begin with when we have our monthly one-on-one -on -one MOR so that we can then have targeted discussions and a retrospective about how we get better as opposed to just going through like 50 pages of PowerPoint that say everything is great. Another thing that we can get uh, measured out of JIRA, um, here we're kind of aggregating it in a Power BI dashboard, but what percentage of the team in any particular function meets the definition of well-formed that I shared earlier in terms of having uh, the right spans and layers, the right team size, um, are they sort of ring-fenced or dedicated to a particular thing? Are we flowing work to that team as opposed to body shopping work and so on? Uh, that's the number on the bottom left there. And then the number on the bottom right, that 73% number is saying, okay, if this team is supposed to be the team that works on X, what percent of the things that that team actually delivered in the last cycle of work or sprint in JIRA was actually stuff that's associated with thing X? And here you can see it was saying 73%. So now we can have a conversation and say, well, it's great that it's 73%, but what happened to the other 27%? What happened? And then you end up having really sort of good detailed conversations about, well, the backlog wasn't ready, or it turns out test stories are not being counted against this thing in JIRA, or whatever the issue is, but you sort of get after the details. This is the, um, the management system that I have with my leadership team in terms of how do we operationalize all of this. So we have an everyday uh, check-in or check-out. It's usually a check-in. That's a 30-minute huddle. Um, and that's especially useful when we're not all together in the office every day. So the purpose of this meeting is really not meant to be for me. It's not a, uh, a random project status update that I have. It's what's top of mind for the team? What blockers do people have? What help does anybody need? What changes do people want to make each other aware of? And so on. You know, a lot happens in a big environment like ours every day. So that's the daily check-in. Then we have some weekly things. There's a, uh, you know, we have a weekly happy hour at the end of the week, which is kind of fun, but we also have a every other week review of agile org health metrics, things like well-formed teams and otherwise. Um, we have a monthly operations review, which is that dashboard that I just mentioned. We have a, mo a monthly staff meeting. Um, and then we have a quarterly in-person retro and strategy calibration meeting, and that's where we look at our OKRs and our strategy and say, do we need to tweak anything so that these things don't become something that we did once in the beginning of the year and then don't look at again for a whole year. We're kind of constantly looking at it and tweaking it. So when I think about, um, you know, especially hybrid work, the last couple of years, I view it as being chunked up into these general three phases of things, and they've been very focused on technology, then security, then culture. So initially, remember when we all uh, had to shelter in place and not go into the office, there was a lot of effort in the beginning. Are, are we going to have enough VPN and remote access capacity? Are we going to actually be able to operate the business? Can we close the quarter this way? All of us in IT always think of things in terms of what are the bad things that could happen and how do we mitigate those things? So we're always saying, well, what if this data center disappears? What if there's a fire? But it was kind of a new model. What do we do if the whole Earth has a problem at the same time? And then, once we found out, yep, it kind of seems like it's working. Well, if we went from having 370 offices to basically having 100,000 branch offices and everybody's home is now a remote branch office, what are the things that we need to do to secure our enterprise in a very different looking infrastructure and way that people are accessing things? Uh, and so especially what do we need to do on the endpoints and uh, on our, our network from a security perspective? 
And then it's not that I'd ever want to say you're, we were done with that, but once we sort of feel like we know what needs to get done, uh, then I think we entered this third phase that we're in now, which is if this is going to be, this is not a short-term arrangement, this is going to be an enduring way of working, what are the long-term consequences of working this way? Right? How do we uh, continue to create a culture of high performance, a sense of purpose, mission alignment, friendships, all those kind of things when we don't have the benefit of always being together in person? And what are the things that we can do from a technology perspective to help facilitate those things? Hybrid work um, solved some things in the sense that it removed some stressors, right? You don't have a big commute anymore. You can wear sweatpants at home and nobody knows. Um, you can hire globally. Um, you're not burning all that fossil fuel driving into work every day, all kinds of things around that. But I also think it introduced some new challenges that are uncharted territory for us. You know, there, there are days where I'm in front of my computer from 8 in the morning till 8 p.m. and I don't have time to go to the bathroom and I'm at home. You know, that would be weird in the office. So uh, the good news is all of us get a do-over. You know, the, the, the playbook on this is still being written. But I think the organizations that figure this out and get it right will be the ones that win. And speaking of um, the different dynamics of not always being together, you know, sometimes I think of this like a relationship bank. When we're together in the office and people are asking you personal questions about your family or going to a, a, a meal together or taking an interest in each other, those are kind of virtual deposits into this relationship bank. When we're asking things of each other in a work setting, those are virtual withdrawals. If all you have is withdrawals, you can get into a relationship deficit and work becomes transactional. And that's not good, right? We want to work with patriots, not mercenaries. Uh, and so it's a, it's a thing that we spend quite a bit of time thinking about, you know, how do we really address this? And everybody being remote in a lot of ways was actually a much simpler problem to solve from a leadership and from an IT perspective than what we have now, which is hybrid. Sometimes people are in the office, sometimes people are not in the office, and we need to be able to deliver an environment that is effective in all of those scenarios. And so if you think about the end-to-end -end set of things that really need to be solutioned by everybody in this room, great hybrid work, it is much more complicated than what meeting tool you're using. It's remote access, it's endpoint security, it's transport, it's last mile into the home, it's performance of the public internet backbone, how are the big SaaS providers performing? What is the observability like across networks that we don't own or manage? And oh, by the way, like I said, everybody's home office is now a branch office. So what does it mean if that branch office has also got an Xbox update that needs to happen at the exact same time that you're having a work meeting? And how do we sort of make that a reliable, great experience for people? So a good hybrid work strategy does require a network that can support that way of working. And I won't get into this in too much detail. This, this slide is an overview of our, our global network topology called CapNet, which is the Cisco all packet network. And on the map, you can see we have 12, uh, we call them cloud ports, but they're basically POPs distributed around the globe. Each POP is built in a carrier neutral facility. We try to do a lot of peering when we can, especially with people that we consume a lot of bandwidth from. A slightly different view of this, you know, there's sort of those main points of presence, uh, about 730 gigabits of aggregate WAN backbone capacity, uh, 300 plus internet exchange peers, um, um, yeah. And then this is the stack, as you would imagine, we're a big Cisco shop. Uh, but we're generally using DNA Center for the campus and the branch, uh, Viptela and v, you know, vManage for the branch WAN. Data Center is a combination of um, ACI and uh, NSO at the core, FMC for the firewalls. Thousand Eyes is a great tool that we use extensively for um, saving us a ton of time in troubleshooting a problem, but also um, understanding the performance of the global internet, SaaS providers, um, just a great observability tool. I was a big fan of Thousand Eyes before I came to Cisco, and so I can honestly say I'd be saying that even if I was not CIO of Cisco. Um, 
you know, as, as traffic patterns have shifted and fewer people are in the office, I do think this is going to impact our overall backbone design. Um, and, and we've reduced the number of WAN hubs we have, but we've, we've kept all the pops. So if you think about sort of moving to a zero trust WAN, that, that's probably where this is headed as we head down the zero trust path. So just like a good hybrid work uh, strategy requires network transformation, it also requires imp uh, a lot of focus on the employee experience. So um, we've done some, some work to, to think about how can we deliver a hybrid work experience to Cisco employees where people are not disadvantaged in any way by virtue of not being in the office. And if, if we have the great luxury of, of being Cisco and having this big, big portfolio where we could say, if we just walked through the Cisco portfolio and said, what are the things that we could bring to bear and integrate into this great experience for people that would really solve hybrid work in a meaningful way, um, with a particular focus on the integration and the experience, that's something that we've spent a lot of time on. When I first joined Cisco, this was my experience where um, they said, would you like to have a CVO? And I said, a CVO? What is that? And they said, that is a Cisco virtual office. And I said, yeah, that sounds really cool. I would like to be having a Cisco virtual office. And then this is what showed up, which, you know, it's neat. You've definitely joined a network company, but the, uh, the instructions begin by telling you what not to do. And then on the next page, if I was showing this, it would say, you know, you got to SSH into this address and kick off this command. It was kind of a lot to ask of uh, a person who is not in engineering or familiar with networking. So the team did a lot of work in close partnership with that design organization that I mentioned to say, let's back up for a minute, think about this as an end-to-end -end problem, really build a program around it, um, and integrate these things. And we came up with, this is the Cisco IT Hybrid Worker Bundle. I believe there's one, I know there's one out in the uh, ITL uh, space if you want to go look at it. But the idea is, you know, what are the things that we can bring together, integrate it, build a great experience around it, and it's sort of like a layer cake where you've got some networking equipment, some Meraki equipment, a person's laptop, their badge if they're a new employee, and then you send it to them and it's like a branch office in a box. Uh, we've deployed over 6,100 of those, so this chart is probably a week or so old, so, you know, that number just keeps ticking up. But here's basically what's in it. So it's either a WebEx Mini or a WebEx Desk, your laptop, your badge if you're a new hire. On the bottom left there is a uh, wireless access point, a, a keyboard and trackpad, because you can use that WebEx device as an external monitor, which is sort of the best way to use it. Uh, a cellular backup gateway, if you have unreliable internet, is that's the Meraki MG21E uh, there with the two antenna. And then a uh, Meraki security appliance, um, for SD-WAN there as well on the bottom right. Underpinned by all of this Cisco uh, security products and services. And so the idea is you're sort of protecting the whole home with the same suite of technology of software and hardware that governments and enterprises spend a lot of money on. And every person in the home and every device in that home then gets the benefit of being secured and more reliable. And we can then know that employees are uh, going to have a much better hybrid work experience. So just sort of thinking of this as an end-to-end -end program, you know, it's not just shipping equipment to people. There is an ordering experience. There's a set of emails and a consumerized experience around it. Congratulations, your order has shipped. Today's the day it's arriving. Here's how you set it up. Here's where you go for help. The packaging experience. A lot of work has gone into uh, building this package that isn't just good-looking and recyclable, but also that it's sort of telling a story with a beginning and a middle and an end, and you're opening it in a certain sequence, and it makes sense, uh, that the provisioning experience is great, where, you know, step one, turn it on, step two, log in with credentials, step three, there is no step three, everything else just kind of happens. Um, and monitoring proactively to know where we'll know there's a problem before an employee knows there's a, a problem, providing a great support experience, and then all of the things that need to happen at the end of life of that asset, either to get a new one or to separate from the company. And making all of that stuff really frictionless for people is a big part of the hybrid experience. Um, and so early results, you know, you got to be a little careful about cause and effect. But there's an awful lot of corroboration that says when we give people one of these hybrid worker bundles, the outcomes are better 
in terms of whatever they had before versus our equipment is a significant improvement in terms of less latency, less packet loss, less jitter, much better DNS lookup times. All of that stuff is going to translate to uh, a better meeting experience, a better workday, less stress around connectivity or having problems at their remote environment. And that seems to be corroborated by employee satisfaction. The employees that we have given one of these hybrid worker bundles to uh, have a 13% higher satisfaction with IT than uh, those who have not yet received one. This is the new hybrid work operations center that we're building in San Jose. Uh, this is a staffed sort of a knock where a lot of this telemetry comes in. And um, we're able to proactively monitor what is going on at our uh, endpoints and um, reach out to people and say, you know, we're noticing your, your wireless access point is kind of far away from your, uh, your WebEx device. And could you move those things closer? Or could you hardwire in? Or whatever the issue is. Part of the return to office experience as well is something we've thought about, because the office is a different proposition now, right? We're not completely getting rid of the office, but the role of the office is changing where it's less of a place that you're going to go eight hours a day and do individual work, and it's more of a place where we sometimes gather for some purpose. So we have to do some work to make the value proposition of coming to the office worth the commute. Um, and so rather than say, you know, you got to come, it's, it's, it's a, a magnet, not a mandate. It's not you have to come into the office. It's the office is here as a benefit for you, and we're going to do a lot of work to make that a great experience for you and your team when you want to gather there. One of those things is around getting support. We still have staffed help desks at the office, but there's also these help zone kiosks uh, where you walk up, you get support. If we can't fix the problem uh, remotely and it turns out it's a hardware issue, we can remotely open one of those lockers and give you a replacement laptop. Or you can swipe your badge and uh, get an accessory or PPE or otherwise. So just a great experience for people. And in general, that's sort of a design point of what we're trying to do is you know, well-designed things don't need a lot of adoption and enablement. People will pull it from you. You don't have to push it on them. Whenever I see a lot of money going after adoption and enablement, it's a big red flag. You know, I would rather really treat the disease than the symptom. Uh, and same thing with our Mac program. You know, we've done a lot of work to make that a zero-touch cloud-based provisioning experience for people so they can have a, a great Apple unboxing experience without having IT in the middle of it. About 60% of our workforce is currently on Mac, and uh, preference continues to grow that way. But we've also integrated the uh, Jamf enrollment in our MDM with WebEx. So as soon as you enroll a device, the WebEx uh, bot pops up and, and says, you know, thank you for enrolling your Mac, and here's some other things you might want to do. Uh, that's also especially important in a hybrid environment, right, where uh, in all likelihood, the way most people are getting their laptops is either in these hybrid worker bundles or being sent to them as part of a refresh. Even basic things like, you know, having a great mobile directory for, uh, for employee lookup with reverse um, caller ID lookup so that if you get a call from somebody at the office, it tells you who it is and offline access if you're not online and all kinds of things. Seems like an obvious thing, but it was a gap. And, Within, I think, 72 hours of rolling this out, we had over 12,000 people install it, and people really like it, and you know, just taking care of the basics. The office experience, like I said, you know, that is becoming less of um, cubes and individual offices and much more around collaboration spaces. And one of the things, this is an example of the hoteling space where you walk up, you touch your cell phone, it configures the whole thing for your identity and your persona. Um, but we are also collecting a lot of telemetry from cameras, wireless access points, air quality sensors, occupancy sensors, the WebEx devices in the room, and bringing that all together in, into a real-time view of what is happening in that physical space so that when you come into the office, you can navigate directly to the room you're going to. You can know what the uh, environment is like. You can interact with that environment through the WebEx devices. If you ever have a chance to go into one of the Cisco offices, it's a pretty neat tour if you haven't done it. But you know, here are some pictures around um, examples of some of the new office space and, and how that's evolving. Uh, I think this one is the Atlanta office. Yeah, there it is. So, you know, as I sort of wrap up here, um, in all of our roles, 
you're all probably making a thousand decisions a day, and sometimes those things feel kind of tactical. How should I configure the VPN? How do we want to do M MDM? How do we want to do zero trust? How do we want to do mobile device enrollment? Whatever it is. And that individual point decision feels like you know, we're always making trade-offs between cost and time and otherwise. But when you add them all up, they sort of collectively form the answer of what is it like to work here, which is another way of saying they kind of collectively form your way of working and your culture. And so I really think in a very re real way, everybody in this room is a designer of the future of work. And it's good to kind of think of it that way because we want to be deliberate and thoughtful about the kind of future that we're all building and, and think of the totality of all of these decisions and how it impacts the people that are working in these environments. So uh, what we're trying to do is really lead with the employee experience in everything that we do. A hybrid work strategy does require a hybrid network strategy. We really want to get after having a great best-in-class hybrid work experience and program for our employees. Um, agility is our path to getting more work done to a higher quality. Positioning IT as this digital transformation engine that is moving the business forward and enabling our people, and not just as a cost center. And leading with the good, not the negative. You know, make it a magnet, not a mandate. And with that, um, thank you so much for your time, and uh, let me invite our hosts back on stage. Thank you. And welcome back to our Cisco TV studio here in the middle of the world of solutions. We are so glad to have all of you with us across the streaming broadcast for Cisco Live in Las Vegas. Remember, keep reaching out to us on any and every social media platform using hashtag Cisco Live. If you are watching us internationally, you can view this stream in 11 languages at CiscoLive.com. And then if you miss anything, anything at all, all of the content is available for you online at ciscolive.com slash on demand. Go and check that out. I want to go back to the opening keynote this morning, just for a moment. Something that we heard from Jonathan that is so important, simplification. It is such an important aspect and element of everything that we are doing and talking about this week. Jonathan said, when you simplify IT, you simplify operation. Well, simplification, makes your job easier. We are seeing that all over the world of solutions here today, including the Simplify IT area right back here on the showcase. We heard about it this morning. Davis had an opportunity to interview Ken in the NFL zone. We talked about simplification there in that connection, right? Simple connectivity and security for a greater game day experience. Well, creating simplicity, that starts at the concept, the origin of technology, early investment, in intelligent, streamlined operation and reliable security, that is what makes simplicity possible and native to an application, an API, a connected solution. Well, guess what? One of the global leaders in early investment for next generation technologies, Cisco Investments. We had Derek Itamoto and Allison Pace here on set from the Cisco Investments team in studio yesterday and right now. Our own Annie Murphy is over in the investment village. Hello, Annie. Hey, Steve. Yes, as you were saying, I'm actually not that far from you. If you just look over your left shoulder, I Steve, you'll see me. here. Oh, yeah, right over there. I am over here oh, in you. Investments <laughs> Village with Head of Portfolio Development at Cisco, Nida Shetty. Can you tell us a little bit what's different this year with Cisco Investments versus last year? Yeah. Um, hey, thank you, firstly. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, well, we were not here last year, so the difference is we are here this year. That's very yeah. exciting, and, but this is not your first Cisco Live. This isn't. We've uh, not participated after pandemic, but we've had presence in several years uh, before that, yes. Yes, okay, so tell me a little bit about these. We're showcasing 14 different startups here with like their kind of disruptive technologies, mm -hmm. cutting edge kind of ideas and we're kind of incubating them. Uh, we've got folks from, what's it, collaboration, mm -hmm. full stack observability, and my favorite, security. Uh, why don't we come over and meet some of these folks, right? So you're yeah. going to introduce me to some guys here? Absolutely, let's walk. Yeah, so we have over here, it's, so who do we have over here? Hi, Sarah. Hi, yes, 
My name is Shay, and I'm a senior director at ICERA. We are uh, basically providing uh, chat GPT and enterprise solutions uh, for the enterprise, essentially. So give me an example of how chat GPT can be an enterprise solution for customers. Yeah, so we've been in this business for five years, and we have specific, um, sorry, are you guys recording right now? Oh, okay. Um, um, the way we actually do this is we're bringing, we're trying to deliver em exceptional employee and uh, customer experiences. And the way we're doing this is we're building large language models, including uh, with the optionality of using ChatGPT. And at the end of the day, we're trying to provide employees and customers that experience where they can now conversationally resolve some of their requests that are coming in so that we can help organizations help in saving, reducing costs and of course eliminating those L1 and L2 types of requests that are coming in from employees and customers as well. Oh, thank you so much. So we can actually use ChatGPT to kind of unburden that tier one level and then we can actually have those support people actually work on more specialized cases. We're gonna move a little bit on, we're gonna move here, we're gonna, I think you said full noble, stack observability? Yes, it's Noble, noble Nine. Noble uh, Nine. It's in a space of observability. So right here, yeah. we JP. Hi there, how are you? So tell us what you're showing. So we're showing right now a service level objective. And it's our platform that basically helps you with better liability. And we basically pull in information from AppDynamics and Thousand Eyes, and hopefully soon FSO. And um, this allows us to be able to look at uh, error burn rates and how we're actually able to stay ahead of outages and downtime. Excellent, can you give me an example of anything else that's going on between what Noble Nine is doing, and with Cisco specifically. Yeah, so we're actually, we're actually right now working closely with Cisco, and um, outside of adding reliability to AppDynamics and Thousand Eyes customers, we're helping them migrate to AppDynamics and Thousand Eyes, and hopefully help them migrate faster to FSO. Oh, we like that. Thank you so much. And then I think we got hit for one more. We're going to go over to security now. A company in the enterprise browser All right. space. We're here with Island. So, Richard, is that your name? That's my name. All right. So, we're live here on Cisco Live. Can you tell us a little bit what Island does? Yes. So, Island, the browser is the application that enterprises use the most but trust the least. So, Island give back the control, visibility, and governance to the enterprise, which makes the user more productive, reduces the risks in the enterprise, and it uh, ensures that the customer is able to deploy this for less money than they're currently spending today. And it works extremely well with everything that you're doing here at Cisco. Do you have any examples of what Island is doing directly with Cisco today? Uh, yeah, so we have several customers, for example, that will be, there are business process that organizations that have thousands of customer success agents that are helping customers do customer success. And the way they, what we do is make sure that those uh, users aren't able to steal any information or um, uh, do unnatural things. So we give back the control, and all of this is done on a Cisco network. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. So one of the other things that I think is really awesome here today in Investments Village, of the 14 companies that we're showcasing here, eight of them are security. We got to feature Island, but we also have different customers or different companies here that also represent identity security. What yes. else are we having here? We have companies in identity security, SaaS security, data security, uh, AI for security. So yeah, it kind of- Oh, kinda, so we have ChatGPT kind of for collab, but we also have yeah. security. So if you're going to deploy it, we also have ways to secure it as well. Right, you have AI models. How do you secure those AI models? So we have our latest investment, Robust Intelligence, which secures the AI model. All right, well, thank you so much, Nita. What are you most, like, final question, what are you most looking forward to outside of investments for this week since it's, you weren't here last year? Oh, I'm looking forward for tonight's celebration. Oh, that's right, tonight's <laughs> celebration. I don't know if anyone said anything about that yet. We're going to go back to Steve in studio. Thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you for Let's having go. us. Great job, Andy. Thank you so much, and thank the team over at Cisco Investments for us. We absolutely appreciated the incredible work that they do. They are so good at going out and finding those organizations 
organizations that are developing the ground up support for expanding the one Cisco end to end portfolio story. Bravo, Cisco Investments. We love, love, love what you are all about. As far as the uh, customer appreciation event tonight that you just heard about, for those who are here in Las Vegas with us, guess what? Incredible stuff. Gwen Stefani, Blake Shelton, great celebration and party happening tonight. You got to be here in the room with us. Earlier in the week, our own Nish Parker hosted our next gen panel here at Cisco Live, and that featured Cisco's senior vice president and chief marketing officer, Kerry Palin. They sat down with an incredible panel to talk about Cisco's next gen initiative. Let's listen in. Now this is the first time that we've been together for the next gen program. It's new to Cisco Live, so who's excited? Yeah. <laughs> the intent around next gen as, as an actual track, but um, all the all the content and engagement is around really investing in our next generation cohort of Ciscoians, partners, customers, and future leaders, right? So I am a next-gen Ciscoian, just two years into my career here at Cisco, and... Yeah! <laughs> Y'all are the future of Cisco, of our industry, of the world, and um, completely in on making that a great transition for each of you. So I actually first attended Cisco Live when I was in college, so I'm so happy to see Cisco making an effort to make that available to individuals who are early in career. You know, when I got to Cisco, our assertion was, hey, we're trusted, we're iconic, we're not necessarily viewed as super modern and 21st century relevant to millennial Gen Z and the next generation of our buyer cohort as well as our employee cohort, which is even more important, is attracting talent, retaining talent. One of the things that I love about Cisco and is so important to me when choosing a career, and probably many of you, is not just the technology that a company provides, but how that company interacts with the community and the world around it. So, you know, we mentioned sustainability. Cisco's commitment to being carbon neutral is very important to me. Um, I think it's important that a company is aligned with the things that I believe in. We were talking about what matters to this cohort, what matters to their career and their career growth and all the things. A lot of Gen Z cohort do not want to live in one place and anchor themselves to this city or I have to move to this city to work. There's so much of, hey, I want to be a global citizen and I want to work for somebody who allows for me to work from anywhere. Lean into all of the opportunities to the networking, not just routing and switching, but the human <laughs> aspect of yeah. networking. Um, lean in, make friends, gain a mentor or a sponsor or just a peer. When you apply for a job at Cisco.com, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there is, uh, there's wording there that says, tattoos, show them off, bright hair, don't care, we're happy to have you how you are. And when I got to Cisco, I realized that that meant so much more than just a few words on the bottom of a page. Thinking about the innovation, all the ideas that are coming from our next generation cohort and what they're actually doing with it and putting into action is so inspiring. Amazing, thank you so much for joining, Kerry. Oh, fantastic. Kerry Palin is such an inspiration and a motivation. We really need this driving force. How do we find the skill sets of tomorrow? How do we take this potential shortage in those skill sets in technology and not only get them where they need to be, up-level them in their own careers, but attract them in with us here at Cisco? Kerry is an amazing force for making that happen. And thank you so much for, uh, uh, to Nish Barker for hosting that session. Great next gen session. Annie, you're still out walking around in the showcase somewhere out there. Where are you right now? Oh, I'm actually Again, I like to be very close to you, Steve. I feel a little insecure if I'm not within throw distance of you. I am right <laughs> behind you, inside, deeper into the showcase floor. I'm right in front of, actually, I'm right between the network side as well as the Simplify IT side and the NFL. So it's not that I ever get to say this, but we have an NFL station within our showcase here in the world of solutions, which is pretty awesome. It is, and we've been actually, uh, uh, Davis was out earlier today with Ken talking about the NFL activation with 
cards in the showcase. We just talked about a simplification, simplifying IT a moment ago. Mm -hmm. And right now, we were just talking about the next gen initiative. How do we attract those next great thinkers, the next great skill sets within technology to bring us where we want to go into yeah. this inclusive future? You have been with Cisco for a good chunk of time now. I won't <laughs> say the number of years you said I, it earlier I'm today. Waiting. Well, all right. You go ahead and say it. I'll leave it to you. What attracted you to Cisco in the first place when you kicked off with this organization? So, so I joined Cisco straight out of college as well. So I actually graduated in the late 90s and was recruited as well. And then I did my internship as a software development intern and then graduated and came out as a software engineer at Cisco doing voice over IP management before yeah. we, I don't know if anyone cares about dial tone anymore, but that was one of my first roles when I was at Cisco. But I appreciate you bringing that up. <laughs> That's right, because you and I have been around the same amount of time. Annie, yes. stay uh, tight to the camera. We're going to keep coming back to you. Thank you for yes. reporting from out in the field. Right now, we are going to head into our next innovation talk that is kicking off in just a couple of minutes. We are going to discover some ways to elevate and to secure digital experiences for our businesses. Every business is now a digital business. Application-driven experiences, those are, are your lifeblood. You want to bring those to life. You got to do it at scale. You got to do it securely. And that requires an ability to see and to understand and to intelligently manage our infrastructure, our applications. And that's regardless of where they live. Whether they happen to be on-prem or in the cloud or in hybrid environments, no matter where they are, you have to have the ability to very easily determine and reflect the business context that is tied to infrastructure performance and to experience delivery. Well, Cisco Innovations are enabling you to innovate and elevate digital experiences for your business and to position yourself and your team as a true growth partner with the business. So, if we take a look at full stack observability, for example, it allows you to move beyond monitoring. It gives you the power to run your estate and your applications in the most proactive and effective, secure way possible. All right, so we're going to head out into the iTalk right now. Enjoy, and we'll meet you right back here when it's done. So welcome uh, to this session. Thank you to everyone in the room, and thank you for everyone online. I'm Gene Hall, Vice President of uh, Marketing and Communications for uh, the team that is bringing to life full stack observability. Uh, for Cisco. Uh, so what is this crazy full stack observability thing that uh, you've seen everybody talk about? It's on 70 foot signs up and down the Las Vegas Strip. Uh, well, in the end, the way to think about it is, it is something that is going to make everyone's lives easier and more impactful. Uh, from an IT perspective, from an app dev perspective, from a SecOps perspective. It's also something that is incredibly important in today's world where uh, businesses are run with and through digital experiences that are delivered through modern application. So what it is that FSO delivers, relevant, impactful, and actionable business insights, not just technology insights. It helps break down silos between the teams that I just mentioned who are being forced to work more closely together than ever. And it helps you and your businesses assure flawless, always-on digital experiences at scale. So. I'm going to state the obvious, you know, many of you have phones in your hand. Uh, applications are the front door to every business now. And no matter how you consume them, on a mobile device, et cetera, uh, they're absolutely critical. And our expectations around these applications have just gone up, right? Uh, you know, for those of us who uh, were born before iPhones, uh, we remember kind of like the early days of these things, both from a consumer perspective and a, and a business application perspective. But now, we actually use this to run every part of our lives, whether it's engaging with healthcare providers, engaging with, uh, with uh, public sector, and you'll hear from an awesome partner and colleague and, and customer in, in a moment who can go deep on public sector. Uh, so our, our bar has gone up, and in the end, that has direct impact to everybody's business in the room. So when we talk about the business impact of assuring flawless always on digital experiences, uh, know that digital experience right now is a boardroom KPI. 
It's a boardroom KPI in terms of how these experiences bring to life the value proposition of everyone's company or organization. Uh, obviously, compliance, risk, security, et cetera, all of these things are paramount, and they all get reported up through various committees and up to the board. So no longer is just ensuring uptime something that IT worries about, the entire business worries about it. Modern distributed applications are also complex, right? Powerful, uh, deliver a lot that, uh, that people can take advantage of. But in the end, if you think about how they're built, the tools to build these things are everywhere, and those are moving faster. Uh, you've got combinations of developers using open source and, and commercial products and on-prem and hybrid and cloud and multi-cloud environments. You've got cloud-native applications. In the end, though, most of you and most of everyone at this, uh, at this event are on the hook to make sure that all of that is working properly. So you are held accountable day to day to work with app devs and sec ops and compliance teams. You have to report up to your managers and the CIOs. Many of you are CIOs. You have to report up to the board. That is a tall task, and that's just accelerating. It's, it's not going to slow down. The genie's out of the bottle. In a recent study that IDC just completed that we, we've published, uh, over 2,000 global organizations responded. And 56% uh, of these organizations said just for monitoring and observability, they're using uh, over 10 solutions. 10%, so 200 of these organizations, said that uh, they're using up to 100 different tools just to get a handle as to what's happening in their environment. That's not sustainable. 60% say that the tools they have only give them a, a narrow aperture into what's really happening. And so you gotta be able to broaden the aperture. You gotta do it in a way that addresses heterogeneous environments. You gotta do it in a way that actually gives you insight. And 74% of them say they struggle with data collection, interpretation, et cetera. You know, the so whatness, the stuff that's actually gonna help everyone do their jobs better. So, all of this, obviously, complexity, uh, the data overload. Hopefully you saw the Anthem video in Liz's uh, keynote. That, that's, it was you know, a humorous term, but it's true. Uh, tool sprawl, higher TCO, friction between these teams, because everyone is really trying to do the right thing, but they have no way to really work effectively together right now. All of these things are what we are all facing at the moment. And 71% of the respondents, and many of you that I've spoken with this week, believe that having a unified observability platform and set of solutions that can actually bring together data from across heterogeneous environments, no, no matter where they live, and contextualize them and tie them with business impact is absolutely essential. So that's what it is that we're delivering with Cisco Full Stack Observability. That's what we're announcing this week at scale, is the ability to deliver the most optimal and secure digital experiences for your users and, and your applications. And we know that doing that is gonna drive revenue for your business, it's gonna reduce the complexity and the tool sprawl, it's gonna make you safer, you can address issues in a more targeted and timely fashion. Uh, and in the end, right, it's gonna make your customers and your business happier. So how is Cisco FSO helping? We allow you to observe what's happening end to end, no matter where your infrastructure lives, you know, top to bottom, full stack, we help you secure effectively with business context, we help you optimize your limited resources that you have from an IT perspective so they could work on the most important things, and then uh, hopefully you saw in the announcement, we actually have partners developing on top of the platform already, Evolutio, Canary, Cloud Fabrics, more to come, plus what we have launched is also programmable yourself. So it is a way to address the most important use cases in your organization. And again, the most critical thing in the end, all of this is tied to business context. So to tell you a little bit more about how this works is the person whose team, and the person himself, who actually built this amazing technology. I want to welcome my friend and colleague, SVP and GM of FSO and Cisco App Dynamics, Ronik Desai. Thank you, Thank you very much, Gene. Before we get started, I have two teenager daughters in my house. So if I lose track of my talking track, you know what is going on. I'm sure you heard Gene today about his five kids. Anyway, um, thank you, Gene. 
So today we are going to just dive a little bit, double click onto Cisco Full Stack Observability and why we are taking a platform approach. As Gene was talking about, 11 to 100 tools to monitor and deliver that best in class end user experience. Think about it, how difficult it is. The complexity, you all deal with it. And the friction between the team, which this causes it. We at Cisco are really wanting to build a platform in an open fashion. And the reason it is important to build it in open fashion, we'll build a lot of tools and applications on top of the platform, but there are verticals which we do not have expertise. Healthcare may be being one of them. Maybe there are verticals like financial operations where we may not have expertise. So that's why we wanted to build this platform. First of all, take the platform approach so that we can open it up to our ecosystems, to our customers who wants to build applications on top of it, or to our partners who wants to actually build and value add into what we are delivering it. So being open, not just from an API perspective, but ability for our customers and partners to drop if they want to ingest a new telemetry, if they want to modify the UI, because they have a different procedure for operation perspective. That's why we wanted to build and take a platform approach. Extensibility, as I've been talking about, it's, it's super critical when you want to open it up to the ecosystem. We have an eight degree of extensibility on this platform. It's not only about modifying and making UI better, but also ability to ingest new telemetry. Also ability to create different personas and so that they can have a, this view on the data which is coming in in the platform. Fundamentally, if you look at it, observability is a data problem, right? We are bringing in the data from network, security, and application, and bringing it all together. And then you have different ops teams. Our goal at Cisco is not to force change organization structure in your uh, organization but allow and build the tools so that you have better collaboration across those ops teams, right? And when we t talk about data, scalability is a huge thing for it. So we build this platform in a horizontal scalable way so that not only it's cost effective so that we can pass those savings back to you, but you are also able to bring all kind of telemetry and come up with some new interesting use case. At Cisco, we have, in the last couple of years, we have changed the way we come across and drive the businesses and drive some of the use cases with you. We do not want to be selling you the bag of tools. We really want to kind of give you that holistic experience which you all expect uh, us to do it. Jonathan had a nice analogy this morning about getting the swatch and you stitching it together for a cozy uh, blanket. So again, being flexible in terms of how you consume and how you uh, explore those use cases is very, very fundamental. So just kind of double clicking on what it means from a platform perspective. I spoke about a little bit about open. How many of you are familiar with open telemetry? It's the second most popular project in CNCF. First one is a Kubernetes. And you'll be surprised to know we are number one, Cisco is a number one contributor when it comes to open telemetry. So we pivoted really hard and made sure that we build the platform around open telemetry. I'm sure you've heard about agent sprawls, right? There's an agent for security, there's an agent for WebEx, there's an agent for 1000 nights, there's an agent for app uh, dynamics, and I'm sure that you have other agents in your systems, right? So really trying to go and leverage open telemetry so that you can at least get a lot of value out of the box without installing 10 agents, which are, by the way, consuming some CPU cycles as well on, on your machines. So this, that's the reason we kind of pivoted around open telemetry. For an observability platform, if it didn't cover the four aspect of it, it wouldn't be complete. It's metrics, events, logs, and traces. A lot of vendors out there which do that. The way we differentiate ourselves is, not only we can take the melt data, fondly called melt, uh, metrics, events, logs, and traces, from one domain, but we take it across all the domains which we are ingesting it. And ability to cross correlate out of the box across those domains is sort of built into the platform. Things which are built into the platform are things like ML, so your application, which are getting built on top of it, don't have to write dynamic baseline, don't have to write the algorithms to kind of figure out what are the anomalies, uh, set up the dynamic rules. <clears throat> Those capabilities are out of the box supported. <clears throat> Having said that, a platform without application would not be too useful, right? And I've sure that a lot of people who have built uh, platforms around it. 
we believe that opening up to the ecosystem, considering the segment we are playing into it, is, is extremely critical. So the application which you see it in the blue are the one which we are building it ourselves at Cisco. Of course, we are doing a heavy investment in nurturing and building things around it so that our partners can expand it, but we are also building a lot of applications. Because early days of platform, we absolutely want to make sure that we build that ecosystem so that we can showcase it to you all, get this adopted, get our partner excited. Having said that, I'm very happy to announce that we have three partners who have already built application on top of it. And they are actually showing it on the world of solutions. So if you have not got a chance, please do go visit them as well as we have a fantastic set of demos available on World of Solutions. One of the applications which I wanted to kind of do a double click on it is the cloud native application observability. As Gene was talking about, your application landscape is extremely compli complicated, especially when it comes to modern application, which are built around Kubernetes. It's very distributed, right? Think about three, three tiers applications for some of, who, uh, some of you who have a lot of gray hair like me. From there, we're going to this heavy distributed architecture, which is spread around network. And in that environment, getting the visibility into what is going on is where we are trying to attack. One of, if I just said cloud cost, a lot of you will start to pay attention here. Cloud cost for your modern applications or any application deployed on the public cloud is a big concern for your CIOs. Getting insight in terms of where you are spending your money is very, very important to understand the cost distribution. Having said that, it's not too useful to get the visibility, but if, it would be great if we can give you the insights in terms of how can you optimize those application resources which you allocated, whether it's a vCPUs or memory or whatever have you. So we, of course, do that. But then ability to take action on those recommendations and actually implement those in production environment is super powerful. And this is what, when we are talking about cost insight and application resource optimization, we are talking about it. To do, do a double click before I go there. Um, you know, when you talk about cloud and modern application monitoring, every public cloud vendor has a ton of applications uh, on services which your application teams are using it. So getting the deep visibility of those services which your applications are using is, is important out of the box. So as you can see, we have a rich ecosystem which we have done it across three major public cloud and we're bringing this visibility natively available in cloud native application observability. But to, as I was talking about cost insight, to really double click on it and really show you this in action rather than bore you with PowerPoint, I would like to invite Renato, Director of Engineering, uh, working in our full stack observability group. Renato, welcome. Good to see you. All right. All right, let's unlock this. Okay. okay All right, so what are we going to show Renato today? Okay, so as you can see here, Ronak was talking about the platform and the capabilities that we built to support full stack observability. To prove the power of the platform, the first application we built, it's cloud native application observability. See now as the friends and family know it, will basically be capable of covering multiple domains. So to show the power of bringing the telemetry from multiple sources, correlating them, making them available for different personas, we create a CNOW with multiple kind of modules. So when you look at here, you can see CNOW is capable of doing APM or Kubernetes monitoring infrastructure. So those modules were designed in a way that can not only serve the persona within that domain, but also bringing insights from different domains so those personas yep. can be aware of their surroundings. So let's start by yep. infrastructure, right? You're talking yep. about hosts, EC2, yep. costs, let's go there. And this is the cross melt, right? This is the uh, associating and kind of correlating across different domains. Yes, basically, one of the powers of the platform is when we bring the melt telemetry, it always is a cross melt. Even our query language, it's quite powerful. When you query, you can fetch multiple types of melt signals within one single query. You can say, yep. bring me the metric CPU utilization plus the logs for an entity. So I can do that. So let's go and take a look at hosts. This is a typical way that we represent the UI for a persona. Mm -hmm. In this case, we're talking about someone looking at infrastructure. To the left, you can see that I have not only the information about my hosts in the middle, but on the left, I see a map 
yeah. that we designed to help people understand what else was related to it. Right. So now I know these are all the hosts that I see, and I can see that on the list field, but we also produce in-context visualizations for those people. So I can come here and say, I don't want to see in the list view, I want to see in the dashboard view. Right. So, uh -huh. And the context is maintained. Yeah. So I'm still looking at the same list, yeah. but now I'm giving an overlap. Yeah, and filtered it to the relevant resources which are uh, Correct. of interest. Yes. That's powerful. So now when I'm here, I'm looking at this and saying, well, I'm actually focusing on high CPU costs like you were mm. talking about. Yeah. And I see that there is this top guy here. Let's just look at the one that's the highest cost, this guy yeah. here. So I'm going to go and click on it. Now I'm going back from the big picture to the narrow right there and telling you here is this host. And as we can see here, for the last four hours, this host cost us 137 and 32 cents. Wow. Eh, okay, not too bad. But the reality is from that amount of money, you are only consuming 41.75. Wow. Idle cost 95.75. Wow. That's what you're throwing away. That's 70 percent. Do you want to save some money? So exactly. I think I would love to figure it out. What can we do, and what can we offer out of the box to figure it out? What can be done on this particular entity? Sure. So we're talking about cloud native applications, right? Mm -hmm. That server just so happens that it's it's a node in a whole in a cluster. So if I scroll here, I can see the cluster that is related to, right? And I can go to the cluster, or I can go here. I'm going to go into the cluster. So this is the cluster now. You see yeah. the number is smaller, uh, but the cluster now has the workloads. So if I go here, I can click on a workload that is in red. Mm -hmm. At the top, right away, you can see ARO. So you got costing yeah. sites. We yeah. see that that workload is 77.49. Yeah. And at the top, of course, our profiler is looking at it and say, hey, there's an excessive cost thing here. And actually, if I look to the analysis details, According to our profiler, we can provide improvement in cost efficiency for this guy if we optimize it. Yeah, let's try it, see if we can optimize and see how much saving is. Let's give it a try. So when I click in optimize workload, now we have the ability to check the prerequisites. I go mm -hmm. next. In here, I have the freedom to configure. So I can put guardrails on it. I can say, look, I am cost-centric, or I want boost performance and don't care much about the cost. Mm -hmm. Well, in our case here, we care about the cost, so I'm not going to boost performance. I'm going to go yes. for the costing, right? So I can put guardrails on it, and I'll say start optimization. When I do so, what happens is you see on the top, it's in discovery mode. Mm -hmm. This is going to take a while. It takes about 30 hours. Why? Because our ML models are going to start running mm -hmm. possibilities and canary workloads to verify is this matching the profile that we right. assign or not. Yeah. And it will go for a while until it finds it. So this, I'm going to let this run, and I'm just going to go back to the workloads. Yeah. Before we started, I kicked off a few of them. And I'll show you this one that we finished. OK, all right. So if you can see, it's finished optimizing, and it has mm -hmm. recommendations for you. So yeah. you can go and click Recommendations. Yep. And then from this perspective, we provide you through three aspects every time. You have the optimal, uh, which is going to be balancing out the cost and performance. Right. And you can focus on either better performance or lower cost. With this capabilities, we basically, we have services that could take that recommendation and continuously improve for you. So you never have to On an to ongoing touch basis. On an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. But we decided to start with some restrictions. A lot of our customers say, hey, we don't want that thing taking over. Yeah. We want our SRE team to take the data and apply it. Mm -hmm. So they can take these recommendations now, go make their changes, and they will observe the savings that we want. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. But so <clears throat> we figured it out that there's an opportunity with this workload. But you know what? When applications are built in any organization, there are a lot of dreams involved in it, right? So I really would like to see if I can action certain teams if they have an overutilization of resources. Can tool help here? Yes, that's actually a problem that we suffer ourselves. Like my teams basically today are responsible to watch because we have costing sites. Yeah. They now can watch what they are responsible for. The tricky part is that depending on the organization, they may use, they may be bound by a namespace or they may be bound by tags. Mm -hmm. And that goes across different clusters, different regions. Yeah. And we want to yeah. be able to consolidate that for the team to know no matter where their services are going, I can see my cost. So I'm going to go back to observe here. 
And if you scroll down, Cost Insights provides you a Teams view. So when I land here, I can see the Team Tino, actually. I'm going to click here and see what is Tino doing. Like, total yeah. cost, 559 If I click on it, now I know that Team Tino is actually deploying things over all these clusters. Mm -hmm. And actually, they own two namespaces. They own AppDynamics and Default. Yeah. So no matter where those namespaces are used, those belong to Tino. We know and we track so, in over time. So now Team Tino knows exactly what to do and the recommendation. Correct. This is super powerful. I'm sure the CIOs out there will be waiting to get their hands onto this tool. Congratulations, Leonardo, to you and your team to build this amazing capability for our Thank customers. you so much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Thank you for having me. So you saw how powerful it could be to get the insights, but then getting the recommendations. And when we talk about recommendation and implementing those, we are still maintaining the SLA, which your applications team and your end users are expecting, right? So we're measuring latency jitter of the transaction which are coming into the applications, making sure that you're still meeting your targets and optimizing the resources. Extremely powerful, out of the box capability. So the next one which I wanted to kind of talk about was the digital experience monitoring. If you look at the digital experience monitoring, we are defining that as it is experienced by your end users who are using your applications, all the way from a mobile or a browser, from the plane or from a Starbucks nearby, they're accessing their applications inside your data centers. And there's a big internet in the middle. And those applications may be accessing the SaaS API to finish the payment transaction, for example. If you look at it, each of this domain and segment, today, most of the teams have different tools. There is network intelligence from a thousand eyes perspective, which monitors the, your ISP network, your cloud infrastructure. There is the end user monitoring, which is monitoring your browser and uh, uh, your mobile applications. And then there is the application performance monitoring, which is in your data centers. Now, when you have really the end user experiencing performance issues, it is really difficult to correlate all those things together. And if you have to do it today, it takes hours and probably a lot of war room with a whole bunch of people in it trying to figure it out where the problem is so that actually you can quickly fix it. First of all, triage it, fix it, and get it back in the, uh, in the service for your end users. But what if, what if, if we were able to bring all the telemetry from all the segments in a platform and deliver that end-to-end capability for you to narrow it down and potentially fix the problem right there. You'll be able to do that in order of minutes. And these are not just the stats I'm putting in together. These are some of our customers who have sort of validated the notion when we bring it in end user experience, internet insights, APM functions, and some of the security aspect of it. That's how it's powerful it is. Because at the end of the day, in the, this age, Every end user who is accessing your application, we have very little patience. If application is not responding, we're going to switch the tab and move to something else. So it becomes extremely critical. The second topic which I wanted to talk to you, again, this is another application which is built on top of the platform. And when we talk about building application on the uh, top of the platform, it's not a different UI. It is part of the same console, right? We're trying to solve the tools for all problem. We're not trying to create more tools for you, right? So consolidating that telemetry and giving you the insight for your use case is what we are trying to drive it here. Business is observability is really a simple definition which basically takes the business context. And I think this is super critical when we talk about full stack observability. Anything and everything what we do, we want to make sure that we are tying it together with the business context because that is what is going to help you have that conversation with your business partners between ops teams and the developers. So take the business context, take the vulnerability insights which we have it, Threat intelligence, we have it because of the application context. Put those two together, and we come up with a single score called business risk score. And that score helps you sort of prioritize what you should take action on it. So what we did was we looked at four different products which Cisco offers. There is AppDynamics, there is Panoptica, there is Kana Security, and then there is Talos. We basically bring the telemetry from all of this together and then you try to come up with that business risk score. But just to sort of illustrate how powerful this capability is, let's just take a few examples here. 
Most of you must be familiar with the CVSS score, which is a static score, which basically identifies a uh, vulnerability and says you have a 9.5 score, which is very critical, which means you absolutely need to fix it. But Kenna is a tool, uh, and they come up with a score where, where they are monitoring 18 different feeds across the internet, including monitoring the hackers' chat sessions, looking at is there an easy toolkit available to exploit that vulnerability, and comes up with a score. We look at those two scores, and we also look at application inside we have it, because we are sitting in the runtime of the application. We, in fact, can see if your application is getting attacked because of log4j. And you can absolutely mask off those transactions if you wanted to. But if you look at it and just focus on the middle uh, tier here, CVSS score, which is very high, log4j, remember the Christmas of 2021 irrespective of how critical that vulnerability is from an exploiting perspective, everybody who had a mandate saying you must fix it. But what if, if you knew that actually that vulnerability exists in a tier of application, which has a, no access to the data? It is behind a firewall. It is not a public facing. You could actually have given Christmas off to your developer team or allow them to innovate and add more capability. So that's great. But then if you flip around the use, uh, use case, where CVSS score says, you know what, it's low, and I can assure you, most of the development team will ignore that. But in reality, that is the easiest one to exploit because there are ready-made toolkits available. And it may be existing in an application stack which has access to all kinds of sensitive data. And this is a big blind spot for our app and dev teams. Bringing this telemetry, we can help you prioritize so that actually you can really free your developers to do what they do the best. So I know there was a lot of talk yesterday if you attended uh, on a keynote on terms of what's happening around generative AI uh, and the large uh, language models. So of course we would want to make sure that we put the natural language interface in terms of the tools which we are offering it. I think it's going to increase the efficiency of our ops teams. And we also think that it can help you sort of bring different tools, not only built by Cisco, but other companies as well, where you have a single interface to interact with uh, your whole set of tools around, right? So we're going to work on that, and we're going to build it. You should hear from us on very soon on that. But your application teams, and as you can see, the rapid advance in terms of adopting this, which is happening around the industry, your application teams are actually using those large language models. They are using either your A model for the OpenAI or a B model or Curie or DaVinci model. So getting the insight in terms of what is happening around OpenAI usage or large language model usage from your applications, we have built this dashboard out of the box, which will tell you basically for each type of a model, what's the API completion rate? How much is the cost? How much tokens are you burn, uh, burning it, et cetera? So this is going to be available in July. Uh, so stay tuned to it. No new agent needed. Just click on your uh, SaaS environment, and you should be able to see it. But with that, I actually wanted to make it real. And I wanted to invite lead uh, program manager from State of Iowa, Indiana, Brad, and Gene back up on the stage. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Brad. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Ronick. All right. Hi, Brad. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How do you like the show? Uh, I'm loving it. It's overwhelming, but it's also very insightful and just tons of information. You guys are incredible. That's awesome. Here. Well, it's the crowd that, that makes it yeah, uh, special. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so what we thought we would do is talk a little bit about your journey towards full stack accessibility, mm -hmm. the steps you took, kind of maybe to paint a picture when you first stepped into your role. Um, I'm going to you know speak uh, kindly. I'm, I'm sure you stepped into an environment and everything was working perfectly, right? It was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like the past you know, couple of years, it's just been, you've been able to work on your golf game, yep. right? Gravy. Okay. Gravy. Why, don't, why don't you share a little bit about like when you first came in, what the nature of what you were facing uh, was like? Uh, when I first came to the state, I was hired on um, in, a, in a program um, for application migrations and things of that nature. So. Being around the state for six or seven years, I started to understand the apps, the way they would work, um, how they were instrumented, um, especially on-prem. Mm -hmm. um, our cloud smart strategy hadn't began yet. So understanding that, the CTO came to me, Dave Fox, and 
wanted to get into the observability business because we have to be able to deliver these things to the constituents um, 24-7, 365 now. We're no longer a, a nine to five, Monday through Friday business. Um, we, we are um, a state of 90 plus agencies, which you can think of those as businesses. And when, in those agencies, there's multiple business units, multiple apps that are delivered to the constituents. So mm -hmm. when I came on board, that was the broad, big picture. Uh -huh. And then since then, in the last two years, especially the, the journey been, began about four years ago with App Dynamics. Now with FSO, the last two years, um, I have brought on over 125 applications, um, and the journey continues. That's and awesome. With everything that Ronick and his team has done, um, which is amazing, by the way. Thank you oh. very much. I look very uh, forward to the next six months or so. That's great. Pressing. Don't don't give him a big head. Nah. <laughs> it's all it's all the team, right? Yeah. It's uh, yes. so so. I think it's really important to understand. I mean, you you mention all these different agencies and applications. Mm -hmm. I think in the end. As we were saying at the beginning, like expectations, because we all as people, and we're all citizens of something, right? Mm -hmm. Our expectations have gone through the roof. But, you know, what I thought was interesting is, is that the state of Indiana really had a very has a very focused uh, set of initiatives on modernizing yes. experiences, right? Mm -hmm. But that could be tricky. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about, you know, what are the peaks? Like, what do people expect? What are the moments in time where there's, like, peaks in demand where you kind of have that one, uh, one moment to make them happy as not only citizens, but your neighbors who know where you live. So speaking towards like the Black Friday type of situation, yeah, things exactly. of that nature. Exactly. Well, in our, in our environment, you would have many of those. Um, coming up next month would be in the licensing business. We, we handle over 400 licensing types at the state of Indiana. The nursing licenses are coming up very high demand. Um, those, those licenses also transfer to other states. Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, that's a very busy time. Most recently, uh, tax season was here, Department of Revenue. So we had to process those taxes um, very quickly. People had to be able to get on portals to pay taxes. Businesses had to be able to do business with the state of Indiana through these applications. Um, BMV, um, the, the motor vehicles, you know you have to get on to, or be able to get on to do your registrations, things of that nature. Plus there are a hundred and, hundred plus, don't, don't quote me, hundred plus branches mm -hmm. that have to be operational for people to be able to walk into to do business. Uh, end of month is always super busy for them. Um, right now, most currently, um, the Department of Education, um, from now until about September, in their licensing, it's called Elvis of all things, their licensing verification system, um, in Vegas, that's fun. Anyway, um, it's a very busy time right now because admins and teachers are taking new positions within different um, school systems. So those, those have to come in the front door. I have this license. I have these qualifications. They get processed in the back door by the business unit. Um, so that, that's, that's a very busy so time for There's that. plenty of moments in time very and people's expectations. And those are just are, a few examples. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, man, that must be a challenging mm -hmm. environment to manage it. Like, what are, like, can you educate uh, all of us here to say, like, what are the tools you use it and, like, what does that transform inside your organization from kind of bringing things together? I know you've been a, a very, very important and, uh, customer with us on App Dynamics yeah. Generally, but now with full stack observability, if you can kind of just give a little bit of insight in terms of well, how your journey has been. Dave Fox, again, our CTO, uh, through his vision, he tasked me um, several weeks ago, a couple months ago, to go out to all the different departments within IoT uh, you know, security, network, um, operations, uh, you know, server admins, Linux, Windows, all, all of the things that you can think of, tier three help desk, things of that nature. What tools are we using? What are they using them for? Who's using them? So I created a RACI on all those. Came up with, I believe, over 135 tools within our... Wow. Yeah. And a lot of them crossed each other. One team didn't know what the other team was using or anything. Now that we have these, these platforms, the full stack tools, um, a, a very good example in the last several weeks, the security team is coming to me now. Yeah. We, we are enabling not only the agencies, our partners, to use the system, the systems, the platforms, but we're uh, enabling inside of our organization, security in particular, the server, and they come to us now because they're enabled to use these things to solve problems. Yeah. No, I think this is actually very interesting. And I think we were talking about it the other day. It's about those human connections yeah. and sort of building that collaboration across the teams. I mean, if you may want to kind of talk about it from a security team and your ops team, like how did your journey begin? Because we always kind of see, oh, nobody wants to deal with security team, right? Yeah. And then, but it seems like talking to you, like 
But we love security a... teams. Yes, we do. We love them. We love them, of we course. Them. We love them. Uh, but you know, kind of uh, give us a little bit of insight and I think what you were sharing the other day. Well, like you said, it's, it's all relationships. And when I first got to the state of Indiana, uh, and nothing against anybody, and I don't want to say, but somebody from one department didn't know what the team yeah. and another, you know what they were doing. So I'm running around making friends saying, did you know we did this? And so that's what took us into this type of uh, uh, full stack view where now I can work with the security team and say, hey, maybe a crowd strike is causing us some issues on these pieces of hardware. Um, if they come to me now and say, what's App Dynamics? What's Thousand Eyes showing us? What does the correlation of the data look like? And as you said, the, the melt data, they are using that also to do forensics on and things of that nature. So this stuff is all in one area now that we can extract and correlate against. Yeah. But they, they come to us now. Have, have you found having that not only ability to collaborate the right way, but even yourself and your team having that data, has that saved you time? Has it helped you be more oh, yeah. focused? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you said, what would take hours before, um, and, and just some simple examples most recently, like with DOE and the Elvis application, um, and all the licensing thing. The, the vendor, again, we enable the partners to work with us through, through the FSO platforms. They're using the tools to help keep that application um, up and running for the, not only the end users, but the business unit inside that has to process the licensing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it seems like, uh, I think, Gene, you were talking about uh, organizations having between 10 to 100 tools. Yeah. You are like in the top 10 percent yeah. of the 35. Mm -hmm. Like our goal, right, is not to build one tool which conquers all the problems, but really trying to reduce that, right, with full stack. And it looks like you're sort of on that journey. You've been sort of bringing things together to really allow that collaboration between the network team and security team and the application teams, right? And I think it's super powerful um, to really handle. I think you talked about some war room. I think just to make it real, uh, kind of give me an example about some of the war rooms you used to have run well, before, before you started adopting full stack. When we have had an outage or, or an application experience issues in the past, I've been on phone calls where there's 60 plus people on those calls. And if you think within an organization, 60 plus people and the salaries that are, I mean, it's a very yeah, expensive phone exactly. call. I have been in situations now where either the applications, the problems are solved before any, any escalation call is brought up, or within minutes with somebody reaching out to me or me proactively reaching out, hey, we're getting alerting on this, can you take a look? Um, our network um, team, for example, could you take a look? Oh, this is going on. They get it fixed before anybody knows what's going on. So it's really from reactive to proactive Absolutely. to predictive. The meantime right? to resolution has lowered Quite a, quite a bit. Yeah. You, you know what's interesting? So on the tool sprawl thing, for those, I'm going to shamelessly plug our friends in security business group and, and the <laughs> security team, but I know that they're in a lot of primary research that, that they deliver as well. And tool sprawl lives in all these domains, mm -hmm. and that's a critical thing to keep in mind. So you're facing it from an INO perspective. SecOps clearly has tons of tools they use. They're, they're drowning in noise and, and, and what have you. And then app devs, we love them, right? But yeah. in the end, app devs are notorious. They're going to use any tool, any, any uh, module, et cetera, in front of them mm -hmm. to help them get their application out quickly. So the tool sprawl thing, when we reflect the numbers from IDC, that is literally just monitoring and, 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 yes. and observability. That's not the ecosystem. And so I think to your point, right, when you bring all of that together yeah. and say these teams have to work together, and they've never really worked together before. Like you say, you had an opportunity to say, we don't have a blueprint, hey, I'm gonna give you some insights, now we have a right. blueprint, right? It's just so powerful to hear from you on terms of your journey and how you sort of leverage this thing to create that collaboration. Um, we'd love to have you over and over again. You've been such a fantastic customers and a participants and like your insights are so valuable to our customers here. So thank you for joining us here. Um, and we're going to, I, I don't know whether we have time for a few questions here for any, if you have any of uh, questions here. Otherwise, we are, um, we, are, we are at the end of the sessions here. We could do a quick close. Okay, there's a question oh, up awesome. there. <clears throat> Just a question around the timing involved with, uh, you know, beginning an initiative to assess this, uh, the, the kind of a committee, the, the consensus-led uh, evaluation, the searching for solutions, the, uh, whether it's uh, consolidating tools or reducing licensing across the board. What, can, you, can you give us an overview of the time involved internally with, 
with from beginning to end of, of where you started and, and how long did it take you to achieve where you are today and any kind of uh, measurable like uh, metrics or business value that you received out of this initiative? That's to me, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like I said, I started my journey about four years uh, with App Dynamics in Dave Fox, our CTO. Um, that was a quick POC just to see what it could do for us. It proved value very quickly. During COVID at the very beginning, before we really got started, um, the workforce development application that um, Workforce uses went down because we were getting something like 35,000 hits an hour of that nature mm. to that application for unemployment requests. Uh, we used App Dynamics to find the code, the Java code that was causing us issues, quickly get that to the, the developers, and within, I, I can't remember the time frame, it, it was hours or a few days, that, that was corrected and we were able to serve those requests. So between four and three years ago, that's when that happened, you know, co the COVID time period. Then we, we saw the value. We started a POC process. Um, I was tasked uh, when we started our EA agreements and things of that nat nature. My, my very first goal, of course, I have a list of goals from the CTO's office, um, to get 50 applications on. Well, I, I, I like to do better than that. So yeah. I, I put over 100 applications on that first year. I did have the full support um, of the CTO's office and all of the departments, the COO, the Chief Operating operating officer, and of course Tracy Barnes, our CIO, had their full support, so that made that very easy, easy for me to get that job done, so kudos to them. What I have provided every month since then over the past two years is key metrics and KPIs to the CIO and CTO to be able to take to the governor's office and lieutenant governor's office based on the scorecard within App Dynamics that grades the applications and they can go over to the governor's office and say, we may need some help, the top 10, worst 10 type of thing, green, yellow, red light. We, we may need help in this area with a certain agency or this area with a certain. Agency. So that's what the value is in it, other than behind the, you know, the scenes, me um, helping the agencies keep the applications healthy. That is the, the key business um, value that we're getting out of it. Now, with the business risk scores, I'm going to marry that now, working with the development teams with the KPIs that I'm getting out of the metrics, to because if the application's performing great and the users can get into it, but the business risk score is very high, yeah. we have to take that into consideration now. So that's the next six months what my goal is. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> awesome. Well, well thank you, time. everyone. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Ronan. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank All right. You, thank, thank you, everyone here. Thank you, everyone online. Uh, so to learn more, uh, stay plugged into what we're doing. We're moving quickly with FSO. More applications to come. Check out Cisco.com and the full FSO story. And then for those uh, in the room, make sure if you haven't been to the show floor, go to the show floor, see demos and talk to our experts. And I appreciate everyone's time. Hopefully you see that FSO can really enable you more effectively uh, and reduce tool sprawl, reduce complexity, you know, increase quality and delivery of digital experiences. and pretty much just make you happier. So thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Gene. Gene, you're going to take... All right. Well done, Gene Hall. Welcome back to the Cisco TV studio here in the world of solutions. I'm Steve Moulter. We have just come out of another fantastic innovation talk, this time featuring Gene Hall, Vice President of Marketing and Communications for Cisco's strategy, incubations, and applications business. Gene welcomed Brad Welsh, APM Program Manager for the Indiana Office of Technology and Ronak Desai, who is joining me here in the studio in just a couple of minutes, so I'm looking forward to having him here with us as well. So we heard about Cisco's cloud native application protection platform, and we also heard a lot about Cisco full stack observability. FSO is a huge story all across Cisco Live here this week. It's enabling deep extensibility from queries to data models across a composable UI framework. We've made great announcements about Cisco full stack observability. For the so folks here at the show, they're learning a lot about it. For those of you who are tuning in on the live stream, great. Go check out Cisco FSO. 
Davis Wallman is out in the world of solutions right now at the FSO booth. So Davis, what is the story out there? Uh, I got to tell you, the excitement is great here and I'm getting a lot of excitement from the man next to me. This is Frank. He's a product marketer in the applications group. I probably got that wrong, but. No, that, that, that's good enough. That works. And then, I don't know if you can tell, but I can. You're excited to be here, Frank. I, I'm really excited. And, and Davis, let me tell you why. So, you know, 10 years ago, we were talking about the power of the network to change the world. Now we're talking about the power of applications to change the world, and it's really awesome. We're helping customers chase new revenue streams, deliver new experiences like ever before. Let me tell you about this company called Maruti Suzuki. Well, launch right in, let's go. So there's this company called Maruti Suzuki. They actually built an app where you can view the exterior and interior of a car, finance it, and purchase it, all from your smartphone, all from your smartphone. Now, now I haven't used this app myself, but I heard that it's so good that it even gives you the hard sell on the clear coat in the service plan. Okay, that's, that's fantastic, and that's a great example of what we're talking about here, but maybe let's back it up a little bit okay. and talk about how all of that is actually possible. So what, what, what makes that possible? So all, all of that is possible with Cisco Full Stack Observability Solutions. FSO, and what full stack observability basically, as the name implies, allows you to do is look for issues, application issues, uh, issues per, um, affecting performance, application performance, issues affecting the user experience across your entire application stack. And we have you know, a few products that comprise that solution. We have AppD, we have ThousandEye, we have Cisco Secure Application. All of these things are integrated and work together so that you can fix issues, resolve issues more quickly. That whole ecosystem is so important when we talk about full stack observability. From a tech standpoint, we love talking about it, but as, as a customer, why would I want full stack observability? So here's the reason you want full stack observability, and I'll give you an actual customer example. Um, we have a guy from the state of Indiana, and what he told me is before full stack observability, he was kind of like a villain because anytime there was an application issue, you know, he was calling meetings with the network people, with the application infrastructure people, with the people in charge of running the ISP, trying to resolve and troubleshoot where that issue is. In fact, we call that mean time to innocence because basically when an application performance manager like that guy comes to see you, you're afraid. And what you want to do is determine your innocence as quickly as possible because it's uncomfortable, it's yes. not fun. And, and being in that position of having to be the bearer of bad news or chasing down, you know, it, it's really, you know, it's not fun. But with Cisco FSO, FSO yeah. you know what the problem is and, right. and, and you can resolve it quickly because you know what it is. So you go from becoming the inquisition to being the answer man. And so then Love when that. people see you, they, they love you because they're like, oh, this guy's going to tell me exactly what I need to do to fix the issue, and, and then I'll be good. I love it. And no one ever expects the Spanish Inquisition. Sorry. Had no, to, oh, Monty okay, Python Monty Python. Python. There we go. Um, All right. We launched a new product this week. We did. Tell me about it. Okay, so we ha what we launched is the Cisco FSO platform. And so what this is is an open and extensible platform where our partners and customers can actually build on it. Now you think about FSO being um, telling you basically what you've got to do today to fix your application issue. You know, basically it's ultra fast troubleshooting, you can fix the issue. The platform actually allows you to analyze the data. Okay. You know, so you kind of export and analyze the data on the platform, and then you can see patterns of issues down the line, things that you have to fix long term, like maybe your ISP isn't performing as well. Um, or maybe there's things about you know, your cloud consumption that you need to fix, and the platform just gives you those actionable insights so you can plan and make your application better. In the end, it's all about making the user experience better. Okay, and there's no better way to talk about this than stepping right over here we about five feet. We can actually give you a demo right over here. Why don't you go over here and join this gentleman? Sounds good. Uh, we got Lee here, that's right. Lee, tell us what you do here at Cisco. Hi, so I'm the product manager leading the FSO platform experience for both our developers and our users. Fantastic, and you're going to give us a little demo here. Now, I, I want to warn everybody, I think Lee had about a 20 minute presentation for us. We only got about a minute left, so we're going to get a quick look at the new platform. Let's have a swing around here and uh, 
Lee, take it away. Tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, so what we're looking at here right now is our FSO platform developer experience. So when a developer logs into the FSO platform, they're going to be able to see a bunch of the different tools, documentation that they have available to them. And using these tools and documentation, they're able to build solutions, modules that users are able to consume. So what I'll take you guys over to now is the what, what an admin will see when they log into the FSO platform. So our admin, Allison, log into the FSO platform, land on her homepage, and she'll be able to go over here to the FSO platform exchange. So this is kind of like our app store. So going to the FSO platform exchange, she'll see a list of all the different applications and modules, which are add-ons to our applications, available for her to subscribe to. So let's take a quick look at Cost Insights. So she clicks on Learn More. She can see all the details about Cost Insights. And then here, she'll be able to, be able to click on Subscribe. Now, after Allison clicks through and she subscribes to Cost Insights, she will be able to see hey, I have, uh, I'm actually subscribed to Cost Insights now. So now, her users will be able to log in to the FSO platform and scrolling down on this page, guess what? Cost Insights. Amazing. So there you go. That is, I know we're just scratching the surface here. Absolutely. And I think we're going to have to come back to you, Lee, yeah, and get a more, a more full demo. But thank you for your All time right. here. Okay. Steve, I hope, we can, I hope we can get back, but for now, I'm, I'm throwing it back to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Davis. Please thank Lee and Frank for us as well for the FSO Deep Dive. We're going to keep talking full stack observability upstairs with Annie Murphy in the Innovation Theater with two of our session speakers. She has got Jean and Brad there with her. Hello, Annie. Hi, Steve. Thanks so much. Yes, I am here in the Innovation Theater. We just wrapped up a talk about full stack observability. I'm here with Gene Hall, who's a VP of Communications for Incubation Technologies, as well as Brad Welsh with the Indiana Office of Technology. I'm going to start with you, Gene. Tell us about full stack observability and why it's important now. I mean, I think in the end, we all benefit from having awesome modern applications that deliver great digital experiences. But all the people at this event, all of our customers, day to day, like Brad, are responsible for making sure that these things are flawless, and that takes a lot of work. Modern applications are powerful, they're complex. And so in the end, FSO is enabling Brad and people like Brad and people at the show to be really, really successful in ensuring they can deliver flawless experiences and work with all their counterparts in the organization like security, app devs, et cetera. So now more than ever, we need full stack observability. Thanks, Gene. And Brad, why don't you tell us about what the Indiana Office of Technology is doing now? I know that in your role as APM, you work with a lot of different teams. Uh, one of the things that I heard about while you're on stage is that the state of Indiana, most people usually think of retail as having these like Black mm -hmm. Friday events. A lot of people probably don't realize that state agencies also have similar kind of loads. Can you tell us a little bit about what the, the state of Indiana does? Yeah, we, we support over 90 plus uh, uh, agencies within the state of Indiana and each one of those agencies is like a business unit or a business to everybody out there and within those business units there's multiple um, applications that are supported so uh, let's say licensing this time of year for nursing uh, coming up next month it will be a very busy time for that um, Department of Revenue tax season is happening or has just been in full force so you can imagine how busy that has been uh, end of month uh, for for the Bureau of Motor Vehicles every month is very very busy um, licensing season for the Department of Education right now is a Black Friday for them. So we have over and over again throughout all of these 90 business units, uh, very busy times on these applications that we have to um, provide an excellent customer experience to the constituents. And what I heard also while you're on stage when we talk about these types of events, give me an idea of what the kind of impact full stack observability has provided you and your team directly in terms of when you have to manage these types of events. Well, if, if there's a slowdown, an outage, or something of that nature, it helps us in the end get to mean time to resolution very quickly. But I think the most important message is it's a collaboration between the teams, whether it be an operational team like the server admins or the security teams or the network team. So the collaboration, getting to the mean time to resolution and helping the agencies get that application back out to the constituents is what's most important. Awesome. Hey, Gene, if, if customers or attendees want to learn more about full stack observability, where else can they learn more about what we have here today? I appreciate that. We are literally everywhere. So, uh, you know, um, down on the show floor, we've got a booth dedicated to 
uh, full stack observability. Also, shout out cloud native application security, a critical piece of this. Uh, but we have a, a booth down there. We've got a ton of demos in the world of solutions. You can see in front of the DevNet zone more hands on sandboxes and demos around full stack observability. And then at scale on Cisco.com, we've gone big. So uh, if you don't see someone with a badge that says full stack observability, you can find us digitally as well. <laughs> so. Awesome, well thank you so much, Brad and Gene. We're gonna stay on full stack observability. I understand that Steve back in studio is gonna introduce another special guest speaker. Steve, over to you, let's go. Thank you so much, Anna, I appreciate it. Yeah, coming up in just a moment, we have the other two hosts from this fantastic session, but thank you so much to Gene and to Brad. Great, great, great session, great information. Right now, we're gonna go back out into the world of solutions, where uh, Davis is back with Lee here at this point. We're gonna start talking about customer digital experience monitoring. We'll touch on business risk observability and on hybrid application monitoring. Davis, let's go back out to you. That's right, Steve, and I got to tell you, even in the few minutes I've spent between these live hits, I've learned a literal crap ton about how much work we're doing with FSO. I'm back here with Lee, he's a product manager for our new app uh, platform yeah. for FSO, and we're going to launch right into your demo. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's take it. it away here. So on the screen here, I have our FSO platform developer experience. We're going to dive a little deeper today, guys. So. Uh, I'm logged into my uh, Mac and I have a terminal up right now. So we have built this tool called the FSO CLI tool. It lets us, it's basically a command line tool that lets you interface, a developer can interface with the FSO platform directly. So a developer might log in, they'll log in, they'll get logged into the system, they'll initialize a solution that they're building. So once they've initialized the solution, they'll run some things in the background and it'll be created. Now, after they initialize that, they'll be able to go into their IDE or their editor and edit some code. And we've also built some tools that our developers can use. So uh, this is our UI editing tool. So what they'll be able to do with this is that they can edit the code and see the changes immediately. And this is really powerful because uh, developers need to be able to iterate quickly on the UI that they're building for their end users. And that's different from in the past, correct? Yeah, absolutely. It's very different, it's very modular, very extensible. So you're able to open up pre-existing templates and edit them and change them however you wish so that your end users can get the most value out of the modules. So, Fantastic, okay, can, uh, can we see a little more of the uh, that interface you were showing me earlier? Yeah, absolutely, so on the left-hand side here, you actually see a bunch of different tabs. You see info about the template that you have open, the props that help power the, the uh, UI, the outline of the UI, if you're able to click into it, you would see an outline of what it looks like, but here what we see is the raw JSON code. So this gives developers a lot of power. They are able to edit the code directly and hit this play button to see exactly what shows up on the right-hand side here. So in this Got case, it. developers okay. build a card that says, hello world, welcome to the FSO platform. That's fantastic. So after, what, what better message to send, yeah, by the way? Absolutely, <laughs> welcome to the FSO platform. So after they uh, built that, they're able to validate it, they can uh, validate the package, and then they'll eventually be able to push this to our FSO platform exchange, which I'll be hopping over to now. So in the FSO platform exchange, they can see a, a series of the different powerful solutions that our developers internally, as well as our partners on the FSO platform have built. So on the top row, you see a bunch of things built by Cisco, cloud native application observability, you see a cost workload profiler, application resource optimizer, cost insights, and down here we also have one new thing by our partner, Climatic. We also see Evolutio FinTech, Cloud Forecaster, vSphere observability. So, Tons of partners, tons yeah, of customers absolutely. that went into this, right? Lots of stuff available for end users and customers to consume. So with that, I want to take you guys a little bit more deep into what exactly some of these Cisco modules look like, right? So, earlier I showed you guys, hey, this is Cost Insights, it's showing up now after the admin was able to subscribe to it. But, I want to show you about some of the, some of the power that this brings to the customers and how they can save a ton of money. So what I'm going to go into, I'm going to go into our clusters here. We see a list of clusters. You see the cost that these clusters cost the customers to run, right? We click into one. Now you see this awesome overview. How much total cost this cluster has taken to run over just the last four hours, $120. Over here, they can see how much is actually being used versus how much is idling. And that's, this $102 here, that's money being wasted. 80% of the dollars here are being wasted. We're talking literally down to the cent here. Yes, I mean, this is the, the, the uh, literal observability that we're seeing in this, this platform is unprecedented. Yes, yes, yes it's amazing. super powerful. And down here, we also have another graph, total cost over time. So here, this is where the customers will be able to say, oh, now that I've taken some actions on uh, changing different aspects of my CPU, my memory, my storage, 
I'll actually be able to see how much money I've saved over time. So you can go to leadership and say, hey, look, look how many dollars I'm saving for the team. How powerful is that? Absolutely. What else Very do we got? Powerful. And actually, what I really want to ask about this is how does this, how does this differentiate Cisco? How does our platform dif you know, set us so far apart yeah. from the next person? So before, you would have to buy all these things together. What the platform is doing, is we're allowing developers, uh, developers to create custom domain experiences and upload them to the FSO platform exchange. So now, a customer can start using cloud-native application observability and realize, hey, I'd really love to see some insights on my costs. They can go over to the platform exchange that we showed earlier, and they can click on subscribe to Cost Insights. You know, going back to Cost Insights here, like what I just showed earlier, right? Going back into this, like uh, an overview of a cluster, looking at the cost here, these things don't show up until you actually subscribe to those solutions. So we're giving customers a lot of opportunity to increase the marginal value of the platform, you know, at like at their choosing. That's amazing. It's modular. It's so simple to use, Absolutely. and it's frankly mind blowing. At least to me, and I'm sure to you. I would hope. Lee, yeah. thank you so much for your yeah. time. Thanks for the time, guys. All right, we're going to check back in with Frank really quick. And Frank is going to tell us about one last thing we wanted to talk about, a few of the booths we need to, to plug down here because we couldn't do it without them. Yeah, so um, you know, a couple of uh, relatively new things. So we have digital customer digital experience monitoring. We have a booth here I'd love for you to go see. We also have business risk observability. And what business risk observability does is it basically combines a bunch of different capabilities from Cisco products like uh, Panoptica, Kenna, Threat Intelligence from Cisco, Talos, and it amalgamates all that, puts it together, and gives you a business risk score. Now, what that business risk score does is it tells you all the different you know, potential security exploits that are out there, which is more likely to be exploited, and also which is going to have the biggest impact to your business, like maybe it has to do with financial transactions. So basically telling you, hey, these are the things that behooves you to fix first because this is going to cause you trouble both in exposure yes. and financially. Absolutely. And we have, we have a bunch of other great uh, booths here that I recommend as well, but those two definitely come check out. Um, we would love to see you. Uh, you know, I'd love to talk more about all of these great booths down here, but the best thing to do is just come on down and experience down. them for yourself. Frank, exactly. thank you for your time. And Steve, if when you have a, a second, can you come meet us over here? That'd be great. Happy to, Davis. Anytime right. I can get thank away you, from Davis. here and go see what's happening out there in the real world, that's great. Frank, thank you. Lee, terrific demos. We really appreciate it, and so good to get this deep dive in these demos on FSO. Again, one of the big announcements that we've had here at Cisco Live 2023 is this launch of Cisco FSO platform. It is this open, extensible, API-driven, full-stack observability capability that is empowering a new observability ecosystem for all of our organizations. I've got two great guests here in the studio with me. I've got Ronak Desai back over here on this side, Senior VP and GM at AppDynamics and FSO Cisco. And then I've got Raju Penmetsa back over here, Chief uh, Technical Officer of Cloud Fabrics. Great Cisco story, I think, when we talk yeah. about this collaboration, this partnership, and I'm so glad to have both of you here in the yeah. studio with me today. All right, thank you very much, Steve, for having us here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for making your way all the way down from upstairs, too. It's a walk. So, let's go ahead and start at the most obvious place. What is about the outcomes? We always talk outcomes, right? Yeah. What are we seeing from Cisco Full Stack Observability, and maybe even a challenge or two, yeah. that we are helping customers solve for using FSO? Yeah, so I think if you look at it, the landscape of observability tools out there, we had a thesis that there is a tool sprawl like this, right? but we wanted to prove it out, is this really true? Yes. So we did a, IDC did a survey for us with 2,000 participants, 2,000 enterprises. Do you know what did they find? Mm. There's anything between 11 tools to 100 plus tools wow. in an organization, and this is not even counting security ops. Okay? This is just counting monitoring and infrastructure monitoring, right? So big problem, and what ends up happening is it's not many tools, but when you have your really end user experience problem, Think about every ops team looking at their tool and trying to figure out where the problem is. Ugh. The friction it causes between the teams, right? The complexity of the environment, right? It is really, really hard for our customers. So they're screaming for help, saying, mm -hmm. can you guys do this? And actually the reason I took this job nine months back was because when I was talking to one of the CIO, I ran our data center group before, and her take was saying, Ronak, look, you have a tool X, 
tool why, and now you're trying to get me to buy another infrastructure monitoring tool. Can you guys do something where you start to bring this together? And this is a true story, that's how I am here, to talk about really and trying to execute on this full stack observatory vision. Because it really helps the customers in terms of what they're trying to do to deliver that best digital experience. Because if you know for customers in these days, if you don't deliver a best application experience, they're going to move on to next competitors, right? And, so, and it's really associated with the brand. I mean, that's basically what we discovered. So that's the outcome we're trying to make sure. Mm -hmm. Can we simplify their life? Right, simplify is the big theme for Cisco oh, yes. live this around, right? Can we simplify their life? Can we consolidate some of the capabilities, right? And when you look at this kind of ecosystem, with so many partners and so many vendors who are involved, you can build the point solution. Like we could have built full stack observatory completely closed and build the solution, right? It would work for certain use cases, right? But considering where we are in observability landscape, we wanted to kind of invite our partners other ecosystem vendors, the startups who are innovating it, and open up this massive amount of data which we are going to ingest to partners so they can start to build things on top of it. That's our version, that's basically where we're drawing. I'm very happy to announce that we are launching Full Stack Observable Platform this week. Mm -hmm. And it's something which I've been around Cisco Block for a very long time. We actually pulled in by many, many months this release because it's so much excitement with our customers. It's great, and the customer focus is really where we always want to be, right? Because we can't do anything in a vacuum. It's what we do together in That's combination, correct. Roger, that I think is so strong. Tell us a little bit about Cloud Fabrics, Cisco FSO platform module. What is it delivering uh, for you and for your customers? As FSO gave us the ability to extend the FSO platform to add additional objects to it. Example, when a customer talks about their business, their business runs on applications, applications runs on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You go to any customer today, 90% of them are hybrid workloads today. FSO being one of the top focused in the cloud native applications, the Cloud Fabrics kind of brings you that hybrid applications information into FSO, and basically it composes the data from the hybrid applications, contextualizes by enriching all of that data and give you the full stack into the full stack observability mm. for that application dependency. Based on the persona, this tend to change and new KPIs being business, everything is driven. That is what the extensibility of the FSO platform given us to put this data into it so that the above applications can consume the underlying entire full stack of that hybrid application. Yeah, no, I think Raju, I think what you guys did it with building the insights where you correlate um, Kubernetes workload running into a virtualization environment, kind of giving that whole end-to-end -end picture. That's and we had a vision that we could enable the partners and get them going really fast. Can you talk about your journey in terms of when you started and how quickly you were able to do it? Yes, and when we started, and in a typical world, it takes about six months plus to a year. And with FSO, giving that extensibility, we are able to do the use case of vSphere observability in less than six weeks as a first time starter. Right. With that being said, and we believe, and the next enhancements are going to be a lot less than three or two and a half weeks time frames we are looking at. So, That's so what just to repeat for our audience here, right? The same thing, we were doing it for our infrastructure, we will call it ACI. Hmm? It took me, and this is a personal experience, this, it took me six months to develop the capability, which this team built it in six weeks. It's not because they are the smartest kids out there. It is because the power of the platform and yeah. the out of the box functionality which exists, including applying ML, including uh, doing the things which are dynamic baselining, right? Including allowing the cross correlation of different domains, right? That's the power of the platform uh, and it allows our partners to sort of start to build interesting use cases, right? And th that's where we are focused on it. I think that's fantastic. Um, if there is one key takeaway that you would want our audience watching and here at the show to learn, to know, to uh, carry away with them when it comes to FSO and FSO platform, what would that be for each of you? Raju, you want to answer? Yeah, Raju. Yes. One is it is extensible, and two, it gives you a complete cohesive experience to the customer, business applications and infrastructure. And as a partner for us, and it is easy to work with and starting with, and obviously Cisco is going to add more tools for the developers to extend this, that is going to make our life a lot simpler. Yeah, so, and, and for me, Raju, you stole my word, extensibility <laughs> was going to be my 
thing as well. And that's the powerful thing. I mean, it, you can see the excitement I have. There's eight degree of extensibility on this platform. Very unique. I've built a lot of platforms in my life. This is really, really unique. And I think it's going to set us up for really fast growth to work with partners and bring those interesting use cases. Mm -hmm. um, there's a ton of applications which we have developed uh, as for any platform. Uh, and there are a lot of demos uh, on the demo booth here. So I really encourage audience, if they are here, to go and actually try out all of those. Businesses observability, digital experience monitoring, cost insights, how do you optimize your workload so that you have a right cost with the right application SLA, right? Those are the things I would really encourage our audience to kind of go and experiment. But um, I really feel that we are at the cusp here of, of leading the observability market uh, for, for our customers and helping them really trying to achieve what they're trying to do from business goals. So for those people who are on the streaming broadcast in about 30 seconds, what would you like for them to do? The folks who aren't here with us in the room this week, but we want to make sure that they get that full FSO platform story. What do they do? Yeah, so um, definitely they should reach out uh, to uh, their, their sales uh, relationship uh, manager or whoever they are talking to. Um, but I am a prolific user of our social media, LinkedIn and Twitter. So if they want to reach out to me directly and set up a session, I'm happy to walk them through all these demos, et cetera. Encourage uh, and love the opportunity to do it. There are a lot of going to be uh, videos, testimonials, et cetera, and demos available online. So just look at appdynamics.com or cisco.com, full stack observability, and you should be able to find a lot of uh, details and demos around it. All right, that's fantastic. And just one last hit I'm going to give Raju, I'm going to let you sort of have the last word on this. People want to learn more about Cloud Fabrics. Where do they go? What do they do? Okay, one, they can go to cloudfabrics.com or reach us through LinkedIn and the social media and as well as they have the direct communication into their Cisco teams, and they know how to get hold of us based on the region and based on the location. Roger, Ronek, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you. the time with both of you. A pleasure, I'm glad you were able to stop yeah. by the studio. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been a pleasure to uh, have the conversation with you. Look forward Bye. to doing this more. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, thank you for having us, Steve. Thank it's you so pleasure. much, Roger. Thanks. All right, so we are headed into our innovation talk in just a moment. We're going to talk right now about redefining workload assurance for modern digital experiences. We have got Colby Rosell. We're going to toss it over right now. Enjoy the iTalk. and insights, contextual drill downs into every domain, and closed loop automation for self-healing networks. You may have caught him at the keynote session this morning. Please welcome to the stage Mohit Ladd. Thank you. Welcome everyone, uh, virtually and in person. And for this group in person in particular, you are showing true commitment because this conflicts with lunch. And lunch is over at 12.30, so by the time you're done, you get no more food. <laughs> I really appreciate the time and the opportunity to share more about Thousand Eyes and how we're really challenging what network assurance is in, in the modern digital experience world. <clears throat> so before I go into the details, and we have so much content, we have a customer here as well, I want to just talk a little bit about the shift. So these are things that you're all seeing in your environment. Uh, cloud becoming the new data center, SaaS apps becoming the new app stack, home becoming the new office, and really internet becoming the new network. <clears throat> now a good example I will, I will share is from our own environment. And this is something that I still remember, even though it's from more than 10 years ago. It was our first office in San Francisco. We were about four, three or four people uh, as a startup. And <clears throat> at 7 p.m. the lights would go off. When the lights go off because it's saving energy, and you have to pick up the phone, a landline, dial a number, and enter a five-digit code to turn the lights back on every day at 7 p.m. So after about a week of doing this, we, we, we kept doing this, and my CTO co-founder said, this is stupid, we're not going to do this next way. So he went on, wrote a, wrote a small script, and used Twilio. Are you familiar with Twilio? Yeah, so you used Twilio to automate the whole process, which was brilliant because for the next week or so, we didn't have to get up and uh, turn the lights on, we could just continue to work. And then one day, uh, a week later, the lights go off. And as the lights go off, and I say this because it's true, any normal individual would have gone, picked up the phone, and turned the lights back on first. But we were in the dark coding and trying to figure out what's, what's wrong with the code that's turning the lights on. Right? So we, we figured out within a few minutes that the, the script was actually perfectly fine, 
But what had happened was Twilio calls were failing. So we dig into a, it a little bit deeper, and we find that the reason Twilio calls are failing is because they were hosted on the East Coast, of, uh, East Coast data center of AWS, and that data center was having an outage due to a storm that was happening at that point of time. So just internalize that. Uh, we thought that we could make it really easy by leveraging cloud capabilities and so on and automate the whole lighting in our office. And in fact, it added more complexity. So this is the world we live in. Things become easy in one, say, well, in one way, but they also become complex. And our lights in San Francisco were controlled by uh, a data center outage on the East Coast. So that's the complexity we live in. So how do you really understand in this hybrid environment what's actually happening when there are so many pieces of this puzzle? How do you assure these experiences? And that's what we're excited to share about. That's what we're here to give more insights into. And we have so much content to cover, so many new announcements to make. If I simplify that digital chain, it starts with the home. And, and by here, when we say mobile, it's also when you're on the road a lot. Then you have the access routing, your environment that takes you in. You have your own data center. This is a, a very simplified view of that enterprise journey. And then you go into the internet, you go to the cloud provider. So you can see there are all these different segments that constitute that end-to-end -end, uh, digital experience. And even though you don't control a lot of this, you're still blamed for issues. Everyone blames the network. So I'm gonna show you a couple things here to just get started on how we can help. It starts with data collection, where we cover all aspects of it, proactive intelligence extraction from all this data, and then just making sure that we can help with the workflows and fix problems. So let's go take a quick look at a couple examples. This is Internet Insights. And what this shows you is a live view of what's happening on the internet. So you can go into a geo and look at what's happening. You can go and select either all network outages or you can go to just application outages. <clears throat> From there, uh, you can go deeper and say, okay, I just wanna look at CDNs, for example. And when you do that, you're starting to filter the graph down to what specifically is happening. Now, if you wanna just take a quick look of this, you can go to thousandeyes.com slash outages. It's a very simplified version. You can even look at it on the phone. But then you can go down to apps that are having an outage, drill down further, and actually understand what's happening from where the impact of the outage is on the left to on the right, how that outage is flowing through on the back end. And that tells you because sometimes you'll find that the impact is only in the US or Europe. And so that's, that's a really simple way to get started with a global view of the internet. From there, I want to show you uh, another aspect, which is uh, troubleshooting the home environment. So this is our own IT environment. We map out applications that are having experience issues. In this case, Ronaldo is having some issues with GitHub. I can, Ronaldo developer going to GitHub, I can map that entire journey from the home, home Wi-Fi, internet, including things like what's the application uh, experience. But then I drill down and actually understand that journey hop by hop, going over the internet, and quickly understand, first off, I'm jealous that Ronaldo is in Italy uh, working from there. That's actually a really nice thing. But here you understand the issue being in Telecom Italia. And that's the source of your problem. So if you can now message Ronaldo and say, hey, your experience to GitHub is bad because of an experience issue, because of an outage in Telecom Italia, we know if you go out, get on the VPN, this will bypass it. So that's the way you can sort of proactively solve this issue and get ahead of it. So these are just a couple of examples. But what's better than actually bringing up a customer on stage? So I'm really excited to welcome Kobe Roselle. Kobe, please come on over. Kobe works at Chevron. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, Kobe, welcome. How's the conference going so far? It's been great. A lot, a lot of great uh, new innovations that we're definitely seeing around Thousand Eyes and App Dynamics, full stack observability. Well, observability. well so. some of it was because you were pushing us constantly. So yeah. thank you for that. <laughs> uh, before we begin, maybe just warm the audience up a bit with your uh, your background a bit, your role at Chevron, maybe a little bit about Chevron. I think I think people, we all think we know Chevron, but until I actually came and sat down with you, it was quite impressive. Yeah, absolutely. I've been with Chevron for 15 years, and the last three years have been leading our enterprise monitoring and AI ops capabilities. So my team is really um, effectively really driving the strategy within Chevron to um, really drive AI ops, bring the data together, and have actionable you know, self-healing, auto-remediation, um, so building resiliency into our platforms. Okay. 
That's, uh, that sounds like uh, a role where you may not get much sleep. Yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. absolutely. And, and just uh, if you rewind the clock back, uh, how did you come across Thousand Eyes? Do you, can you share a bit about what was that use case? Because you know, everybody has uh, 500 tools, and uh, you, don't, you, you don't want another tool, right? So how, how was that? You're absolutely right. We, we have over 40 tools that, that my team manages, and you know, there's definitely an opportunity to rationalize and, and control some of that sprawl. Um, but we, we came across Thousand Eyes, it was about five years ago, and we were doing a WAN uh, project to, to do some expansion. So it's important to know that Chevron operates in over 180 different countries. And uh, it, oftentimes, our, our uh, telecommunication, we're our own telecom yeah. provider, right? Um, in some of those remote areas. And so we were having some challenges with some of those edge sites, and we came across Thousand Eyes. It was a great opportunity for us to uh, deploy some of the um, enterprise agents mm -hmm. at the edge and at our data centers and really understand what some of that latency and network loss look like um, and continuously improve and build resiliency into that network. So that's where our journey started and it's just com continued to grow over time. And for those of you who are not familiar, I just want to clarify a couple of things you mentioned. So uh, when you think about Thousand Eyes, it's a SaaS platform. Uh, and you have a few different ways you can uh, test. You can test from the outside, which is Thousand Eyes infrastructure. These are what we call as cloud agents. I think there will be some terminology used on a level set here. And then enterprise agents is the same software that you can deploy inside your environment. So if you just want to test to, let's say, chevron.com, you can just use the Thousand Eyes cloud agents. You don't need to install anything. If you're testing from within your Chevron environment to mm -hmm. other sites or to cloud providers, you need to install an enterprise agent. And that's actually one which... Uh, we, uh, I, I shared earlier as well, like we have released these to be able to run on Catalyst switches and ISR switches. We're, we have another announce, exciting announcement that I'm not going to steal the thunder from. But those are, that's the uh, enterprise agent, and then the endpoint uh, piece sits on end user laptop. So just some quick clarification on how the terminology works and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, you started with a very specific use case, which was around that, that those issues you were seeing from some sites. How did you end up? expanding beyond that? Uh, what sorts of new things did you uh, turn on? Yeah, so, so really we've seen a lot of digital transformation. So uh, most of our applications, you know, a decade ago were all on-premise, and we've really seen a big shift in adoption towards cloud. So, so much so that, you know, back in 2017, we sold our, our primary North America data center to Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're all in on our cloud strategy. We've seen uh, over the last several years over 15% of our applications move towards software as a service. And so the landscape has changed Change. quite a bit. And uh, we're seeing more internet egress, we're seeing more um, applications that are directly accessed from the internet. Um, and, and so we really needed the visibility of the user experience. And so, so that was kind of the next use case that we had. We, we really wanted to understand is, are these applications available? What does the latency look like? Yep. Um, is there, and, and really do that at a global scale across all of the many countries we operate in and understand that user experience from each of those locations. So we use synthetic transactions um, that we program on, on the application layer, but deploy those tests across the globe and that gives us the insight on uh, not only user experience on the application, but also from a network perspective, um, how those applications are performing in each region. Got it. And one of the things that I found personally as, as I used to talk to customers is uh, customers always wanted to uh, shut down some product or tool, right? And unfortunately, a lot of times we were solving a class of problems that were just not solved. So uh, over time, what I've seen is the, as architecture shift, people start to reduce some of the operations on some other tools because like more traffic is flowing on the internet. Is your situation similar where you, you do need consolidation, but you know, it's not taking out another product right away? Yeah, it definitely hasn't taken another product out. I would say it's actually given us more transparency. Okay. So I was recently reading an article that uh, was stating that your end users report less than 50% of their issues yeah. to the help desk. And so 
if you don't have that transparency at the application layer, then you really don't know the problem. So yeah. uh, you don't even know that it exists. So this was a, a great way for us to really understand uh, not only that uh, it doesn't necessarily give us that real user experience from a synthetic standpoint, but it's giving us that perspective of is that application available within, we, we typically use about a 15 minute increment yeah. for, to run those tests. And we leverage, uh, in the product, it's called markers. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's really milestones within your transaction. And we've standardized some of those so that we can really understand what's the connection time and baseline that, what's your authentication time, and then maybe more specific to the application. One example would be on SAP, we, we pull reports out mm -hmm. of SAP, and we use that as a synthetic baseline. And so we're trying to see how long does it take to actually pull that report, but we get those milestones to really understand the customer journey and what that experience really looks like. When you said markers, I saw my head of product smile because <laughs> like it works, it works. <laughs> it was good to see you smile. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's awesome. And you talked about end users. Uh, can you share a bit about the hybrid work use case because you were pushing on that and I, I do remember uh, you were pushing us as we were in the early stages of that endpoint development, and now we've obviously matured the product more. Uh, but I do remember fondly how you were nicely pushing us on, on doing more. <laughs> so please share more. Yeah, so uh, from a hybrid, hybrid worker standpoint, we actually came across this use case, uh, and this is more on the endpoint agent that you put on a, yep. a user's laptop. Um, we came across a use case where we were transforming our, our VPN connectivity uh, client and also we had a project that w was going on in unison around a Wi-Fi modernization lifecycle yep. project. And so that really helped us gather the right data and insights to understand how the new VPN client would mm -hmm. perform as well as uh, the Wi-Fi within the sites that we were upgrading. Right. So I think it's important to remember that Thousand Eyes, I think oftentimes we think about the operational aspects yep. of it, and I need to be alerted when the application or the service is unavailable or latency, but there's also this continuous improvement perspective from a development standpoint where you can leverage the data that you're gathering from Thousand Eyes to really improve your product. That's a really good point, and that's something uh, we also consistently try to educate uh, the broader audience on is it's not just an after thing. You can actually avoid issues. So that's great to hear. Uh, how does this journey look like going forward? Like how are you thinking about uh, taking, the, taking Thousand Eyes forward towards your modernization? Yeah, so we, we definitely see a lot more scale um, that, that we have. And there's also some things that we've kind of learned along the way, some yeah. best practices. Um, where we've, in some cases, we've siloed the data in, in some ways, where we've got some network views, application views, and of course, we're trying to break down those silos between network teams, application teams, security teams, and really make that more transparent between everyone. So we've got a, an effort underway where we're really trying to, for lack of a better term, redeploy or reconfigure um, our Thousand Eyes to make it more flexible and more scalable across the enterprise. And, and then the next piece of this is really scaling um, out the product and really driving more of the integration. So we leverage App Dynamics uh, for all of our tier one yep. most critical applications. And we leverage Thousand Eyes currently to really give us that perspective of the user experience and then App Dynamics to really give us the perspective of how's the application working all the way down to the code level. So that gives us more of that root cause. Yep. Um, so we're really excited about some of the annou announcements that came out about bi-directional integration, integration between the two. Yeah, and I'm happy about that because the, the last one we did last year was very basic and it did not meet the bar. <laughs> when we had the conversation, yeah. so I'm happy <laughs> that it is actually starting to hit the mark because that's what we're working towards. So that integration and breaking silos. Uh, so I'm excited to see that uh, go live and just start to see because it is really important that we change how people operate. So I love the concept of breaking silos within the organization, outside the organization, and, and it's good to see that that's coming together. So hopefully there will be a lot more hugs between the network teams and the app teams and the infrastructure teams. At, at Absolutely. Shell. It's not always the network problem, right? It, it is never the network. <laughs> right. that's, um, uh, tell, tell us a little bit more about just 
how, what do you want us to do more? Like, how do you, how do you, what suggestion would you have to this audience? By the way, just raise your hands if you actively use Thousand now, just so we have a understanding. Do you use Thousand Eyes in your environment? Okay, great. Um, so maybe it's a, it's a bit of a mixed audience here. What advice would you have for people who use Thousand Eyes uh, since you're pretty mature, as well as people who uh, may be considering Thousand Eyes? And hopefully for the second one, it should be by Thousand Eyes. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think that um, one thing that's really important is take the time to automate the implementation. Um, that's been a, a really big win for us. Yeah. Um, it, it, you want to leverage the power and, uh, it, for lack of a better term, crowdsource uh, yeah. all of your DevOps teams, those that are closest to the application. You want to enable them to really create those synthetic transactions. Um, they're closer to the work, they understand the application, and when the UI on the application changes, they're the ones that are gonna know about it first, and if you don't change those synthetics, that's when you start having challenges. So we've, we've taken a significant effort towards um, enabling our application teams to self-manage all of their synthetics, and do that in an automated way, leveraging some of the Thousand Eyes APIs. So I think that's important to spend the time to really think about how you can self-serve. And uh, of course, there's some integrations as well. Integrate it to your ServiceNow platform. Yeah, ServiceNow, yeah. So we use that for our incident management. Um, and so really having that communication to ensure that you're getting the incidents to the right team at the right time. Yeah. Um, and, and so take the time to really set up that plumbing. Um, last thing I would say is, is really, um, Make sure that you're, you're breaking down those silos. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess one thing for you that I, I, I've heard of a lot of use cases here yep. uh, and continue to hear them from other customers. And I think just sharing that knowledge really helps us accelerate uh, our, our use cases and how we can leverage the product in a better way. So is a best practices are really important for not only us inside the company, but uh, from a community standpoint. That, that is a great point, and thank you for pushing us on that. Uh, uh, if, I, if I sort of summarize that, it's really around automation, making sure you provide uh, access to broader teams so they can use it, uh, transparency, which was also something good, and, and then the integrations into your workflows, whether you use ServiceNow or, or something else, just integrating into the workflows is critical. Uh, and I, I do want to respond to the last point you made, which is a very good one, because even at the last cab, we were called out on like, hey, there's all these different use cases on Thousand Eyes, you can do it for this. Can we actually just have some more community knowledge sharing? And, and we actually did take that seriously over the last year. And we, uh, I think it's, it's last week or two weeks ago. We've just launched a community. So this is, this is really new. Um, we will probably do a follow-up on this in this crowd, and we'll send a link over. Uh, it's not in the deck here. But that's a really good point. I appreciate that. Uh, Kobe, thank you so much for being here. This is great. I really appreciate your time, and thank you for, again, being a great partner and pushing us as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Big round of applause to Kobe. <clears throat> so it's always great. It's fascinating to learn from customers. Now, I, I do want to transition to the next section, but I, I want to take 10 seconds to just share. I'm excited about a lot of innovation coming here. Joe is going to share a lot of that. But I do want to uh, steal the thunder on one, which is the Meraki integration. I'm really excited about this. I am a Meraki customer. I have the Meraki stack. Uh, and I've had success across everything. But the one success I remember is there was a really nasty raccoon in my attic. And that guy would wake us up at like late nights every time. And so I ended up using an MV2, plugged it into the outlet, and actually figured out what this raccoon was doing so I could have a better strategy to tackle this. So with that, Meraki, Meraki integration, I want to welcome Joe Wakara to the stage to share more. Thank you. All right, well, I don't have any stories about raccoons to share, but I want to talk and maybe spend the next uh, 20 minutes or, or so kind of sharing a little bit more about some of the major innovations that we brought out here at Cisco Live. So I'm Joe Vaccaro. I get the opportunity to lead our product team here at Thousand Eyes. And over the past four plus years of being part of Thousand Eyes, I've really just uh, dove into our overall mission. And from the very beginning, Thousand Eyes was born to be able to relentlessly pursue the ability to empower our customers, to be able to see, to understand, and to improve every digital experience that you rely upon. Because the reality is as digital experiences have evolved, traditional operations hasn't evolved with it. 
as you've shifted to a borderless enterprise and has the connectivity between the user and the application is now no longer fully within your control, you can't take the same approach to troubleshooting issues. In the past, you'd be able to identify a problem and you could be able to log into that router or that switch to be able to resolve it. But now, when the issue is across the internet, or it's across a SaaS application that you rely upon, or across a network that you're peering with, how do you uh, identify that problem? And shifting that mindset from a find and fix to an evidence and escalate is key to helping you to build assure that digital experience. And so today I want to talk a little bit about some of the new innovations that we're bringing out both uh, uh, today and also share a little bit about some of the stories along the way that really kind of shape the vision for the future of Thousand Eyes. As Mohit mentioned, this notion of stretching the connectivity is critical because the borderless enterprise is really made up of these different domains. Traditional solutions looked at an individual silo, and it could tell you, I have a wireless problem, or I have a access switching problem, but what it doesn't tell you is, do I have a digital experience problem? And through that, we can see that there are probably in your IT uh, sheds many countless tools that really fail to live up to the promise of helping you to be able to identify a problem quickly and what Thousand Eyes has allowed us to do is be able to then understand digital experience from everywhere that it matters, allowing you to then be able to then de uh, develop a set of proactive intelligence, to be able to understand quickly where the problem is, no matter if it's in your control or across the connectivity that's outside of your control. And then from that proactive intelligence, being able to then ensure you have the ability to then easily integrate that into your operational workflows. So you can tie together this connected ecosystem between your own operations teams, the application operations teams, the infrastructure operations teams. But importantly, when you're, out, when you're accessing and trying to troubleshoot issues outside of your control, being able to then share that intelligence easily within that connected ecosystem of your critical providers that you rely upon. And so to be able to recognize this vision, we really focus on how do we deliver innovations in these three key areas delivering across broad uh, data collection, ensuring that we can be able to have the best data possible to be able to ensure we can deliver visibility from where it matters and the type of visibility that matters to you. Once we've delivered upon this visibility, delivering you then that product, proactive intelligence so we can be able to detect an issue and diagnose where along that digital supply chain that issue exists. And then integrate that through those operational workflows. As Colby mentioned, ensuring that that information can be integrated easily into ServiceNow, into PagerDuty, and into the rest of your overall systems so that the right people at that right point in time have the access to be able to then act on that, uh, on that information. And so at Cisco Live this year, you saw in the keynote uh, yesterday, we rolled out a number of new innovations. We don't have the time to be able to dig into every single one of these, but I want to talk about four key areas today around Cisco Meraki and how we're working together to be able to then take Thousand Eyes deeply integrated into the overall Meraki ecosystem. I want to talk about WebEx and how we can be able to assure hybrid work wherever it happens. How we're looking to extend our uh, path visualization into native uh, networks powered by AWS. And then how we want to be able to then provide new forms of intelligence through automated event detection. And this is critical, as you heard Jonathan yesterday talk about the vision for the Cisco Networking Cloud. Meraki plays a key part in helping us to be able to ensure that we can be able to configure networks and connectivity wherever it happens. And so with that, I want to go ahead and actually bring on my good friend Matt Landry, the VP of product at Meraki, to talk a little bit more about how Meraki and Thousand Eyes are looking to assure that digital experience. So Matt, come on up. Thanks for that, Joe. Really appreciate that. Uh, true, true story. Joe and I have spent hours and hours on the phone or on WebEx. We work in the same building in San Francisco. And here at Cisco Live is the first time we've ever met face to face. And there's, there's two takeaways that we can get from that. One, Joe and I need more exercise. We should walk up and down the stairs and actually talk to each other. But the other is the importance of that hybrid work experience. We need to be able to do what we want, get on WebEx calls, anytime, anywhere. And if we're going to be able to ensure that experience for all of our, our employees, our customers together, uh, for all of our workers, we, we really need to have as much visibility as possible into what's going on between the user who's using some business-relevant application and 
the application server, whoever's providing it. And so, you know, Joe and I sat down and, and said, how can we use the scale of the Meraki platform to help enrich, to make a, a, a much more detailed picture that can help Thousand Eyes? And so we looked at the breadth of the, the Meraki portfolio and settled on using the Meraki MX platform. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with MX, it's a secure SD-WAN appliance, providing intelligent WAN routing capabilities, as well as some of the best Cisco security technology all in one device at the WAN edge of a network. So all of the, the applications, all of the user traffic is all flowing through that MX, and it makes it a really great spot to get Thousand Eyes visibility. And MX already has global scale, 190 countries. We have millions of networks online today with MX with lots of user traffic flowing through it. And so we asked, how can we, how can we get the best of the simplicity of the Meraki platform and combine that with the Thousand Eyes Enterprise Agent in order to greatly simplify the deployment and the operations of that on their networks? And so we took you know, a process that might be with uh, you know, the person, unless they have the right skills and capabilities, might be a 30-minute per network setup process and turn it into three minutes for all of your networks, which is a bold claim. So I'll, I hope you'll give me three minutes to show you what that looks like. So started, for those of you who are familiar, Rocky Dashboard. We added a new field in here, a new page in here for active application monitoring. So we come there, and now this is where we start the journey to integrate with Thousand Eyes. You know, maybe get a trial going if you don't already have Thousand Eyes. You can start that trial, or hopefully you just log into an existing Thousand Eyes account, make it very simple to enter your credentials, and then that connects that Thousand Eyes account to the Meraki dashboard. Back in there, we can see that it's connected, the little green check, that's always a good sign. And uh, we already set up some critical business applications, predefined tests, predefined templates to, uh, to display them. You can define your own, or in this case, we'll use Salesforce, right? So you pick the Salesforce app that you want to set up an enterprise test for, and uh, one piece of information you need to provide, which is your custom Salesforce subdomain, which every, uh, every company using Salesforce has their own. Enter that, move on to the next step. We get the list of networks, and in this case, we only have three networks, right? But that might be 300 networks, 3,000 networks. And the beauty here is that you can configure this this is aware of which networks you have that have the relevant MX devices. You can change those devices, upgrade those devices. Either way, what you set up here will get propagated by the Meraki dashboard in the back end. So you know, we'll pick a couple of these networks that we want to set up these Salesforce tests on, you know, check off the networks, get a confirmation that, hey, indeed, we're going to go set up a Salesforce test with the agent on these networks and start monitoring. Away you go. Click on that, we get confirmation. Hey, we have these agents running, they're enabled on these networks, and uh, you're done. That's it. Now we can move into the Thousand Eyes interface, and uh, you know, we see the same agents listed here that we just kicked off in the Meraki dashboard. They're running on the MXs. We can go to the list of tests that we have set up, and there's the Salesforce test that we just defined for the Meraki networks. And we can look at some details of, uh, of that Salesforce test. Maybe verify once again that, hey, what are the, uh, the agents that are enabled currently? Filter it down, and yep, we're seeing confirmation again. Hey, it's those same two networks that we just saw we were turning on. So now that it's up and running, we can have a look at what are the, uh, what's the status of those tests. Everything's green. Again, green is always good. We're all well-trained. We can you know, maybe get the list of the tests that were actually run, you know, what endpoints were we hitting, 200 response codes, that's all good you know, HTTP, green checks. We can look at the path from the agent that's embedded inside the MX at the edge of your network all the way through the public internet over to that Salesforce server. And that's it. Three minutes, the video's over. We've set up <laughs> on two networks. It could have been 200 networks, 2,000 networks. We set up those agents. So this just shows the power of taking the simplicity of Meraki management and deploying Thousand Eyes to really paint that rich picture so that we can see what's going on with our applications. So with that, I want to hand it back to Joe so we can hear more about how WebEx is coming to play. All right. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. You know, I think that just goes to the power of simplicity. And as you heard from Jonathan yesterday, 
uh, with the Cisco Networking Cloud vision. Simplicity, the unified experience is so critical to ensuring that you can be able to deliver this level of connectivity and assure that experience seamless across where your users work. And to talk about hybrid work, I wanna talk a little bit about the next set of innovation together with WebEx. If you uh, attended the uh, keynote this morning, I think Gito really laid out a compelling vision for how Cisco is looking to not only transform workplaces, but where work happens. Whether work is happening um, in your office, at your home, or in a collaboration space, what we find is that our employees feel more uh, empowered and more productive than ever before. But as an IT team, what we find is that you feel even more stressed than ever before because now work is happening outside of the control and that boundary of what you um, operate today. You have your employees working from your house, uh, working from their houses, accessing devices that are outside of your control, accessing across wireless networks that are outside of your control, relying upon ISP connectivity from their homes that is a unreliable uh, connection. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to assure that digital experience. And so what we've done together with WebEx is actually brought that endpoint agent that Mohit shared in his demo directly into the WebEx device uh, ecosystem. So now as an IT organization, when you're deploying WebEx devices, whether those are in an employee's home through the Desk Pro or the Desk Mini, or you're looking to deploy the WebEx devices in your overall collaboration spaces with the room series devices, you have the ability to then easily deploy that endpoint agent through a control hub in that integrated seamless experience. In the same way that Matt talked about the ability to deploy and enterprise agents across thousands of networks with a simple click of a button, through Control Hub, you have the ability to deploy the, end, the endpoint agent now to hundreds or not thousands or millions of devices in an easy to configure way. And to me, that's about how you retake control to assure that digital experience for hybrid work. Now, I wanna keep going uh, and now talk about how do we look at um, cl cloud networks. When we think about how cloud networks have evolved, we see cloud providers becoming more and more a mission critical uh, part of that overall connectivity. Cloud providers are pushing their networks farther and farther to the edge, ensuring that that traffic is, is uh, ingressing into their network more and more closer to where that connectivity happens. But if you underpin those cloud networks, they're a highly complicated, highly virtualized environment. And what that means from a visibility perspective is that you're losing the level of visibility that maybe you've traditionally had relying upon a more standard TCP IP based connection. And so with Thousand Eyes and AWS, we thought how can we be able to help our customers to deepen the visibility through public cloud networks? And so we're excited to be able to kind of show for you today what this looks like and how you have the ability to enrich the path visualization through your same um, agents that you leverage today to ensure you have deeper visibility for how that traffic is traversing the public cloud networks. So let's go ahead and, and show that video. As you can see here today, on the left what you have is a set of agents that are testing to our own Thousand Eyes uh, application, our own Thousand Eyes platform. And you can see that today there's a set of unknown networks. These, as we know, are actually AWS networks. What we've seen here is actually now the ability to then automatically enrich that path visualization, to be able to then identify when these networks, or these nodes that represent key parts within the AWS's network um, are, are part of that overall path, including leveraging, say, Global Accelerator, where you have the ability to then compare what is your performance based upon what is the expected performance from AWS. So when you see digital disruption, you have the ability to now more easily work across that connected ecosystem with your cloud provider, such as AWS, to be able to understand and feel more empowered across that connectivity. That's a really powerful way, and I think this is really just the start of what Thousand Eyes can do to be able to then bring a deeper level of visibility through cloud native networks. So I wanna then finish with talking about automated event detection. And when I think about automated event detection, what I find time and time again is how can I be able to create a higher degree of signal from the noise that comes within my environment? I'm generating hundreds if not thousands of different tests, and today I'm, I'm, I'm reluctantly required to create different alert rules to be able to identify when do I want to be notified of a particular issue. 
If you wind back the clock, Dallas and I, four years ago, introduced a new innovation around Internet Insights that Mohit uh, uh, showed in his demonstration. Internet Insights leverages the collected data set across all the Thousand Eyes platform to identify in near real time outages that are impacting key network providers and application providers that you rely upon. And what our customer has asked us is says, Thousand Eyes, how can you bring the same level of anomaly detection and outage detection that you do on a broad scale into my own environment so that I can be able to be more proactive and I can be able to understand uh, issues that are happening within my own testing and my own networks that maybe don't necessarily uh, bubble up to a global outage. So that I can ensure that my IT team that are trying to resolve uh, problems aren't just running around trying to whack-a-mole and can be focused on issues that are really going to improve that network. And so what we uh, did is to bring that level of algorithmic detection that we delivered within Internet Insights down into your own tests, and we're calling that Thousand Eyes Automated Event Detection. So I want to go ahead and kind of show a picture of what this looks like uh, for a, uh, a demo of, of Thousand Eyes. And hopefully we can be able to run this video. So in here, this is an example of, of an issue that we detected across a, a set of Thousand Eyes tests. We have the ability to automatically categorize, is this a network issue, a server issue, a DNS issue, or an agent issue that might be affecting across the site wide. From that, as you saw, we have the ability to then identify, is this, uh, what is the scope of this problem? Is this a wide-scale problem with a long duration where you need to take meaningful uh, attention right away? Or can you be able to then maybe bring this into a lower queue? And then from that, have the ability to then quickly jump into uh, the views and be able to launch immediately into a multi-service view that gives you a pinpoint accuracy on where the problem exists using that Thousand Eyes Path visualization as a key way to be able to then identify across those digital supply chain where that problem arises. And that's really the power of what we can do, to take an algorithmic approach across all of your different tests, be able to quickly identify without having to create static alert thresholds, uh, uh, meaningful events that require your attention, and then get you immediately down into where the issue lies so you can focus your teams to solving that problem. Because as we know, there's, uh, as a network engineering and operations teams, there's never a loss of things to do. What focuses, uh, what's important thing to focus on is what actions can be able to improve your network and have a higher level of impact to improve that connectivity and to improve that ultimate, ultimately that digital experience for your users. So in wrapping things up, we talked about a lot of things today. Mohit shared a little bit about the different ways uh, that people use Thousand Eyes, and you heard from Colby from Chevron and the way that Chevron is leveraging the full portfolio of Thousand Eyes to be able to deliver upon their promise of a great experience. And that's really what network assurance is all about, delivering on that promise of a great experience with the tools and capabilities to assure that you can be able to quickly to detect, to diagnose issues so that you can focus on remediating and ultimately improving that uh, digital connectivity. And from Thousand Eyes, we do that through broad data collection ensuring that we can deliver the visibility that matters to you. We do that through providing proactive intelligence and new innovations that allow you to be able to not only deepen the visibility through cloud provider networks, but also to be able to ensure you can be able to get quick access in an algorithmic, automated way to the meaningful events that matter. And then operational workflows that allow you to be able to provide a ability to then take that intelligence wherever it matters across the different teams that need to be able to act on it, that information. And ultimately, this is all in support of our vision, ensuring that our customers have the ability to see, to understand, and to improve those connected experiences everywhere. So I hope this was a helpful way to be able to highlight some of the new innovations that we have at Thousand Eyes. For those of you online, I hope you to, uh, to uh, take a look at thousandeyes.com and thousandeyes.com slash outages so you can see firsthand what Thousand Eyes can do for you. And for those of you in the room, if you haven't stopped by our booth, to be able to see a number of the various different ways that Thousand Eyes can help you in your own environments and grab one of our uh, famed t-shirts, we hope that you don't uh, miss out on that opportunity. So thanks for coming today. Thanks for spending your lunch with us uh, today. And thank you for uh, hearing a little bit more about what Thousand Eyes can do. Thank you, everybody.
Hi everyone, welcome back to the Cisco TV broadcast studio, coming to you right from the middle of the world of solutions here in Las Vegas. We are so glad to have all of you with us on the streaming broadcast from Cisco Live. I hope you're sticking with us throughout this entire stream. So much great content in the keynotes and in the innovation talks like the one that we just came out of right now on redefining network assurance for modern digital experiences with uh, Colby Rizal and Mohit Ladd and Matt Landry. Cisco is redefining assurance based on industry shifts toward internet, cloud, hybrid work. We are developing the first true end-to-end -end network assurance solution with Thousand Eyes, delivering AI-powered visibility and insights and contextual drill down into every domain, closed loop automation for self-healing networks, we're going to continue the Thousand Eyes story right now with Nish Parker, who is right next door to me here in the studio. Hello, Nish. Hey, Steve, how you doing? I'm doing great, my friend, how about you? Yeah, very good, thank you. I'm here in Set B. I'm joined by Angelique uh, Medina. So, Angelique, how are you? I'm very good, nice to be here. Lovely to meet you. So, you are the Director of Internet Intelligence for Thousand Eyes. First off, tell me a little bit about Thousand Eyes, what it is, and then please tell me a bit about your team. Yeah, absolutely. So Thousand Eyes is focused on providing visibility into all of the networks and services that our customers rely on, but that they don't directly control or own. Uh, so, you know, really focused on networks like the internet, SaaS provider networks, cloud provider networks. And the internet intelligence team is focused on three areas. Uh, the first is responding to outages and incidents with insight and analysis to help our customers and the broader IT community understand what's going on, uh, how it impacts them, and what they can learn from it to improve their own operations in the future. Um, the second thing that we focus on is uh, understanding uh, internet services on, at a broad scale. So we conduct measurement-based research and we publish this in reports that you can download and find on our website. And we also publish a regular update on the health of the internet that again, you can find on our blog or uh, through the podcast that we publish. Got it, and um, I hear that thousand hours, I want to get this right, there's hundreds of outages per day that you detect, right? So tell us a bit about how you do that. Absolutely, so we have vantage points. They're distributed around the globe. They're connected to thousands of networks. And from those points, we can actually see the uh, performance and the uh, paths that the traffic is taking to various applications and services. So we have this really broad global view and what we do is we aggregate all of this information and surface incidents and outages on um, our outage map, which you can find on our website. It's free to check out. You just go to thousandeyes.com slash outages and it's kind of like the Google Maps of the internet, if you will. Got it, and obviously Thousand Eyes is here at the show. Could you tell me a bit about the presence and what there is to do at Cisco Live around Thousand Eyes? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, the great thing about Thousand Eyes is it really is applicable no matter where within um, kind of the, the networking uh, domain that you find yourself. So um, whether it's collaboration, whether it's um, SD-WAN, whether it's security or SASE, like we really have a role to play there in enabling um, all of the folks who manage these areas to get visibility into the internet. Because of course, you know, fundamentally organizations really rely on this, not only for their own traffic, but also, you know, when you think about hybrid work, you know, we're all connected to hundreds, thousands of networks that IT is now responsible for ensuring we have a good experience over. So, um, so you know, you can really find ourselves across the board in all of these different areas, and there's many sessions to check out. Um, but definitely come by our booth because yeah. that's where you're going to get all of the cool T-shirts yeah. um, that uh, yeah. you, you really can't miss. And um, what is unique about Thousand Eyes in the sense that you know, if customers that are looking out there, maybe they're researching different solutions, what really stands out around Thousand Eyes that you would kind of love them to, to take away and part of what's this yeah. on? I think the, the biggest thing is that, you know, the data that we have is really unmatched. You know, our view of the internet, you know, just the, you know, the internet is obviously massive, right? <laughs> and, yeah. um, and so, you know, one, we just have such uh, you know, unique, ubiquitous visibility across the internet, and also the way in which we aggregate this in, into collective intelligence, so you can see you know, not just your own network or the paths that are relevant for you, but you can see that really macro, big picture view of what's going on on the internet and its health. So I would say that that's, that really sets us apart from anyone else out there. 
And I would love to hear, obviously, we're here at Cisco Live, we're here in Las Vegas. I'd love to hear about your Cisco Live experience. So what have you been doing so far? What's really stood out to you at the show? Yeah, I mean, it's been great. Just like amazing energy, you know, even, even more so than last year, I would say. There's just uh, so many more people. Uh, everybody's really excited, and I know that you know it's it's also great to see colleagues, yes. uh, you know, that come in from around the globe. Uh, so I'm sure everybody else is having that experience too of just being able to catch up with a lot of folks face to face. I've really loved walking around the Water Solutions because you can see all the different partners that we have here, our different solutions. A lot of people come to Cisco Live literally to get their hands on the technology to be able to see it, right? So you mentioned there's a Thousand Eyes booth here. So can you tell me a bit about the demos or like what you have? on show there. Yeah, absolutely. So there's multiple demo pods, definitely check it out. I mean, the great thing about Thousand Eyes is that it's a cloud delivered solution. So right. you can also check it out yourself. You can sign up for a free trial, you know, get full use of the platform. But if you really want a guided tour, definitely recommend uh, stopping by. You can check out the integrations that we announced yesterday with, yes. for example, WebEx, as well as Meraki MX and Secure Client. So there's just a whole bunch of different things that you're going to be able to see there. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely recommend stopping by. Okay, so finally, um, where should people go for more information? Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that you can find on our website, thousandeyes.com. Um, if you want to check out the sort of the internet weather map, uh, go to thousandeyes.com slash outages. Um, definitely check out our blog. That's where we publish our uh, outage analysis. And um, our research is also there as well. And then, you know, anywhere you get your podcast, you can subscribe to the internet report. And finally, you know, we've got uh, lots of stuff going on on LinkedIn and Twitter. So if you want the latest and greatest, want to understand what's happening on the internet, uh, definitely subscribe to those channels. Amazing. Angelique, thank you so much for joining me here in the studio. Thank Steve, you. back over to you. Thank you so much, Nish. I appreciate it. Angelique, thank you. Fantastic job. Really grateful to you and to Thousand Eyes for continuing to bring these fantastic stories to us here in Cisco Live. Uh, it's just fantastic. So. I had a great opportunity to sit down with one of our last session's hosts, Mohit Ladd, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Cisco's Network Assurance and co-founder and CEO of Thousand Eyes. Mohit is such a great visionary and positive force for technology and innovation. Let's listen in on that conversation together. Here we go. Welcome everyone, we are here in Studio B and I'm hanging out with Mohit Ladd, Senior VP and GM of Cisco Network Assurance, also co-founder and CEO of Thousand Eyes. You're a very, very busy man these days, Mohit. <laughs> We're excited to be here. It's been fun, just soaking the energy. It's just so good to all be back in person and sitting and talking with one another. Uh, you just wrapped a fantastic iTalk. Congratulations on that. Do you think it went, it went well? Were you excited about it? Good response from everybody in the audience? I, I think it went really well. I saw a lot of nodding, which is always a good sign. <laughs> um, and I look, I mean, there's just so much that has changed in a post-pandemic world that we're excited to be here and share all the updates. Oh, it's fantastic. So you and Joe Vaccaro, you painted this really compelling vision of delivering experiences in the post-digital world. What do you think the key takeaway is for our Cisco Live audience here this week? Yeah, so I think the, the main thing is there is now a steady state in the post-pandemic world, which is, Everything is going to be hybrid in some flavor, right? Some working from home, some working from office, and every experience is across these different environments, right? So home, office, cloud, SaaS, and the, one of the key takeaways here is that no matter where the employees sit, no matter where the customers are, no matter where applications sit, we have the ability to see across these environments, and that is really powerful, and even as I was showing stuff, it was incredible to see some of the reactions of what's possible. So that's, it's, it's quite exciting. I think a lot of people don't quite understand that having the complete vision of what's going on across your network, right, whether we're talking FSO or whatever it happens to be, it's that level of additional insight. You can't look at anything in a vacuum. The siloed world is long gone at this point, right? It's the comprehensive view that really means the most. Yep, and it's the depth, right? So I, I give this analogy. Uh, typically now when there's an outage, because you don't control everything, you're just trying a bunch of things. Okay, turn off the VPN, turn on this, like you're just trying a bunch of things. And imagine if you were to go to a doctor and say, I have, you know, I have pain in my leg. And they would just say, okay, let's try these medicines one at a time. 
for a week and see if it works. Like that's pretty scary. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's not how it should operate. So I think the depth of understanding exactly where that bone is broken in that network view is, is really compelling. And, uh, and I'm, I'm energized also because of the additional work we are doing as part of Network Assurance. That's perfect, and that's actually where I want to go next. You led me directly to it, right? So uh, you had Colby Rizell in your talk talking uh, from Chevron talking about why assuring digital experiences is so incredibly critical, right? Matt Landy from Meraki yeah. talking about how Thousand Eyes gets us to that vital digital reality that we're headed for. So what excites you personally about what you're seeing, where you're going in this transformational future vision of ours? Yeah, so, we, so Thousand Eyes came into Cisco three years ago, right, and part of that was to combine the intelligence we have on the internet with all the intelligence Cisco has within enterprise environment. So it's been three years, we've done a ton of integrations, but the integrations are the means to an end. What we really want to do is make sure we can assure an experience no matter where it starts and where it ends. And network assurance historically has been very domain specific. So you just think Wi-Fi assurance or ISP link level assurance but the modern experience starts at home, goes to, through your environment, enterprise, and then to the cloud. And what's exciting is we've done these really thoughtful integrations. So we now run on Meraki MX, which we were right. excited to announce. We are doing integrations with RoomOS, with WebEx devices, as well as integrations with WebEx on the back end, so that helps with the collaboration experience. We have already done some great work with the switching and routing portfolio. We've done work with App Dynamics. And the intent here is to really piece together all these different pieces into one end-to-end -end view. So when you have an issue in your network or in your environment, I mean, you know, like I say, everybody blames the network. Right. Uh, and it's really the ability to now quickly see whether it's the network, which part of the network, and not just say, hey, it's not my environment, right? So it's, it's quite powerful. We're really changing how people operate. And, and Kobe referred to that as well. They started with a very specific use case and then they've expanded to like tap on hybrid work and tap on public cloud and it's just the breadth that is exciting. I actually learn about use cases from customers every day. I think maybe this is one of the most powerful things that we never really talk about enough here at Cisco, right? Why do we do the things that we do? We're hearing it from our customers, we're hearing it from our partners, this is what they want. Go back to the Meraki integration yeah. really quickly, just because we touched on it a moment ago and I think this is such an important picture. How did it come about? Give me like the 30 second tight overview of how it so happened. First off, I'm a big Meraki fan. Yeah. I actually use the stack at home and I've even used their cameras to catch raccoons in the attic and all that. So <laughs> some of it is like, I'm just passionate about the Meraki stack and I see the immense potential it has. But that aside, we've heard from so many customers. A lot of them have like really distributed sites uh, like large post office environments and so on. And they have Meraki in all these environments. They're very easy to manage. And they've all been asking for us to integrate into the Meraki environment so they can deploy a thousand eyes and do the same things they can do from like everywhere, whether it's Catalyst, Meraki, and so on. So it is coming about from there, but it's also one of those things where it's such an easy to manage platform that we can do a lot of things together and make it a seamless experience for the customers. So that's what I'm excited about. It's the integration, it's the data, but it's also from a customer standpoint, we're making it really seamless. It doesn't feel like there's three different products. We're just connecting it well together. Oh, I think that's so cool. And by the way, I want us to come up with more raccoon-focused technology so you and I can talk about that later. Um, let's zoom out. Let's talk just a little bit about assurance in general. What role does assurance play in Cisco's overall cloud networking approach right now? Yeah, so uh, it's a very important part, and this is why we define this role on network assurance. And if you think about the work Cisco is doing along with security networking coming together, unified experience, simplification, it's also the ability to deliver a consistent experience no matter where, right? And even from a security standpoint, you, you can't just secure an experience. If it's not a great experience, just to secure, but bad experience, again, doesn't make sense. So assurance is something that ties everything together. The internet threads through every part of this experience. And what makes it compelling is not just a marketing slide saying we're doing assurance. There is tight integration, again, as I mentioned, really thoughtfully done. We're connecting with Meraki, with Catalyst, with WebEx, and, and it's really sort of threading through every part of Cisco's portfolio in this end-to-end stack that Cisco is building for, for customers, so. It is so exciting. I love what you're doing. I love what the team is doing with Thousand Eyes. Uh, Mohit, it's such a pleasure to have you here in the studio with us. Please come back and visit us again, and let's continue to hear more about this, and congratulations again on the great session. Thank you, loved it. Great, thanks so much for joining us here. We're going to send it back to the studio.
All right, Moya, thank you so much. So glad to have you here in the studio. I just love what it is that you're doing. I really enjoyed our time together. Thousand Eyes really is a critical part of so many different organizations' capabilities, and one of those fantastic partner customers is the WWE, which makes for an exceptionally cool story that we get to tell together. Thousand Eyes is a great partner in with WWE's tech stack making sure that they could really deliver an exceptional viewer experience. WWE, huge fan base, and guess what? I've got Ralph Riley here in the studio with me, Director of Broadcast IT Systems at WWE. Welcome, I am so glad that you're here on set with us. Thank you for having me, I'm very excited to be here. This is uh, quite the privilege and opportunity, thank you. This is really, this is a fun story for me. I'm really excited about this. We got a lot of WWE fans uh, here in our Cisco TV production team as well. First thing that I want to ask you about, tell us about your role, tell us about what you do with WWE and why Cisco Live this week. Yeah, so I've been with WWE for about 14 years, started out as an intern with the company, moved on to be what, what, what my role is now as Director of Broadcast IT Systems for our television studio in Stamford, Connecticut. Okay. So in Stamford, Connecticut, we have an infrastructure of network switches, firewalls, servers, storage, you name it, that houses all of our WWE content in our studio system. And to manage that infrastructure is not an easy task. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you that much. Um, we also do have our corporate office, which manages our IT infrastructure, also you know, normal departments such as marketing, HR, et cetera. But I have to say, the TV studio is really the bread and bread butter of what WWE does in terms of, this is how our content gets in. This is how our content is managed. And I'm in charge of making sure that that content gets to be sent out to all of our distribution partners around the globe. So that way, WWE can be seen not only domestically here in the States, but also on an international scale as well. And we do it 52 weeks out of the whole year, so we're nonstop. That's a total scale story as well, on top of everything else. How long did it take you to get to that particular level, where it's literally a weekly thing? You know, honestly, WWE has been a weekly thing since its inception. It's amazing. And there, there's no off season, right? So every week, we have content that's constantly coming into our infrastructure at our TV studio. And that content could be anything that you see on television where our superstars, our W superstars, are at, at the arenas around, around the globe. So we can be here in Las Vegas, we can be here in New York, and that's where our show is taking place. But it doesn't just stop there. Our content also is featured around other different media distributions as well. So you'll see us on News Atlas, you'll see us doing philanthropic work like with Make-A-Wish Foundation. So that content, wherever it is, even if it isn't a show, gets brought into our facility in the TV studio in Stanford. That's just incredibly cool. What does it take actually to, to pull off a really incredible show like the WWE. I mean, it seems like it's all so smooth and so fun, but I cannot imagine the number of people in the infrastructure. Well, you know what, there, there's a lot of emotions and there's a lot of <laughs> heartache and what I like to say is there's a lot of storytelling that goes on with WWE behind the scenes. So from what you see on television, the, the premise is good versus evil. There's also a lot of that behind the scenes. And I kind of like to make my job and what I do that Story, storytelling, which kind of makes things a lot more fun than what I do, right? Mm -hmm. so, so think about it, there's a WWE show that goes on at an arena, right? The content is being filmed, the content is being created right there. Now, it's really important that that content, almost live, almost um, immediately, gets sent to the TV studio in Stanford, Connecticut. Now, on paper, that sounds like it's probably a pretty easy thing. Well, I'll tell you right now, there's some infrastructure and some arenas that are just completely antiquated. So there's some arenas where we liaise with the house IT infrastructure, and sometimes that IT infrastructure is a utility closet or an electrical cabinet. And let's, let's be honest, sometimes that stuff just doesn't work. So besides getting the show on the air, besides getting that infrastructure set up at those arenas, we have to ensure that there's constant connectivity and communications between where we are and receiving that content and sending it to our TV studio in Stanford, Connecticut. Mm. So my role is to not only oversee the infrastructure at the TV studio, but my role also is to oversee and ensure that the infrastructure on the road is up to date, making sure that it's reliable, making sure that it's accurate as well. And that it's not an easy task when you have so many different variables that could go wrong. And the agility that that's going to require as well. Um, how is Thousand Eyes helping you to do your job a lot better? Maybe you could even give us a, a story or two that you could share around the yeah, Thousand Eyes partnership. Yeah, so, so I go back to the story of good versus evil. Blame the network, blame Ralph. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's been, I've been you know, uh, showcased as the bad guy in many different situations. But thanks to Thousand Eyes, we've been able to utilize the technology of enterprise agents and cloud agents to give us that proactive measurement of 
when there might be an issue in, in the topology or the path of the network between the TV studio and also our road environment. So instead of someone from the road calling and being like, hey Ralph, the network's having an issue, what are you going to do? I get very flustered, I might get you know, upset at the fact that there might be some issues and I'll say, okay, well, let's start from the chain of storage all the way to the infrastructure and hopefully we'll find the problem. But thanks to Thousand Eyes, we're able to be proactive in terms of the alerting about where that issue might be. So to give you an example of the story that we had, there was an ISP outage. So our content gets sent from the road to our TV studio over direct internet lines or point-to-point -point fiber. There was an ISP outage for one of our main ISPs and Thousand Eyes and the alert that we got, not only in our emails, but also our integration to Slack was able to not only tell us that proactively before we got a call from the road, but it also allowed us to pinpoint where that issue was up in the ISP chain. So from that point, we were able to get in touch with our ISP and say, hey listen, we have an issue right now. We didn't see any alerts from you, but I would like to proactively tell you that I'm having an issue and here's where it's at. And not only did that save us time, but it allowed me to turn into the good guy and not be the one that was being blamed for the network being down. That is such a cool story because the observability is such a big part of it. We've got to know what the network is doing. We've got to know where we're reliable, where we're potentially at risk. And I love the idea of all of a sudden you turning from the bad guy into the good guy. <laughs> I want to know more about the bad guy thing. Have you ever been hit with a folding chair, by the so way? I haven't been hit with a folding chair physically, but sometimes I feel like I, I am with words. Um, but you know, in WWE, you know, uh, we, we have such an excellent staff. We have such an excellent culture. And the main thing for us is to put smile on people's faces. So while I haven't been hit with a chair yet, um, if I need to take one for the team because something isn't going right, I will. But you know what, it's all in good fun because WWE is about having a good time. WWE is about putting a smile on people's faces and it's, it's really been a blast for all the years I've been there. It is such a good story. I am so grateful that you've been with us here at Cisco Live this week, helping to tell this story and create this uh, great partner connection. And I'm so glad that you had time to come into the studio. Ralph, thank you. Great, thank you very much. This has just been great. Remember, keep reaching out to us using hashtag Cisco Live across any and every social media platform, whichever you prefer. And remember, all of the content, in case you miss anything, it is all available to you on demand at CiscoLive.com. We've got some great stuff coming up, including tonight, is the big customer celebration with Gwen Stefani and Blake Shelton. If you were here in Las Vegas, you're going, and if not, you need to be here next year, so you can be a part of that celebration. Tomorrow morning, we're going to be bringing you live broadcast throughout the brunch right here on the World of Solutions show floor. Speaking of which, out on the World of Solutions show floor, I believe in the collaboration zone, talking WebEx. Rob, are you out there? I am right here, Steve, <laughs> and so good to hear your voice. I, I don't know if you had a chance to make it up to the crew lunch, but. I went back for seconds and now I'm wishing I hadn't. I'm used to having more time to like nap or something after a big meal. I think you're caught. Your bed is yeah. waiting for you here in the back in the studio. If you can ever get back here, you should take advantage of that, man. But as you well know, this is one of my favorite spaces. Obviously, we're in collaboration. A lot of announcements this morning to take advantage of. And I thought we'd take a quick look through the booth, maybe pick out a few select things to dive in deeper. If you look over here, just around the corner, though, they've got the, the new codec being showed off there. We've got the headsets, including B&O, and a, there are a, lot, a long line of, in fact, that brings up partnerships and some of the stuff we do. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Over here, we got these awesome devices that are just so easy for home that the power's built in, it's easy to pick up and carry. It's purposely designed so your laptop opens up right underneath here, but you get the additional sound, the better camera, and all the things that WebEx brings. Let's go this way. We've got Microsoft Teams room. If I stick with my partnership theme here, this is so huge. Don't worry guys, you're on live with us. It's a lot of fun. But that integration is so critical. It's making it easier and removing the complexity and it does not matter what uh, service you're already using. We are agnostic when it comes to the service, but we have a very good relationship with Microsoft that's worth taking advantage of. I, I'm thinking that we might need to go over this direction. So let's take a look and see what's going on here. Thank you. I believe you are Chad, your product manager, is that right? Very nice to meet you. Oh, look at that. You've got, you've got a microphone. It's almost like we staged it. Absolutely. Well, let's see what happens. Chad, uh, we'll set that down. For, yeah, let's go. That's good. You're right on theme. Absolutely. All right. I appreciate that. I'm going to just toss that. All right. So we made an announcement today about WebEx and AT&T. What's important about this, and could you explain what's, what's good to remember? Well, thanks for stopping by. We're very excited. It's a better together story that delivers unrivaled mobility experience. And what we're doing is really exciting in terms of an unheralded capability to bring up that functionality of the mobile phone, the mobile device, into the whole WebEx calling uh, ecosystem. Perfect. So what we've awesome. done here is we've elevated the uh, mobile call 
the mobile number to be your identity inside of WebEx Calling. So what we're doing here is we're just going to enable the phone to give us the calling capability. All right, so what we're doing here is elevating the call. So the mobile number for ATT allows us to escalate that call. We've taken that mobile number and now we're calling the user Sophia here. So Simone is going to give us the ability to make and receive phone calls on both devices and their app at the same time. So as we answer that call, we now can then seamlessly move that call back over to the AT&T mobile phone number that is your now business calling idea. So now what we do is we can elevate that call to a full-blown WebEx meeting. The exciting part here is it's one number that gives you the mobile capability that users are asking in the mobile in the hybrid workspace. We now can now ring all devices and move the call back and forth. So we're extremely excited for better together with our WebEx calling capability with AT&T driving a, a full story of WebEx integration. That's awesome, you were getting all that marketing message out. I was like, is he gonna nail it? He's getting, he stuck the landing. That's good, Chad. Right. Sorry, let's go with <laughs> Let's go. No, don't worry, it's, you did good. I didn't mean to say you had to do it differently. I mean, so you did it perfectly fine. This is really interesting, and this is about the partnerships. I don't know if you picked up on just how many different uh, big organizations that WebEx is partnering with, and it's all about a lot of the nuance around how do we meet, how do we get work done, can we make that simpler, can we remove more of the complexity, but not forget to acknowledge that it's not just about the endpoint, it's not just about the service, it's not just about a lot of different things, it's all about how do we do this stuff together to make it work. I'm going to throw it back to Steve right now in the studio, but hold on, I'll be back with you in a moment with a big surprise on one of my personal favorites. Excellent, absolutely, Rob, I really do appreciate it. You just said it, you said it so well, right? Collaboration. There's a reason the business unit is called collaboration, that WebEx is underneath, and it's because how do we connect and work with one another? Those partnerships, the way we tie people together to create the benefit out of the technology we build, Rob, I think that's really what it's all about. So Great job, as always. I'll be back to you in just a quick moment. So we're actually going to jump sides of the show. So Rob has been in collaboration, which is down at the opposite end of the showcase back there. But we're going to continue this collaboration, meeting capability by going from that corner of the world of solutions to that corner of the world of solutions, where I was able to hang out in the meeting zone a little while ago. We are running over 1,500 different Meet the Engineers meetings. We've got one-on-one. -on -one, we've got walk-in lab capabilities. We've got our whisper suites with NDA for new technologies as people are developing. Let's check that out together now. Do you have a meeting scheduled here at Cisco Live? Well, if so, this is your destination. We are right in the middle of the world of solutions. This is the meeting zone. So, for example, right back over here, you can meet the engineer. You can connect one-on-one -on -one with brilliant Cisco engineers, and you get to set the entire agenda. You get to build it around your unique questions, your challenges. We are going to run 1,500 Meet the Engineer sessions this week while we are here in Las Vegas. This is also where you can meet the executive, right back over here, for pre-scheduled meetings with customers and with partners. Then on this side, we've got our Whisper Suites. This is really cool. Executives and SMEs are meeting with customers and partners to discuss future product releases. This is why they are called Whisper Suites. We are honoring those NDAs. That way you can talk about anything and everything in a completely safe environment. So get on in here, take advantage of the meeting zone. Let's go. Meetings are such a gigantic part of Cisco Live. Every year, so many attendees come in from all over the country, all over the world, and they want to take those meetings. They want that one-on-one -on -one time to ask their questions and really target our technologies directly to their specific needs. Where do you take those meetings? Well, you can take them in your office, you can take them in your home, you can take them anywhere. In fact, Rob is going to talk about one of those places you can take a meeting right now, right, Rob? Yes, in fact, I'm a big Ford F-150 lover. I've had an F-150 since early 2000s, and I'm currently a 2021 hybrid driver. I do not, I've not had the pleasure of a Lightning, and certainly not a Ford Lightning setup like this one is. Travis, uh, what is it do you do for Ford? Do you work for Ford or WebEx? I, or I work for WebEx. Uh, awesome. I lead the design and research team uh, for collaboration, so all things hybrid work uh, as part of my team. So this is the fully electric F-150 Lightning. Yes. But it, you guys are showing us some technologies that some of which is already here, some of which may still be coming. Very much walk so. us through that. Yeah, so what we're showing today is our vision for hybrid work uh, in, in the vehicle. With uh, electric vehicles coming, we sort of view the vehicle as kind of a new place where work happens uh, in between the office and in between other things. And so when we think about hybrid work, we know it's not just running apps and throwing a camera. Right. 
it's connectivity, security, device management, all the things that and Cisco safety. and safety yeah. uh, that Cisco loves and, and our customers love us for. And so we have brought a prototype here to show kind of how this works and how we imagine this vision coming to life. Obviously, you went to the trouble of bringing a big truck in here, so I want, Pat, I wonder if you could come here and get in the dash. Hello, Don, everybody say hello. Don's on the account team with Ford. Why don't you narrate for us, Travis, what are we looking at? Yeah, so what we're looking at here uh, is an appliance that we have built here that helps us sort of test this setup. But again, what we imagine this experience to be is, you know, Don uh, is parked and she has some work to do or some important things that she needs to attend to and now she can do this instead of being limited by her small screen on her device, she now has the full capabilities of, of this display. And so what we're showing here is we have, of course, WebEx, we have all of our security apps like Meraki and Duo and all of these things. And so now Dawn has this uh, uh, uncompromised sort of hybrid work uh, experience, again, that is uh, safe and kind of at, at her, 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 her fingers. So what you see here on top here uh, is a camera. So we can actually see uh, the full cabin here. And the other thing that you get by using WebEx here is all of our uh, AI video technology. So things like uh, face recognition, uh, uh, background noise removal, all of that is in here. So if Don is talking and there's noise around, we're on a busy conference floor, everyone will be able to hear her yeah. using the WebEx technology. Hey, Don. <laughs> Don I'm creeping up on Don behind here, and I'm like, hey, Don. <laughs> it's like, she may not have realized I came here. Well, and so what part of this is, you know, what kind of timeline are we looking at here in terms of this rolling out, the hardware being ready? Because it sounds like a hardware-software partnership here. Uh, we're not committing to dates right now. We're really in this prototype phase where we're trying to experiment and learn more. But we've made a ton of progress. We started on this prototype in December and we've already yeah, come a, a long way. I don't know if you have time, uh, can we show oh, WebEx ahead. Yeah, please, let's see. So Don is going to launch WebEx, and we're, watch, we're running the full kind of standard WebEx app, so messaging, calling, her schedule, one button to push. That's the whole platform. And yeah. meetings run, run on this device. Do you want to maybe start a meeting? <laughs> Sometimes I That's the last thing I want to do, Travis. <laughs> but I get it, yeah. We no, all need more meetings, demo. yes, yes. <laughs> So you can see here, we have the view inside the car, and Don's going to start a meeting. Uh, and we should have someone ready ready to join us here. Well, I tell you what, though, I am going to have to jump out. They're telling us we're running out of time, but Travis, Don, and there's actually some other team members here as well. This is awesome. Oh, good, we did get someone live on Excellent. there. So we'll tell them I hate to be rude. We're meeting in the truck again. They've probably been doing this all day. Either way, this is fantastic stuff. These kind of partnerships are just changing the landscape. Yes. I love it. So I don't have this in my truck yet, but Steve, I'm going to get this as soon as I possibly can. I have no doubt about it, Rob. I think the key word there was yet, and uh, please make it a lightning. If you can do it, it's a remarkable oh vehicle. Uh, thanks so much for bringing us that great story. Thanks to the team over at the Ford F-150. We appreciate it. All right, we are headed into our next innovation talk, Security Experiences Simplified with Tom Gillis and Josh Mathias. So security and productivity, these should not be a trade-off, but the reality is, today it is. So in this session, Josh and Tom are going to look at the latest security innovations that we're creating here at Cisco, what you need to become more resilient in the face of unpredictable threats. You're going to hear from a customer about Cisco's strategy to simplify experiences that make security better for users, easier for IT, optimized for your DevOps, safer for literally everyone in your organization. Please keep reaching out to us using hashtag Cisco Live across social media. Enjoy the innovation talk and we will meet you right back here in the studio as soon as it's done. Away we go. And safer for everyone. Our speaker today is Tom Gillis, SVP GM of the Security Business Group. Tom is new to Cisco, but not entirely. He was a member of the founding team of Ironport Systems, acquired by Cisco in 2007. He's recently returned to Cisco to drive the security product portfolio. Now please, help me in welcoming to the stage Tom Gillis. All right, good afternoon everyone. I'm Tom, I run the security products here at Cisco. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the trends that we see in the industry and some of the things that I think are interesting where security meets networking, right? And this is the places that Cisco can really shine. 
So um, as uh, we've said in the introduction, I was part of uh, the founding team of Ironport. Ironport was an innovative little company. And we did one thing, and we did it really well. We stopped spam. And so what has been happening in the security industry is that every time a new security problem emerges, there's a bunch of companies like Ironport that crop up to solve that problem. And so while that model works in that we create very, very effective solutions, they're generally very, very focused, or what we call point solutions. And so over time, what this has meant is that it puts the burden on you, our customers, to constantly ingest a new vendor and a new tool. Now, as we make our journey collectively to a multi-cloud world, we start to have data centers that run in our private cloud, but also on Amazon, on Google, and Microsoft. And each one of them have their own embedded security tool chain. And so it makes this problem worse. Right? And so it's not uncommon to meet customers that have 100 or 150 different security tools in their tool chain. And so this is what we call tool sprawl. And despite widespread deployment of these very good tools, every one of them is very good, you know, both the frequency and severity of attacks like ransomware has increased steadily in the past year. So I think it's taking everyone in the industry and giving us a moment to say, you know what, we've got to think differently about how we do security. We can't keep applying patches and hoping that we're going to get a better outcome. And this is very much the vision that we have with the Cisco Security Cloud that we introduced last year. So the concept is simple. Can we deliver a set of security services in software, cloud delivered, that is independent of infrastructure? And this is important. These tools can span everything from when a user clicks on that email from that friendly guy, the Nigerian prince, right? So from the moment they click on that friendly prince's email, all the way through until an application accesses the data. And if you can have that end-to-end -end view of what's happening, these patterns stand out like a sore thumb. So as we think about the security cloud, there are four constituents that we have in mind. First, and I would argue foremost, is the end users. Can we deliver an excellent end user experience and deliver common sense security policy. For our IT team, these are the people that purchase, manage, deploy the system. Can we make a more efficient, faster deployment, easier to manage? Yes, we can. For the security operations team, they're thinking about efficacy. Is this system more effective at stopping things like ransomware? And then lastly, for the developer, more and more the developer is part of the security ecosystem because we can take these policies and controls and build them into the software development lifecycle. So I'll touch briefly on each one of those. I'm going to start with the end user. So imagine if you as a user were to go to get a glass of water, and you turn on the tap. Can you imagine if someone asked you, would you like that water delivered via a copper pipe or iron pipe? Or maybe today we have a special, we're delivering water on a plastic pipe, right? Like, that's, of, of course not. You open the tap, you fill your glass, you turn the tap off. So why is it then when, as a user, to access an enterprise application, you have to be aware of what path you would take, right? If I'm accessing a legacy app like SAP or maybe Jira that's residing on-prem, I have to open a VPN. But if I'm accessing a new application um, that's in a zero trust framework, I go through a zero trust. If I'm going to a SaaS application, it might be a different experience, single sign-on. And then if I'm going to just plain old CNN, it's a different experience still. And so this is like, I sometimes call it a two-headed dog. Uh, it's a different experience based on what type of, of, of application you're accessing. I had a bunch of customers in the room yesterday, a room sort of roughly like this, about 50 customers, and I asked a show of hands, how many customers have embarked on a zero trust project, have actually put some sort of zero trust, zero trust network access? Have you put these controls in place? Show of hands, 100% of the hands go up. How many customers have to run a VPN in parallel to the Zero Trust project? How many hands do you want up, do you think? 100%. No, 100%. Because the reason why is it's difficult to take this long tail of applications that were written for a different time. Applications were written for a model where the data center had any, any connectivity. And when you were behind the firewall, you're in that trusted zone, you could connect to that application. And so moving those applications out of that any, any model into the zero trust framework is harder than it looks. It doesn't work all the time. And so, so we have an answer for this. And so this is what we call Cisco Secure Access. It blends together traditional VPN access, that any, any model, with modern zero trust. And it allows you to deliver an amazing end user experience and 
you can, will meet you where you are on that journey to zero trust. And so it's the world's most boring demo to show the end user experience. Here's how it works. The user opens their laptop and they go to work. Right, ta-da, that's the, that's the demo, right? So, so <laughs> whether you're on-prem or remote, whether you're going to Workday or a new application, a web-based app in a zero-trust framework or a multi-channel app like SAP, the experience is the same. And so my tagline is, I sometimes say that the company that brought you the VPN is killing the VPN. Now, we're not killing the VPN, because under the covers, we're still gonna open a VPN connection. We're gonna open a, an IPsec connection, terminate it in a VPN concentrator, but the end user doesn't launch a VPN. Right, so whether we're doing an IPsec connection into a VPN concentrator for the legacy app, or an HTTP connection into an app connector for a modern app, that's plumbing, right? Users shouldn't have any idea. We're plumbers. Let us do the plumbing. We'll deliver a great end user experience. Now, part of making a great end user experience it needs to be fast. So we deliver this both as, uh, you can terminate those connections as an appliance form factor in your environment. So the ASAs that you've had running for 20 years and you love those things, that's older than my dog, right? Those things are longer, longer lasting than, than, than you know, probably any other networking product you've experienced. Or we can deliver that as a managed hosted service running in one of our points of presence that can be pretty much anywhere you wanna be it delivers a very, very low latency, very fast end user experience. And it's built on a new protocol called QUIC, which means that, that we can deliver less packets into the end user, just make that stuff download fast. Now, a unique Cisco advantage is we've integrated Thousand Eyes into this next generation client. So we want that end user experience to be great and we measure it. And if it's not great, we'll tell you why. Is it the client that's messed up? Is it the Wi-Fi at the person's home? Is it the broadband connection? Is it somewhere in the network? Or is it the application itself? So having that end-to-end -end view, this is an example of something that Cisco can do quite uniquely. Now, we also have the ability to implement what I consider common sense policy enforcement. So we do multi-factor authentication, but we do it in a way that we're not trying to annoy the end user. So when a user opens up and logs into a machine, we're gonna ask you to authenticate once. And then if nothing else changes, we're not gonna ask you to authenticate again. So you can go from SAP to Workday to Salesforce to whatever applications you're going to. Now, let's imagine I close my laptop, go down the street to a coffee shop, open it back up again. Nothing else changed on my machine. My signatures are still up to date. All the configuration is the same, except the Wi-Fi changed. We sense that. We'll ask you to re-authenticate once, right? And then you get on your way. And so the goal here is to frustrate attackers, not to frustrate end users. And so delivering a great end user experience is about latency, it's about common sense policies and the ability to measure that experience uh, and fix it if it's not right. Now for the IT organization, when you think about these policies that can span uh, campus access and remote, legacy applications that need a VPN and modern apps that fit in, into the zero trust, that could involve spanning multiple different systems. But with the Cisco Security Cloud, we have this integrated into a single console so one console, one set of policies, one set of logs, whether it's a premise-based appliance, a cloud-based service, legacy app, new app, premise-based user or remote, it's one integrated solution. This is very much the direction that we're going at Cisco is take these piece parts and stitch them together in a way that they, they solve a problem uniquely as a system, not an individual bag of parts. So, so the reason why people struggle with the VPN is, as I said in the, the beginning, when these apps were created, they were built around a model where apps would run in the data center, and then if you were behind the firewall, you were in a trusted network, and so you would have access to those, net, those applications. And this was a model that we all used in networking for like, I don't know, decades, right? And then one day at Target, remember the Target situation? There was an HVAC vendor that had VPN access. Their machines got infected, and from that you know, heating vendor, the attackers were able to get into a point of sale system. And I think that was sort of a watershed moment where we said, you know what, we need to implement a least privilege model. So for example, the sales team can get to sales apps, the IT team can get to IT cap, but you do not want salespeople getting into IT apps. And there's some apps that maybe we consider common. So this is that zero trust zone that I talked about. The way that gets implemented, there's a thing called an app connector. An app connector is a fancy name for a proxy. 
And so modern apps are going to fit right into that. It's pretty easy to move them into the zero trust zone. But if you have an app that does server initiated communication, if you're doing software distribution, if you have a multi-channel application, it's not going to move and you've got to modify the app. And this is really our unique advantage, is having the ability to blend together the VPN and the Zero Trust delivers that great end user experience for every application, whether it's premise based um, uh, or in the cloud, whether it's a legacy application or a modern application. Now, the same principle of Zero Trust also applies to servers, right? I sometimes say people forget that, that servers are people too, meaning they have identity. And so you want to put least privileged communication around how applications interact with each other. This is, again, a concept that's not radically new. We've been doing this for years together. You use Cisco networking to create VLANs. You're going to have a VLAN for you know, an environment for production that's separate from staging, that's separate from development. Um, and that's what we call macro segmentation. You put firewalls on the boundaries of those VLANs. We also have the ability to do more fine-grained controls where we can put zero trust principles between the web server, the app server, and the database. This is micro segmentation. And these are things that we've been doing for a while. What we're announcing at the show is a significant enhancement to the core firewall that helps with that segmentation, which is the 4200. So it's a new hardware appliance. Uh, it's also running a new software version, 7.4. It's twice the performance of the previous generation. It's a smaller form factor. It's got hardware acceleration, so it can handle very, very high amounts of encrypted traffic. Um, and you can cluster these things up to 16 times. So very, very, very high, you know, carrier grade performance from a cluster of, of these firewalls. Now, at some point, that application that we talked about that's running in your private cloud, someone in marketing is gonna say, you know what, let's put this out on the public cloud and we're gonna make a cool marketing analytics app, for example. And so that marketing analytics app is gonna use the services that are running out on Amazon. And those services might be things like Redshift or Lambda, or EC2, right? And so when we think about how apps are built in the private cloud, they're all built and defined around an IP address. IP address is the source of identity. But when you move to the public cloud, what's the IP address of Lambda, right? How does that work? It doesn't really have an IP address. Public cloud is defined in terms of services. So if you wanna make a least privileged, that zero trust model, if you wanna make a least privileged connection from an app on the public cloud, and allow it to connect back to your private cloud, you need the ability to have like a translation layer. You need a single policy that can identify a workload running in the public cloud in terms of the services that it uses, and that asset that you want to access on the private cloud, and only that access, that asset, right? So this app can reach my customer database and only the customer database. Think about that target example. And this, we're excited to introduce Cisco Multi-Cloud Defense. And so it has the ability to understand all of the networking constructs, what a VLAN is, what a VRF is, you know, where that asset is living in your private cloud. And in one console, we can also understand all those public cloud constructs and tie them together to create seamless, easy, app-to-app -app connectivity, private to public, public to private, public to public. Really, really strong product. And what's really exciting about this, this is available now, this month, right? So we're here at the show, we're, we're, we're demoing it. Cisco Multi-Cloud Defense. Now, more and more, these policies are all driven by APIs. And so we're making these APIs available that developers can push them into the CI CD pipeline. What we also announced at the show is a cloud native application platform called CNAP that allows us to put uh, both runtime protections in place and also move security further into the development lifecycle. Each time a developer checks in a piece of code, we're gonna scan it for vulnerabilities and make sure that it's, it's up to date. So, so being able to shift left and push this stuff further and further into the software lifecycle. At the end of the day, why do we do this? We're doing this to stop attacks like ransomware. So as we think about a ransomware attack, 80% of the attacks we saw last year with our incident response team, 80% of them started with a phishing email. A phishing email says, hey, it's something that looks real, seems real. With tools like ChatGPT, the, the uh, efficacy of these emails is remarkable. Like they are, they are indistinguishable from a real email. And so a user's gonna click on the link at some point. That link takes them to a website. It might look just like a photo sharing site or a site they know is trusted, but maybe it popped up 24 hours ago. They click on the link, download some code onto the machine. Now PowerShell runs. PowerShell spawns some new process which then makes lateral movement on the network looking for a customer database. 
The challenge we see in the industry is that, that if you're only looking at one of these domains, remember my Ironport heritage? We were an email filter. As good as we were, I don't think I could tell you with confidence, we can guarantee you're not going to get a ransomware attack because this stuff slips through. So if you're only looking at email, if you're only looking at web security, if you're only looking on the endpoint or you're only looking on the network, you're missing more than half the picture. And so I think Cisco is unique in our ability to look at all of those domains, email, web, endpoint, and network. And when you lay these things out together, like, huh, email from the prince, weird looking website, PowerShell ran, process we've never seen before, connecting to the customer database, that's a pattern. You clearly know that looks like ransomware. To be able to do this, we gather this high fidelity telemetry where we look at every email, every process, every packet. That turns into 400 billion security events that we process daily in our cloud. And we back that with more than 500 technical people that have deep understanding of the nature of the threats. And so we can use that expertise and the data to train our security models to drive better efficacy. So in summary, it is literally better, faster, cheaper. We have the ability to deliver a better security outcome by looking across multiple domains, email, web, endpoint, and the network. We do it in a way with an integrated solution. You don't need five different vendors to deploy this. It's a single integrated solution, a single management plane, single set of policies. And the economics behind it, it can save you a bunch of money. Better, faster, and cheaper. So really excited about, about all these new product announcements. Now, um, uh, I, we're really pleased today to have a special guest, my good friend Josh. Josh, please come up here from Goldman Sachs. Josh is the managing director for Network at, Go at Goldman. Josh, thanks. Hey, thanks, Tom. He and I are going to talk about zero trust in action, how this works in, in, in a real world environment. Uh, so Josh, we've known each other for, for a while. Yeah. Um, let's talk about zero trust network access. So at Goldman Sachs, you have hundreds, maybe 1,000 different applications. Like, uh, like 11,000. 11,000, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, right? You know, what, what's always interesting to me is that if you look at a bank, I've heard uh, our, our common friend George Lee talks about banks are software companies, right? And, you know, Mark Andreessen once said software is eating the world. So it's those applications that you're building that define the success of your business, right? Yeah, I mean, we, um, yeah, we do have a lot of build. Uh, you know, on the infrastructure side, we love to partner and yeah. buy. Yeah. But yes, the majority of the engineers at Goldman, um, you know, which range from 10 to 12,000, you know, dedicated developers at any yeah. time, yeah, they're servicing the businesses. Yeah. And it's a, you know, multi-franchise business that yeah. has all these different specific apps for different desks and, yeah. and business units. Yeah, yeah, 12,000, just to mention that, that's larger than many technology companies, you know. But, you know, but the bank's only 40, 41,000 people, you know, so like you said, it's software and technology there, you know, just drive the business outcomes and yeah. what people do. So right. that's why there's so many. Right, right. So, so, so zero trust is a, I think at this point, a like well-established principle. Everyone is embracing it, right? We need to put some kind of least privileged access in place. As you think about remote users at Goldman, you, you guys have invested heavily in a VDI yes. approach, yep. right? So, so it's a different alternative, which is instead of VPNing in, you get a virtual desktop that comes in. But you're also looking at other ways for people to access the network. You oh, yeah. I mean, I think the way that it changed, we built what you would say is like the castle and moat, right? Yeah. And that, you know, you kind of came in on a secure encrypted line to get to your desktop and then all the applications inside. And over the last, say, you know, five to eight years, the investment in public cloud access uh, for varying levels of, you know, infrastructure as a service platform and applications, and then letting people um, finally start to, especially developers, the developer experience on, you know, a Mac, different IDEs, um, and using VPN to access the firm, that, that has proliferated. Yeah. And so now the idea of saying, well, you know, we want exactly how you described it, that secure access, um, you know, both inbound and outbound um, yeah. using, you know, secure access, secure edge type technology. Yeah. Definitely, definitely proliferating right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you talk to, to colleagues um, that have, you know, I'll say mature VPN deployments, like, is there a world 
would that just finally goes away, or is that that day way far out in space? Oh, I no, I, I think you know the user experience drives it, and and nobody nobody wants the you know it is AnyConnect. I, I'll right. say you know we were using an AnyConnect product, but nobody wants to click on it, do that, and right. then see their email roll in on you know an MDM you know managed system. Yeah. they want to open the lid. Yeah, and then it just. All happens, yeah. you know. Teams is teamsing, and you know, Outlook's happening, and they're developing code and reaching the applications and repositories that yeah. they, they need to. Yeah, get to. open your laptop, get to work. One of the things that I was particularly keen on is we made an announcement yesterday that that we're working with Apple to embed this into iOS. So your executives, you know, people that have iPhones, people that have iPads, there's nothing to download. Like it just works. It's called I iCloud Private Relay. Will terminate into the Cisco Secure Cloud. So, so again, focusing on that, that great end user experience. And in my experience is the people that have opinions on this, oftentimes they're using iPhones, right? They're yes, using, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's common for us. Right. And, and I think firms have moved from you know, on-prem on email and you know, different messaging applications and you know, moving on to the M365s and other, other uh, you know, SaaS solutions allowed the mobile to yeah. be that much more useful, but at the same time, securing it and still providing a great user experience, still yeah. not totally done. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. So we, you know, we're on that journey and, and we're working towards it. Now, like, um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with, with Goldman Sachs and the banking industry in general, but you take your data center infrastructure very seriously. Oh, right? yeah. It's yeah. a big investment area for, for you folks. And I would argue that many of the constructs that you're building in your data center reflect thinking that we see in the hyperscalers. Yeah, yeah I would say, um, the, you know, well, at Cisco, you know, you can see the foundation of the network architecture has always been for us, you know, um, as a hyperscaler would build it. Yes. And, you know, I have a colleague who gave a, a talk today here. You could see some of it with routed optical networking. On the security side, um, one thing we kind of put a, okay, like a long bet on was the same type of technology you saw with Amazon with Nitro yeah. Yeah. and having subsystem at the server layer, we, yeah. we did the same thing. And at the time it was Pensando, it's AMD now. Yeah. But we had decided to implant uh, you know, an embed on the network element in a server, yeah. a, a network subsystem that had security, encryption, yeah. you know, different capabilities. Yeah. Yeah. What Josh is talking about for, for our listeners is uh, what, what some vendors call a DPU, another vendor calls it an IPU. Uh, pick your acronym. It's a smart NIC. Smart NIC. Yeah. It's a network interface card that is a system on a chip. It's like a little computer that runs. It's a computer the on the computer. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And the the hyperscalers needed this because it allows you to put like a little baby firewall very 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 close to the VM. And the reason they need that is that there are people that are going to be launching an instance on a hyperscaler and trying to break out of that VM to go to see what their neighbors are up to. Yeah. Right. And that's not something we want to allow. So having a, effectively an air gap with this little baby firewall creates very high isolation between tenants. But it also opens the door for a super interesting security model where security doesn't live in a box. Right. Right? It, 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 it lives it's everywhere. Distributed. Yeah, it yeah. Lives, it's yeah. distributed. So, so, so given that you've built, and I would say stay tuned on that topic because Josh and I are, are like-minded and we're, we're thinking about like, hey, how do we go change the way security or how do we change the way security works where security meets the network? I think there's a lot that can, that can be done there. But coming back to more uh, nuts and bolts issues, you know, Goldman has this big, sophisticated data center infrastructure, but you're starting to put workloads out on the public cloud. Oh, there's tons, yeah. Tons, yeah, right? By, by the tens, thousands, cores, yeah, yeah. for sure. So, so, so as that happens, wh where do you see the friction? What's the challenge that you have? Oh, yeah, some of the challenges, Tom, and I mean, you know, I think you know, you've alluded to the, the architectures on the slides as you know, having the ability, because you're in an enterprise that, well, I mean, it's 160 years old, but as far as technology goes, is as old as technology is. You've got databases that need to be accessed, say, on-prem, but you have you know, a service-based, a microservice-based architecture that's in the cloud. Yeah. Um, the policy synchronization there and, and being able to make that access and keep it low friction for a developer 
and keep those things updated and inventory or intent driven, meaning you know these assets change identities. As yeah. you said. So and that dynamically you're changing policy. That's probably yeah. one of the largest, yeah. um, you know, frictions I would say. Yeah. There is. So you're so you're experiencing this now. Where oh, it's very real. A direct yeah. connect between the public cloud and the yeah. private cloud, and you're trying to like manually synchronize your firewalls with the services that are moving around. Yeah, I'll say we do it in as automated a fashion as I, I would imagine anyone's probably doing, but yeah. um, you know, it, it's still a heavy lift to write that software to, to make that happen. And if you are trying to do it manually, I mean, you're, you're, you are then the long pole in the tent yeah. as far as changes are concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've talked to a number of customers, Josh, that have said, okay, uh, I've got all of these workloads that are running on Amazon, and that's a big attack surface. In yeah. fact, I'll even tell you, uh, uh, I know someone, it's me, that lived in a past <laughs> life, uh, had a development team that had, you know, hundreds of VPCs that were running out on Amazon. And uh, one developer launched an instance and forgot to change the default password on that instance. And so uh, attackers found that machine, logged into it, loaded code on the box, and then from that one VPC that was meant to be like a sandboxy development environment, right. they had access to everything, right? No bueno, right? That's the problem that we're trying to solve is let's create a least privilege yes. connection. And then yeah. you have to have those architectures. You alluded to it, you know, if you put a firewall at, you know, the server or you create a micro VPC model and have security groups and, you know, those are good, uh, And but you have to have policies that are micro enough to yeah. not have that this proliferation. Is, this is, okay, so this, let's double click on that. So I've met a number of customers that have been like, oh, no problem. We're taking a virtual firewall, uh, a virtual Palo or a virtual ASA, and we're putting it out at a VPC Transit Gateway at Amazon. And so, so we're good, right? And my argument is like, well, what does the policy on that firewall say? Right, is do, it macro level and course? Yeah, dude, what do you call? think that policy says? Open port 80, Yeah. right? And so you basically poke a giant hole in the firewall, all that traffic is tunneling through port 80, like, the firewalls, it's almost like theater, right? It's like yeah. you're, you're burning a bunch of cycles out there. But an IP-based firewall, whether it's Cisco's or you know, Palo or Fortinet, it's, it, it's not built, it doesn't speak the language of the public cloud, right? It's looking for an IP address. Even internally. I mean, I think you have to think more about you know, identity-based proxy. Um, you know, you have to think, you know, it, it's an old term. I don't yeah. know, you know, when you say defense in depth or, yeah. you know, layered uh, you know, protective surfaces, yeah. that's what you have to do. So everything in your entitlements are in your application. You know, you look at confidential computing. Are you uh, securing everything when it's moving, stopped in memory, yeah. wherever it is? Yeah. You, you really need to put it all together because yeah. if you don't, you know, one way or the other, network layer protection only is not, you know, going to be completely secure yeah. in any way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're, we're working with Goldman today to try to figure out if we can reduce that friction around public to private, you know, sort of communication. Um, and I think this is a problem that's pretty ubiquitous. Like, yeah. I can't imagine a scenario where you don't have it. And, and like I said, I think customers are out there saying, like, I've got this solved because I'm running a virtual firewall, you know, at the uh, uh, access point on the public cloud. But if you really look at that for a minute, you're like, you know what, that's not really doing that much, right? And so, so there's an opportunity to take a step forward implement least privilege in our data center to data center infrastructure. Let's, let's riff a little bit here yeah. on, on, on the future. So um, like show of hands in the room, anyone has actually been a firewall administrator? Anyone? Okay, a few okay. folks, right? Um, if you've ever looked in a firewall rule table, like how many firewall rules? Well, you guys are, are maybe not typical, but what do you think is a number of, a reasonable number of five tuple rules? Uh, five tuple rules? Because usually they're grouped in objects. Yeah. So, I mean, I've seen firewalls that have, you know, when you do it in five tuples, yeah. as you know, I can answer this question as much as, you know, 40 million. <laughs> but, then, but then seeing them, yeah, you yeah. know, compacted into objects right. that are, you know, okay, you've got this entire slash 24, or right. whatever, you know, whatever the, the, right. the, the, the you're going to you the hierarchy they're, they're, They look, big ones look like thousands, like yeah. 5,000, 10,000, yeah. you know, rule, or rules, objects, or yeah. objects, yeah. Or, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. In, in there, yeah. I talk, to, I talk to customers that have hundreds of thousands, and, 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 the, and the challenge is, these rules are very cryptic. 
Like if you look in the rule table, it's it's IP port and protocol. It's it's almost like assembly code, right? It's just like really, really. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. And so 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 it, it gets really hard to manage. Um, and and I met uh, one firewall security person said, you know what? If there's so many rules in there that one person can't write them, then they're not really doing that much. And so the dynamic that I've seen is somebody wrote those rules, then they retired, and no one is going to take the rules out. Right? Well, it's hard to delete them it's Once, <laughs> without when, and feel good about it. Then you're looking at tooling to say when's the last time it was used, right. what is it, and, right. and with you know dynamic IP addresses, that rule could be getting hit. You right. know this IP on this port 80 or 443, but something else owns the IP address that, right. than the original intent. So, right. Yeah. So I have a dream. Uh, uh, my dream is 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 a little more uh, uh, not as lofty as others, but I have a dream that there could be a firewall that programs itself and that upgrades itself. And this is something you and I talked about. Yep. So, so maybe you could just share a little bit about your philosophy of how you guys upgrade network infrastructure, yep. and then we can talk about could we apply that to firewalling. Yeah. Oh, for upgrades on uh, code upgrades? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we, we had an engineer. He spoke here last year and uh, kind of put it out there. But the way we uh, took the approach was we wanted to be able to always upgrade um, firmware. Yeah. And I know if you know whoever's administering switching and routing and any firewalls, any appliances here in this room, that sounds like yeah, that's nice. But we don't do that. We get a code. It's you know we hope it's bulletproof. We never right. change it again. Right. So our philosophy is it's not the way to run. We have to be able to do security vulnerabilities and feature set and move forward. So the we we ended up coming up with an algorithm that would essentially just say okay, you can upgrade this. If this is successful, you can upgrade this, and but you can't do this upstream piece, but you can do this upstream piece, and so on and so forth. So you're doing a dependency map to the point where we have a, a couple tens of thousands of switches at the at the firm. As an example, you can easily do say 600, you know, sitting there for yeah. a few hours yeah. on a Saturday. You yeah. can do a few thousand, yeah. no problem, and you yeah. can like pull a big, you know. But it's it's a dynamic. It's kind of like painting the Golden Gate. Oh, bridge. it is exactly. You're constantly yes. upgrading, absolutely, because you're upgrading a little bit of the infrastructure while the other is like in a stable yeah. state. Absolutely. Verify that it's good. Move forward. Move forward. And there's a lot of magic in the. Pre-verification, post-verification, feeling good about that, going on to the next. I mean, we're yeah. skipping over all those parts. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah. how. That's the method. Though. Now you do it at the kind of component level, meaning like yes. I'm going to take this group of switches and I'm going to upgrade them. Oh, yeah. and, and then yep. move forward. Imagine if we did this at the data path level. So imagine we built systems that that were designed to be managed like the cloud operating model, where they're constantly testing themselves and qualifying themselves, yep. so that you don't have to upgrade a firewall anymore. I don't think this is science fiction. Right? No, no. You know I, I like science fiction. Right? I like but, the idea. Yeah, yeah, right? And so, so you know, Josh and I have been kicking these ideas around for a while of like, how can we make a firewall that understands its topology, knows where it is, understands the workload, knows all the services on Amazon, knows what's happening in the private cloud, and you don't have to write five tuple rules. You don't have to think about an IP address, right? The, the, the policies can program itself, and it can qualify and test itself. This is within reach. And, and I guess is one of the reasons I came to Cisco, and it's exciting, is that, that the company that can do this is Cisco. It's nice when we have customers like Goldman that are telling us what to do and what not to do. Um, uh, but I think it's an exciting time, and we're just getting going, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, there's one more topic I want to just uh, explore with you. We ran a demo at the show where we took large, lar large, blah, blah, large language models, so the new kind of wave in AI, and we're using it to help with that firewall administration. Did you see the demo at all? I didn't see this. Uh, sounds so like magic. It sounds like magic. And, 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 and I, I always said, if you find yourself talking to your firewall, you should ask yourself, like, what's happening? <laughs> right? But, but, but you can actually talk to a firewall, and it can talk back to you now right? with these large language models. So, so there's so much hype around AI. Like, every single vendor in the world is, is talking about it, which is you know, it's, it's easy to sort of dismiss it. The reason there's so much hype is because it's really freaking cool. right? Computers can actually talk to you and reason and talk back. And so, so, so the demo shows we, it's not, you're not actually talking using a prompt, right? You're typing it in. You could easily put a voice translation layer on there, but you could ask natural language questions. Uh, you know, we just acquired Vaultix um, uh, at Cisco, and we want to bring the Vaultix people in, and we want to make sure they have access to JIRA. You can put that into the firewall, and it's going to say, OK, I've got the policies for Vishal. He's sitting over here as the CEO of Vaultix which is the, the, the heart of our multi-cloud defense. 
Um, uh, and so building a policy to do an acquisition, building a policy to do a reachability test, doing a policy that can respond to these you know, changing infrastructure can be done using human language and the, and the firewall will, will talk back. Um, uh, we got real people actually working on this and, and I think it's really, really, really exciting. And that's just the beginning. Like, so as you start to think about how humans interact with systems, like to be able to do that with natural language, I, I think is not to be discounted. Oh, I thought, you know, on the security, you know, operations center side, being able to ask human questions about these incredibly complex distributed systems. And, right. you know, you had mentioned like the uh, friendly prints and the, the, yeah. the ransomware, kind of the, the chain of events. Yeah. See, having it answer questions and shut them down, you know, shut down those pathways. Yes. I mean, it makes a lot of sense that a, a very specific LLM yes. can do that without yes. being, you know, the LLMs that are in the big four. Yeah. That, you know, places. So, so, so every security vendor will talk about this and, and, and you know, I think uh, uh, Trump at this is like, look, data is what makes a difference, right? When we think about AI, it's like, what data do you feed these models and then what human knowledge do you use to train the models? So you really have to have good data. We're very proud and it's kind of obvious where Cisco shines, like we, we have NetFlow data that other people can't even imagine, right? We invented NetFlow. We put parameters in there that, that are unique to us. There's another data source that's less obvious, incident response. So we've been doing incident response for, for decades and we write up a case study of here's what happened. Imagine if we take that incident response data, plug it into an LLM, yeah. and now the LLM is gonna say, hey, wait a minute, I saw an email that might be from the, from the prints, I saw a weird looking website, I saw a PowerShell running on Josh's machine, let's turn on packet capture. And, and, and I don't think the computer is gonna be doing that on its own, but the computer is gonna be feeding that to a SOC assistant, and I think creating an order of magnitude increase in efficiency. That's the goal here, yeah. right? Yeah. And efficacy. And efficacy. Yeah, absolutely. Because so much of a, what a SOC operator does on a day-to-day -day basis is false, false alarm. Sure. Right? I saw this weird, weird, weird thing. Well, weird things happen all over the place, right? And so those generates a lot of noise in the environment. Um, Josh, thank you for flying all the way out here, yeah. uh, spending time with us. He came because he likes Vegas, right? No. Truth be told. I'm not. Not so much because he likes, he likes Cisco. Um, uh, I've known Josh for a long time. It's a pleasure working with your whole team. You guys really you look forward and, and, and make, you're not afraid to make big investments and big bets. Um, uh, we probably have time for one or two questions from the audience. If anybody's got anything you want to ask Josh, you want to ask me, it could be anything. What happens if Vegas stays in Vegas, right? So, so it I know I can. being broadcast? Oh, it is being broadcast, <laughs> shoot. All right, never mind. So, so yeah, um, we, can take, we can take questions. Shy room. One other question for you. Yes. I'll repeat the question. Yeah. 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 Creating policy, but can you talk a little bit about the threat protection aspect of that? Okay, it's a good one. So, so, so remember the Cisco Secure Access, that unified client thing I talked about, the VPN, the, the zero trust thing that, that is a VPN, but it disappears and kills the VPN? It was, a, I don't know, a few years back, one of our best engineers had this idea that said, you know what? Every time a machine, an endpoint, makes a connection, let's identify which process initiates that connection. And, and we're gonna append that to the flow data. And then in fact, let's identify where that process came from. So this is a capability we call NVM, Network Visibility Module. It's been in AnyConnect for a while. But our security team, when they look at this, they're like, this is magic. Because it's kind of like caller ID for the network, right? So it's not enough to know this is Tom's machine, his signatures are up to date, and he's making a, a, a connection to JIRA, right? And he wants to access something in our, in our source code. Which process on Tom's machine wants to access JIRA, right? If it's a process that's spun out of PowerShell that we've never seen before, that's not good, yeah. right? And so, so having that visibility is, is, I think, really, really unique. I'm not talking about EDR. This is not a CrowdStrike replacement. This is your where security meets the network. It's where your, your endpoint interacts with the network, being able to capture that telemetry. That's an example of unique security telemetry that we feed into the analytics engine that drives security efficacy. Do you guys ever, yeah, is that on your radar at all? That yeah, I, I mean, that's why I said like having the heuristics yeah. and kind of a heuristics map, that's yeah. what I hope for, you know? Yeah. And so when you think of like a, an XDR solution yeah. that needs to look at, like you said, NetFlow data, something that's encrypted yeah. that you don't get a lot out of, but yeah. 
if you can combine it with something on the node yes. as well and yes. see process. Yes. Yes. I think is really powerful. Yes. And this is something that Josh and I have also been ba banging around a little bit, is that that little footprint on the laptop, that evolved any kind of, we call it our secure client, that does the performance management, it does the, the tunneling, it does the security telemetry. Um, uh, I think the world needs a moral equivalent of that on a server. And that we need a presence on a server, because that same paradigm of, if I'm looking at an east-west flow, yeah. And this fits your security model where you're putting security everywhere. So I'm looking from a web server talking to an app server, an app server talking to a database. The query coming into the database, not just what machine made that query, which process in that machine is making that query, right? And if right. we can see what process is making the query, it tells you an awful lot. Yeah, it just gives you a, a this is normal and this is abnormal. And, exactly. And, you know, you, you just have a lot more chance of an efficacy in how you feel your posture is for something that is happening that's not supposed to be, right. even if it's coming from the right, say, identity right. or the right IP address. Right, whatever. right. So I think in the extreme case, we are talking about identity-based security, but that identity needs to be granular enough to be at the process level. Yeah. Not just the user level, not just, oh, I've authenticated, right? Well, 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 a lot of the things that are happening are app to app, too. Yes. So you know, yes. that's why it's more important than ever to, exactly. to have this. Yeah. To peer into the app and look at the, at the components that, that make it up. Yeah. Um, OK, I think we've got to uh, wrap up here. So for those on the broadcast, you're going to see a live demo of the Cisco Secure Access. For those that are in the room, you'll have to go down to the show floor to see our multi-cloud defense uh, and secure access. But both these products are available. Uh, we're, we're demoing them in the, uh, the sh the, uh, our booth down on the show floor. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Josh, for Yo, taking the time for to be me. here. Uh, Happy to do good it. Good fun. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, thanks man. And welcome back to the Cisco TV. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Cisco TV studio. I am Steve Moulter. I want to thank you all so much for joining us here on the live stream, tuning in from all over the world. We just wrapped our innovation talk on security experiences simplified with Tom Gillis and Josh Mathias. So Josh and Tom, they covered the latest Cisco security innovations that are available right now to help you become more resilient in the face of unpredictable threats. They talked about the way that Cisco is simplifying experiences to make security better for users, easier for IT, more optimized for your DevOps, and really generally safer for every single one of us. Security really is such a top topic all across Cisco and throughout Cisco Live here in Las Vegas this week. In fact, I believe we are heading out to Davis Wallman, is that right? for a demo over in the SSE secure access area. I'm looking up at my monitors there, but Davis, do you have your ears on out there? Oh, I hear you, Steve. Okay, Locked great. Clear. Yeah, uh, you kind of, kind of got ahead of me there with the demo. I was going to have that surprise for you, but Aha. that's okay, we'll talk about it. Before <laughs> we get into that, though, we're out here at the Cisco Brew Pub, as you can see. It's a great space for collaboration. Uh, they don't start serving beer until three, which I just found out, so that was a bit unfortunate. But I can survive. The great part about it, though, is we've got the, the Genius Bar just back, back behind me there. You can schedule time with experts, go deep dive on all things security, which is what we're talking about right now. And on that note, I want to take you just over here for said demo, as we talked about, with a man named Dave Gormley, who heads up the Cisco Secure Access uh, platform here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Cisco Secure Access. Dave, thanks Sounds for being good. here. Uh, give me an overview. What are we talking about here? So the big deal here, Davis, is that typically in security, when you add functionality, right, to block more things, it gets more complicated for right. the user and for the IT team to set up. And what we've done here is kind of broken that mold, and we've said we're going to give you advanced security, improved protection against all sorts of cyber threats, but at the same time, we're going to make it easier for the end user and the IT team to set up and manage. I love easy. Easy sounds good to me. Okay, so take me in. Show me what we're doing here. Give me a little demo. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about why we're doing this and, and a little bit of the before and after. So the before is, and, and Tom talked about this in his session just a few minutes ago, 
end users don't want to make difficult decisions about which uh, application they're going to and how they're going to get there. So you see all these little time things. These are steps and, and steps in the process and they all take time and the end user needs to figure out what to do just to go out to the internet, to go to specific SaaS apps that are on the internet. There are private apps and other resources inside. They don't want that hassle. So we did a whole right. bunch of research with these end users and we were talking about removing a few of these steps. And then one of the ladies said, you know what would be really great? I don't want any of it. I want my you know, identity protected and I want to be secure for my company, but I don't want to make the decisions. I want it to just work. I don't want any of the steps. And so that's what we did. So what you're going to see in this product is, wow. we said you <laughs> show up, you log on to your laptop, we take care of all of that that used to be tangled up and you just get to any of the applications and resources you need with better security. It's fantastic. It's simplicity literally manifest right here in front of us. So talk to me a little bit more about in the hands of the customer, what are the capabilities, what can they do once they get their hands on this? Okay, well let's start with that user experience that we just uh, mentioned. So let me hop in here and I'll show you exactly how simple it can be. So we're gonna start here. This is an end user, they go into their laptop and they need to, this is an engineering person, they go in and they type in a, a certain application they need to get to and boom, they're in the application, it's working. So all they did was log on to their laptop and they're in. Now this is protected by ZTNA, which is a brand new, um, well, it's an integrated technology that we've created that allows you to get to your private apps, but it's by individual user and it's just to one app, it's least privileged, super secure. But the user didn't have to do anything, they just hopped in. There's none of that back end hassle, it seems like, you know, or I guess front end hassle is, would be more accurate to say, right? Well, let's talk about front end. This is the front end for the end user. Sure. And then yes. we're going to talk a little back end because okay. we're helping there as well, right, with the IT team. So on this front end, that's ZTNA, and you got in very easily. But I'm going to continue now. They're going to go to a Jira app. So this is another application where he can go check on his tasks and things. He just puts in the URL, clicks enter, and boom, he's in that application. Now, I know that looked very similar to the first one, but this has to be connected to in a different way. So this is VPN as a service, but again, the user didn't have to decide or know where to go to get to what. They just put in the URL and went. And that's the name of the game here, isn't it? It's simplicity, as we talked about, end-to-end -end security, and you've done that here for the customer. For a remote user, it's productivity, right? They don't want to be doing all these steps just to go do their job. Oh, of course. So we're pulling that away from them. So that's great when it's all set up, right? And I just showed you the best case scenario. But what about when there's a, an application or a resource that they don't have access to right. yet, and we need to set it up? So here's what, he's going in, he finds out he needs to go into a database to get some sample data to do some testing. He goes in, tries to get to the database. Hey, can I connect to the server? No, please enter your you know, information, it doesn't work. He doesn't have access to this resource and he needs it to do his job. Absolutely. So what does he do? He can go right, he can send a message to the IT team and say, I need access to that database. And now you think, oh, this is gonna kick off this big long process, <laughs> right? It's super simple. Open up simple. a ticket, come on, yep. It's, yeah, and it might take a week, right? right? And it slows him down. Wrong answer, right? He gets, he sends out the, the message to IT, they get it, and now we're gonna go in and now this is IT, this is the dashboard that they actually use in the product, right? Yes. So we made it easier for users. Here's how easy it is for the administrator. We're in one place for policies. That's the section we've gone into. And you can see that there's internet access policies and private access policies. And this is an engineer, he's in this group here, and he needs to go to this destination that has several applications that they need to work with. But the one he just wanted is missing. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're checking what that destination is, we're kind of showing you where it is, but he's gonna go into resources and then he's gonna go into a resource group and all he has to do is click on that. We'll be in here in a second where he clicks on that Postgres database, which is the one that we were just in. And he goes into resources, private resources, and then resource groups. He clicks on the secure access data center, the one that we were just looking at on the right there. And it allows him to go grab that database, click on it and move it over. And then he hits save. And you'll see a message right up top. Hey, we've updated that. Brilliant. There's now, that simplicity again, in action. <laughs> there's the simplicity, and now we're gonna jump back to the user and say, all right, if that happened within two minutes, now what does the user have to do? In other solutions and in the old method, you would have to 
close this, start it back up, change your client. You don't have to anymore, right? Now, all he has to do, he already has this open. You're gonna see him click on the database again, and it just comes up. So he doesn't have to go reset, nothing. It's fantastic, and I know we could talk about this for ages. Where can people learn a little bit more about this? Is there somewhere on Cisco.com we can push them to? Sure, so just go to Cisco.com and go to Cisco Secure Access. You'll see there's videos, infographics. You can dig right in, get more information. Amazing. Dave, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Steve, back to you. Great demo. Thank you so much, Davis, and thank you so much to David as well. You know, the security posture here at Cisco, it is such a core aspect of everything that we do throughout the organization. Cisco is the very first company to connect the world. Now we are the best choice to protect the world. We always say if it is connected, it is protected. Well, a big part of that story is Cisco Secure Firewall, which helps you to plan, prioritize, close those gaps, and recover from disaster even stronger. You can turn intent into action, and you can unify policy across your entire environment. Annie Murphy is here in studio with me right now. Annie, who do you have with you on set? Hey, Steve, I am joined here in Studio B, just right next to Steve, it's kind of weird, he's like behind <laughs> us, now you're in front of me. Oh. Uh, we're here live with Rick Miles, he's a VP of Product Management at, uh, in our security business group within Cisco. Welcome, Rick. Thank you, thank you, happy why to be here. Yeah, why don't you give me a chance to, to talk to you a little bit more about how the security landscape is changing some of the things that are keeping CSOs up at night? Yeah, absolutely. And so as you mentioned, the security landscape's changing. The network's constantly evolving, right? So uh, as organizations are undergoing their application transformation journeys, as they're starting to push workloads out into these public cloud fabrics, one thing that's very true in all these situations is there's still that requirement for, for on-premise security. There's still that requirement for that application to reach back, touch an endpoint on-premise. You know, 82% of IT leaders, they're actually adopting a hybrid approach here. Mm -hmm. And uh, what makes that even more complicated is they're going through that transformation, they're on that hybrid approach, is yep. they're not just pushing out to one cloud fabric, they're pushing out to two, three, four. I was just talking to a customer today that it's leveraging five different cloud fabrics. And as you think about how you, how you do this in a way where you can maintain least privileged access from on-premise to these disparate cloud environments, how you can have consistent policies. It's incredibly challenging. Uh, to your question, what keeps a CISO up at night? I actually asked that question to a CISO last week. Right. And he talked about that journey. Like started with you know, one vendor and their native services that they offered. You know, quickly realized that they're in a multi-cloud situation. Also looking at those native services and trying to figure out, how do I scale these? It's different identities, different tags, different policies, different security stacks. You know, in order to keep pace with my business and maintain a good security posture, that's that's an incredibly challenging thing. It, it's a vulnerable environment. It would keep me up at night as well. And I remember, like, maybe even 20 years ago, they would say, oh, the firewall is dead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah right? And yeah. then, but, you know, talk to me more about what the firewall is in terms of its role and how it's evolving. I know that we're announcing the 4200 this yeah. week. So what can customers come to expect with the 4200 as well as the 7.4 launch? Yeah, absolutely. And it's network security, the, four, the firewall. None of these things are dead, right? The key, key aspect of that challenge is it's a hybrid world. So you still have that requirement that for scale, resilience, inspection, decryption, all of these things still exist there, which we're really excited, you know, be able to continue to innovate and invest with our new 4200 series in 7.4 release, which, you know, twice the throughput, uh, accelerated, uh, accelerated inline crypto capabilities on the box, being able to scale out to 16 nodes, so being able to cover organizations uh, as we've been saying, from ground to cloud with these innovations on, uh, on the firewall. Uh, and adding on top of that, bringing other advanced capabilities with 7.4. So uh, simplified branch management, being able to intelligently route application traffic, uh, being able to, in a world where 95% of traffic is encrypted, Yes, you need to scale on-prem with the boxes, the 16 nodes, all that throughput. There's also situations where you can't decrypt that traffic. So we're also launching enhancements with our encrypted visibility engine 
that actually allows organizations to identify, detect threats, even when that traffic is still encrypted. I remember when we wanted that so badly, just even as recent as like five years ago, and people are saying, oh, like, perimeter security isn't dead. In fact, the perimeter is just everywhere. So speaking of which, we talked about the firewall, but you talked about that customer that you talked about that has like not just three, but also oh, yeah. like up to five different clouds that they're going out to. I know this is a really exciting announcement that we're also doing this week, is so we're just got a lot of announcements all over the place, by the way, folks, when we're talking about Cisco security, um, is talk to me about the multi-cloud defense launch. Yes, absolutely. So you, you talk, you, you picture those challenges of trying to have consistent policy, trying to make sure you've got that least privileged access. Well, with multi-cloud defense, which is available now, launched here, uh, you can actually have that, that singular controller, that consolidated controller, uh, that can have a set policy that goes across each of these cloud environments. So you're not having to just leverage native, native services and trying to maintain policies and access in you know, separate systems across each of these. You can do those in one place, which is quite a powerful thing. And then as you bridge that with our on-premise cap capabilities, with uh, the network side too, we can start to have one place where we set access in a hybrid situation for application to application, workload security, whether it's on-prem or in multiple cloud fabrics. Well, I know what people are going to say when they hear us talking about this is like, oh, you talked about multi-cloud defense, you're talking about your cloud policy, we talked about a new network firewall, we talked about 7.4, and having kind of a standard security policy across that entire experience, no matter where you're going to make it being seamless, but can you, and I'm going to kind of tease you up for a Cisco Defense Orchestrator, is this like, how do I make it so that I'm not like swivel chairing all over the place? Oh, absolutely, and that's the goal, is being able to pull these all together. So multi-cloud defense is actually integrated right into the, the Defense Orchestrator, the CDO product as well, so that's all pulled in. So you've got that one place where, yes, access like we've talked, least privilege from, from on-premise to cloud and across clouds, but also your consistent security policies. Yeah. Uh, the other big benefit that multi-cloud defense brings in and tied in with that is it's ingress and egress as well baked into that. So your inspection capabilities, uh, WAF, DLP, all of these baked into that in a consistent singular place. Yeah, I really like that too because it's policy oriented instead yes. of device oriented or access oriented. We're just giving it kind of the simplified experience. It's also one of the big themes here besides security when we talk about Cisco Live this week. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rick, for joining us. We're going to go head back to Studio A. I'm going to give it back to Steve. Let's go. Thank you so much, Andy. Great interview. Rick Miles, fantastic job. Truly appreciated. Thank you for coming by the studio today. We're going to turn our attention a little bit right now. We're going to look at Cisco DevNet, which is our developer program that is helping developers and IT professionals who want to write applications and develop integrations with Cisco products and platforms and APIs. DevNet includes our Cisco products in software-defined networking, in cloud, in data center, Internet of Things, collaboration, security, and Cisco customer experience. We're going to hear a little bit more about DevNet right now from Rob Boyd. Hey guys, you got your boy here, Rob Boyd. We are here to do some learning at Cisco Live. This is the DevNet Zone. Before we check it out, don't forget to smash that like button, turn on notifications, otherwise this homeboy don't get paid to do all this stuff for you, but I know you will. Let's check it out. You know, there's a lot of instructors here, so one of the first things I like to do is figure out what class do I want to take? All kinds of options here, but you kind of get a feel for the group. You just got to sit down, slap on the headphones so you're not disturbing anybody else, and pay attention. Hands on keyboard, man, it's the only way to learn. So Dev Dash is where you get a chance to race some really cool remote control cars, except they're not going to go that fast because you got to answer questions between each one. But I kind of dig it, as long as I got someone over my shoulder feeding me the right answers once in a while. <laughs> Figuring out your workflows and how you're going to work with a team, not something I'm really into. I'm more of a solopreneur, if you know what I mean. But I get it. A lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds, you've got to figure out how to work it together. This team seems to have it all figured out. All right, so there's a putting green in the sandbox area, which makes absolutely no sense to me, but all right, we'll play along. It's a golf theme, and you know what? It's timed. 
So you got to move a little quickly. I'm not really sure they know how to play golf here in Vegas, but I'm game. I gave it my best shot, and I'm sure they picked up a few things from me in the experience. But the good news is you can still win a prize and support a charity, so it's worth your time even if you're not a golfer. So here's the thing. A lot of people think you got to be a developer to gain any kind of advantage of going in the DevNet zone. Absolutely not. These guys can take you from soup to nuts and everything in between. I guarantee you can have fun, learn a few things, and it will apply to everything else you're doing. So don't make a mistake and miss the DevNet zone. Well, it's official. Rob Boyd has lost his mind, everybody. We knew if we kept him here on the Cisco Live show floor long enough, he would, uh, he would trip himself over the edge. And boy, well done. Bravo, Rob, on that. Um, that was fun. So much of Cisco Live and what makes it amazing is the different activations, the experiences that you can have while you are here with us in person. You just saw Rob having a great time over in DevNet, in DevNet Zone. If you can get yourself here to the show, man, the amount of games and fun and playtime. Yeah, it's about education and experience, but let's be honest, it's about being together in the room, taking advantage of all of the joy that is Cisco Live here in Las Vegas. One of those great opportunities is capture the flag. This is, again, such a fun thing to do here on the show floor. Get a team together, you can gain hands-on experience as you solve real lab challenges using a wide variety of Cisco solutions. And what do you do? You collect points as you go. You can play the game, you can earn a spot on the leaderboard. Rob, tell us more about what you're doing over there in Capture the Flag. <laughs> Steve, I just keep thinking you have too many good words. I'm like, okay, what else can we say that's fresh? <laughs> we need something different from what Steve said. But well, what can you, you play you Capture the Flag no, around? What are the different Capture the Flag games you can play? Let's go with that. I understand how it works, Steve, it's good. So, <laughs> yeah. Capture the flag, we're over here right next to the DevNet area if you get a chance to make it over. Uh, what name are we going with for you? I'm going to go with Caleb. Caleb, yeah, your actual thank name. You. you can call me Rob if yep. you we'll work that out. But in the Capture the Flag area, I've actually met with these guys several times at different Cisco Live. It keeps getting bigger, and there are a couple of new things that we're going to talk about. But I wonder if you could kind of explain, one, what's this Game of Thrones thing behind me? <laughs> Perhaps set us up what is happening here in Capture the Flag, and then let's go take a look at some stuff when you do. Yeah, absolutely. So Capture the Flag is really a way that players can come and learn about Cisco technologies in a different way than just sitting and getting presented to the whole time. Amen. So this, this Game of Thrones map, as you call it here, it really just highlights all the different activities and tracks that we have inside of the Capture the Flag event. So we'll talk a little bit more about them as I show you some of the new things. But as you can see here, there's a variety and pretty much every technology Cisco has you can learn about here and play in Capture the Flag. Well, what this tells me is it says you're comprehensive. It looks like Ab you've covered quite absolute a bit. Absolutely, end to end, yes. Well, I'm curious if we, you could explain what's new this year, what's different, and can we get yeah, yeah, on that? Yeah, yeah, let's go on in All and right. take a look. We'll follow you, Pat, I'll yeah. let you lead since you got the camera on your shoulder there. But okay, so tell me, uh, as we work our way around here, you have to mm -hmm. keep talking when we oh, yeah. walk, by the way. Okay. So, okay, so these guys, what's happening here? So right here, this is our, our mini theater that we just added this year. This is where players can come, take a break, and get a little bit of a, of a view of what mission they're going to play, maybe a mini tutorial, but just the way for them to be able to sit back and enjoy the Capture the Flag experience rather than just having to sit at a PC. But so to be fair though, you're presenting to them, which uh, we just uh, I know, yes, ago. that's okay, true, but, but it is I know it mini presentations, stay. mini presentations. Right? Setup. Yes. What's happening over here on the yeah. right with all the third? And then over here, we've got some of our new activities. So we've got the virtual reality tour. Right. So if you're a fan of uh, procedural cop shows, you can step into a procedural cop show and actually hunt down hackers and hack them. Is the story stay the same every time? It is, is it, it is. Okay. It, think of it as, uh, well, it absolutely is the same story every time, but it's just a fun way for players to get in and do some security hacking. Yeah. And then over here, we have the uh, well, new... He's looking at the lock picking now, but behind, oh, Pat, Pat, swing around behind you and just show, Pat, can you hear me? I don't know if he's... I don't believe he can I hear I think you. he can. He, but, he's looking at the lock picking. Yeah, here. he's, he's looking behind. at the lock picking. All right. So this is one of our most popular things here at the CTF yeah. event. People can just detach their brain, do a little lock picking. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. I was waiting. Jason, you got to move out of the way. We're on live TV. <laughs> <laughs> We're having so much fun. Yeah, I know. Okay. Is this where you want me to hand off to Anon? No, not no, quite yet. So, right. so the other thing I want to cover real quick is we have all of the different technologies that Cisco makes. So we've got Meraki, collaboration, data center, security, enterprise networking. Anything you want to learn about, you can do here in the Capture the Flag uh, event arena. And now I'll pass it over to Anand. And what am I supposed to ask him? So <laughs> you want <laughs> to... 
So, so Anand, can you part tell of us a little bit more about how the players actually compete against oh, each yeah, other? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. So, Anand, you heard the question there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Travis, Caleb. no, Caleb. Yeah. Caleb. Perfect. Hi, Rob, we are Hello. back Good again. to see you again, Same absolutely. Here. So, this is getting bigger and bigger, and every time I've come by here, uh -huh. it's packed. It is. I thought it this is. was like a certification area. I didn't realize they're playing games to learn. Very soon you may even see that, probably next year. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. See. Okay. So, let me explain you the competitive uh, part of it. So since it's gamified, so obviously there will be competitive nature and probably if uh, you can focus here on the leaderboard. Okay, we'll so swing over here, Pat. We'll take a look at this leaderboard. Everybody, because oh. actually at four o'clock today, you're gonna announce winners. Exactly. What are they winning, by the way? What's so, the so we have these challenge coins. So we'll have senior executives from Cisco who will be awarding these uh, challenge coins to our winners. He gets and... close on that, doesn't he? Oh yeah. yes, indeed. <laughs> Good visuals. So that you award the challenge coins, that becomes a, like a show-off thing. Someone goes, look what I got that you don't have. Exactly. Like These are collectibles in the industry. And uh, then we'll be posting the things on social media, especially LinkedIn, which will be great for their careers, especially if it comes from Cisco handles. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. I always feel like I love the gamification because uh -huh. there's a whole lot of work that goes into keeping this simple, fun, and driving forward. So I appreciate what you guys continue to do as well as build upon. But what happens if you can't make it to Cisco Live? Is there anything for anybody that is working remotely, perhaps? So we have everything for everyone. Even if you aren't here, although you missed the live action, but then uh, if you would like to have some of these private events for your uh, yourself, especially oh, as customers and okay. partners, reach out to your Cisco account team, especially your account SEs, and they'll be able to set up some private CTF events just for you. Wow, okay. But I love the whole hacking focus, that the CTF, Capture the flag, that's exactly, exactly. Uh, where that's come from. Well, that's awesome. Anything else we need to remember here? Um, I think just, just come over next year. If yeah. you aren't here, please do come over. I'm sure you will have most fun. Yeah, okay, perfect. Right, Pat, I want to come over here. I'm going to check in with the lock pickers for one yeah. second. So follow me. They're very focused. I thought maybe they would scatter when we got the camera up here. Please do not be alarmed. I don't know if you guys are aware, they're taking pictures of everybody and cataloging this just to know who has been working on these level of skills. Is that something you guys are all comfortable with? Yeah, he's like, whatever, we're not listening to you. Love it. Davis, I think you have got something going on. Where are you? Actually, I'm, you're not too far from I, me, I believe. Rob, I'm actually right next door. I've been watching your entire broadcast, doing a phenomenal job. Love the challenge coin, by the way. Fantastic yes. stuff. We're right next door in the walk-in labs. And Take uh, it. I, thanks, Rob, I appreciate it. Um, this is about learning over here in a, in a more pure learning aspect. These are the walk-in labs, as I said, and this is where you can literally walk in, learn about Cisco stuff. And so I'm here with Thomas Renzi. He's a session uh, proctor, basically. Yeah, session group manager. Session group manager here. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about how cool, not just of what you can learn about, but how cool it is in the sign-up process as well. So yeah. tell me a little bit about this place and yeah. how we can... Use yeah, so this area is called the Walk-In Labs. We're located in the world of solutions um, over near where you went to registration and pick up your materials. What we primarily do is there are a number of labs. We have over 90 labs available in all kinds of different technologies. We have data center, security, certification, just about anything you may want to learn about. So when you come here, you can take a look at this QR code board here, right? Scan the, the different categories for whichever technology you're interested in learning. As I mentioned, there's over 90 labs available for us. And once you scan and find out those labs, you can come over here and one, somebody will check you in. You can see the board here for all the seats that are available for us. There's over 100 seats available and we have eight bring your own device um, stations as well that you can use. It's very cool too, Thomas, by the way, because right right now it's it's still pretty full in here, but the, the line's not too big, luckily. So yeah. if, just a quick plug, yeah. if you're around, Come down and check it out, it's pretty cool. But yeah. once you can see what's available there, yes. then what happens? Then, then they check you in and then they bring you over here. And, and then one of these fine gentlemen will show you to an open workstation. So why don't we take a look or, or walk, or just to walk around Let's take so a you look. can see. Yeah. So you can see here are... How many monitors we got here? So two monitors per station, but as I've mentioned, 100 stations available, as well as eight bring your own device stations. So once you sit down at an open and available station, you select the lab that you want, it notifies the proctor for that lab session, and they come over and they help you get started with the lab and answer any questions that you may have on it. Okay, so now why is this so important to have this on site here at Cisco Live and to, to show, hey, like 
we care about this? Yeah, a couple of reasons. One, it, get, it, it allows attendees to get hands-on experience with Cisco technologies at their own pace. The labs are designed to be done in about 45 minutes to an hour, but obviously there's no timer and we don't kick you out if uh, you don't finish a lab in time, within that time. So I think it's important because it gives them the exposure and the opportunity to get hands-on experience with a lot of technologies that maybe they haven't they haven't had the chance to. Yeah, kind of wet your whistle a little bit, dip your feet. More or less, yes. in the water. Yes. I like that. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm really thankful about the 45-minute rule not being a hard rule because I'd probably be in here for... <laughs> Maybe you'd, a little longer than that. You'd be surprised how many people stay here for multiple hours, and you're wondering, uh, are they still doing the lab? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but you accept that. That's great, right? Yes. I mean, if you want to come and you want to stay, yes. the more the merrier. Yes. Oh, work. yeah, absolutely. If you want to come and take a number of different labs, we've known a number of attendees that have actually done that, come back, and they love this area, and they come back and they do multiple sessions. So, yeah, absolutely. It's not just doing one session, you can come here and do as many sessions as you want. Okay, so how long have we been doing the walk-in lab type scenario that we have set up here? How, we, how well, well, we've been doing walk-in labs in the U.S. I think even probably, I've been involved with it since 2015, and we've been doing it even, even um, before then. Wow, and, yeah. and I got a peek at the statistics. I don't know if we saw that when we came in, but what did we something like 1400 sessions already yeah i, I we've we've actually hit 1700 me, labs please. taken yes. since we've started the event uh monday morning yes That's 1700 we still have at least half a day left to go tomorrow we right do. yes yes my gosh okay so is there a goal you want to hit would you be super stoked there, on there is uh, our goal uh, well our goal originally we had 1800 labs taken last year so we sh set a, a conservative goal of 1900 I'm pretty sure we're going to break 2,000 labs taken. I mean, I, 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 we are in Vegas, so I'm going to talk a little bit of odds making here. I bet you go over two grand. What do you say? Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think I take, I, th I think I take a piece of that action. Yeah, thank you. I, I, you know, I consider myself an odds maker on the side, actually, so it makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. Okay, so what, in terms of what else we have going on here, I've yeah. also got your proctors and yeah. your overseeing everything. Yeah. So, how, how do they so do these are the folks that actually created the labs. So they kind of sit here, monitor the labs. Um, when someone sits for their lab, uh, these are the um, experts that get notified, and they let them know which workstation and which lab they're taking. So they sit here, they're usually monitoring it, and then there's also proctors that are sitting over by the back wall as well. Fantastic. And are these all Cisco employees as well? These are all Cisco employees, and they're, they're experts in various different technologies associated with the labs. And these are the folks that actually created the labs. They procure the equipment, and then, of course, they're here, obviously, proctoring the labs. Amazing stuff. So these are people taking their time, basically, out of their day jobs to do this, because, out of the good of their heart, really. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll yeah, more or well, less. Trip to Vegas, I guess. You That's know? right. Yeah, absolutely. Thomas, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and I understand Steve is a very special guest in the studio. Yeah. And so we will toss it back to you, Steve. That I do. Thank you so much, Davis. I appreciate it. Thank Thomas as well. It's always good to get a hit there in the walk-in labs and get a sense of what everybody's doing, what they come to Vegas to learn, and the kind of questions that they're asking. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yes, we are back in the studio, and now we're going to turn our attention to Mr. Brian Campbell, Vice President of Digital Experience at CDW. How are you, my friend? Great, Steve. Thanks for having me. How are you? I am so glad. I've been, I, I mean, this is just so much fun. What I get to do, I get to play, party, I get to talk with people like you, oh, great. which to me is so much of what's Cisco Live is, is all about, right? It's the connections. It's always the human story for me. Everybody who watches the broadcast right. knows that part of it. In fact, why don't we go ahead and start that way with CDW. Before we go into the technical, let's kind of start with the human angle on CDW right now from your perspective. Great, thanks. Uh, so our customers engage us for many, many reasons. And the solutions journey that we've been on, the services journey that we've been on is really best categorized as an outcome-focused journey, which is exactly what we've been hearing from our friends at Cisco the entire week here. Yeah. Customers come to us for the outcomes of help me innovate faster, uh, help me create a, a good repeated cost structure, help me with my agility so that I can continue to innovate in our organization. I need to be protected from all the risk uh, threat profiles that are out there, and most of all important for me is how do I create a really excellent, superior experience for my employees and for my customers? And the human side of that is we get to talk to our customers about the thing they're trying to accomplish not the thing that they're trying to buy. Mm. Isn't that true? When we speak to the wallet, we really don't create any connections, right? Um, the wallet comes second. Talk to the human first, the wallet's going to follow along. Why do you think Cisco and CDW have got this lengthy partnership with one another? How do we respond to the demand that you were just talking about in a successful way together? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's, there's so much innovation that Cisco has been responsible for across the platform of solutions that, that you offer, which is a, a compelling reason for a customer to make a, an investment in a partnership. They're not buying a product from Cisco, they're not buying a, a single thing through CDW, they're buying a commitment to this partnership. So whether their infrastructure upgrades are necessary, they're going through a security audit or assessment, and in my world, they're looking for better ways to attract their employees back to their office mm. or serve customers. There's just this, this magic that happens when the platform of Cisco is utilized with a uh, consulting partner like CDW to be able to, to fill in the, the gaps that might exist on a services front, on a life cycle journey that they might be on, or to help them ensure that they've delivered the outcome that they're looking for within their business. They're, again, they're not in the business of buying the thing to buy it and put it in the office. Yeah. They need to accomplish a goal, and our job along with Cisco is to help them accomplish that goal. That is so perfectly put, nice and concise on that too. Um, you mentioned a really important point, right? Building relationships. So we can talk about technology all day long. I always sure. say, I say you, can, you can build the greatest widget in the world. If nobody knows about the widget, mm -hmm. they're never going to buy it. And also, if they don't know how that widget fits into their lives, if they don't internalize that story for themselves in a way that makes them feel right. that they are being empowered by the capability, it's never going to work. How do we get that story out to them? That's a great question. So we, we start our CDW messaging with uh, our purpose statement. We make technology work so that people can do great things. Okay. And in order for us to accomplish that objective, we need to understand what the, the capabilities of the tech can do. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, we need to know what the customer is trying to accomplish. We verticalize our, our sales organization so that the outcomes that they're driving towards are vertical specific. A healthcare institution is going to utilize WebEx solutions differently than a financial, uh, a financial organization, differently than a small business, different than a large business, mm -hmm. or an education institute. So our job is to get as close as we possibly can to the verticals our customers reside in, build a long-lasting relationship that spans really all aspects of their technology investment so that we know the next technology decision that they make is going to work with the one that they've just made. So our job is to know thy customer and what they're trying to accomplish. And, and in my organization with the pre-sales delivery team, our team is really helping our, our sellers understand the power of the solution and what it can drive for a customer depending on their unique needs. I love that. So let's talk about those unique needs. Let's talk maybe about obstacles, right? One of the biggest things we can ever do is clear obstacles out of someone's path. Sure. They have a dynamic, they know where they want to go, they have a target in mind, right. but for whatever reason they can't get there, that obstacle might be a boulder, it might be a pebble in their shoe. Right. What is CDW doing right now to clear the pebble out of the shoe, to clear the boulder out of the path? Right, well I think a couple of things, number one, Again, our customers are not in the business of buying technology, they're in the business of creating outcomes for their customers. Yes. So our job is to ensure that they are up to speed on the technology uh, innovation that's happened within our space. So we need to be the technology landscape experts so that they don't have to be. They need to run their business, we're the ones that are helping them make these good decisions based on how well we know them. Mm -hmm. So obstacle number one is all of the innovation that's happened in our space in the last three years, our job is to distill that to a recommendation for a customer based on how much we know them. Secondly, uh, they may not be in the business of running technology. So again, this product, this suite of products, this platform of solutions will accomplish the objectives of the company if they know how to use it. So our job alongside of Cisco is to make sure that they've bought the right solution based on their unique needs, but that they have all aspects of their demand life cycle covered. From the time that they're looking for an audit or an assessment, maybe it's a, a proof of value or a proof of concept, they may need help with implementation, and they may need help in the management of the solution. CDW provides all of those end-to-end -end solutions, so a customer can feel really comfortable in the fact that they bought the right thing, they bought the right Cisco platform, they chose the right partner to be able to implement and manage it for that so that they can focus on their employees, their business, their outcomes. Amen, by that relationship. Let's talk about where we are in the current digital experience, right? As everything continues to hybridize, as yeah. we continue to move more and more to the cloud and digital becomes the story of the day, does that create a differentiation in the approach for how CDW and Cisco work together? I think it does, right? I think if, if you, if you uh, date us back five years, the go-to-market strategy we had around creating a compelling meeting, calling, contact center experience was very, very different. It was, it was, it was maybe almost a single channel approach. Here's the thing that's going to help you accomplish the goal. We know your goal is about the same as everybody else's. Today, they have so much choice and they have all of these methodologies by which they can import technology into their environments. And they're also trying to figure out how to utilize technology to draw uh, connections to their employees and to create a, a better customer experience for, uh, for all of the customer service angles. So we do have to make sure that we're challenging our customers on their uh, standard line of thinking. Mm -hmm. The art of the possible now is, is never been greater. And our job is to make sure that we're bringing some of these aspects to, to our customer, not saying, 
we'll do the thing that you want us to do without making a couple of recommendations or suggesting that what they're trying to do can be done in a better way. Mm -hmm. So that relationship that we both share with a customer has to withstand telling a customer when they may not be thinking about the solution or the problem in a, in a complete fashion. Hardest thing to do, right, is to look somebody in the eye who you deeply care about, who you trust, who you respect, and say, I'm sorry, no. And I've always said that sometimes there's so much power in no. Right. It's not that we're trying to go negative, it's we're trying to say we see the path, we see it from a higher level right. or from a greater distance, we have this massive amount of technology experience. How long have you been CDW? You were Almost 25 me. years. Almost 25 years. If you walk into a room and somebody does not listen to your expertise, there's a bigger blockade right. in the room in that particular space. Which kind of leads me to the next thing I wanted to ask you. I always feel like the reason people don't get where they need to go, they're either locked into their own way of thinking mm -hmm. and they can't see the forest for the trees, right. or we are not telling the right story of what is available to them and right. why they want to go that path. How do we tell better stories around this? Yeah, I, I think it really starts with the, with the foundation of a really strong partnership and relationship. Yes. Uh, I need to know that you're okay with me telling you that this might not be correct. Right. And if I can establish that, when I get to the point in time where I'm telling you that it's not correct, hopefully I've built enough credibility and trust in the partnership for you to listen. Mm -hmm. And uh, my job is not to sell a thing to a customer. My job is to make sure that a customer has achieved the goals of the project. And if, if I continue to talk about the goals of the project, the outcome that they're trying to achieve, which might be driving better engagement with their employees, right? A technology experience can be very positive to employee engagement and getting that discretionary effort, or it can be very negative. Like, I can't wait till that clock hits 5.01 because I'm swiping out. <laughs> the technology decisions that they make are foundational to that, but if I don't understand and I don't showcase any value and expertise to the outcome that they're trying to drive, it might sound like this other feature, of this other product, or this other solution I'm trying to steer you towards is for me, not for you. And it couldn't be further from the truth, but we need to prove that every single engagement with every single customer. I could not have said that better myself. That's so brilliant. Um, I want to ask you what we do from here to really maximize even further. This is a long-term partnership, as I said, between CDW and right. Cisco. It's one we are deeply proud of right. and uh, very grateful for with all of you. But where do we take it from here? Two very powerful organizations with incredible history. What do we do next? Uh, I think first and foremost, we're listening to each other. We need to continue that, that course of listening. That can't be a, a, an event or a point in time or because the two right people are in the meeting. It has to be an always on, all the time thing. Cisco makes great solutions that our customers consume and utilize to achieve a business outcome. Mm -hmm. CDW has great relationships with those same customers and we have just an op a great opportunity for feedback amongst all three of us. The customer telling us what they need, us challenging them on the art of the possible, you challenging us on the art of the possible, us talking about the thing that might be missing to really unlock that, that future state that our customers are looking for together. So I think number one is, is really guiding our organization to have a trusting relationship built on feedback that benefits us both. Uh, the second thing that I think we, we need to do is make sure that we're walking uh, a, a story together. Right? right. So uh, CDW has uh, a portfolio of solutions uh, across thousands of, of different products and services. My job is to make sure that I distill that portfolio to the thing that our customers most need and the selected uh, uh, solutions that we put together built with great services are going to, to deliver that outcome. So Cisco plus CDW, services, capabilities, relationships, all are key to helping us stay that course, give, deliver, give and deliver good feedback, accept it, and be open to all the things that could happen when we challenge each other to be better. Uh, that's just brilliant. All right, last thing that I want to sure. ask you here uh, that I had written down. I mean, you and I could do this for an entire day here with no problem at all. Right. How do we make the customer into the rock star? How do we keep the focus on them where it needs to be and not allow the ego of our larger companies that have so much power to kind of get in the way of doing the listening that you were just right. talking about? The, the hero stories that were shared earlier today in the keynote I thought were great mm -hmm. examples of, of just that. And I think when we talk about uh, how we have helped a customer, uh, we want to talk about the outcome that they've achieved, the business result that it generated. Again, that's front and center. But then we also want to be able to share those stories with like customers in like situations. And being able to, to serve as a reference uh, for, for what one healthcare institute does to the next one really helps create a better uh, healthcare environment. So I think our healthcare entities in, in this instance appreciate the fact that they learn from and can share with their peers. And really our job is to facilitate that. We find unique applications and outcomes that we can deliver because we understand the things that make our unique customers very similar in how they utilize technology. So having that good connection, being able to, to continue to showcase with 
one customer, how they can help their peers going forward is such an important part of, of relationship, build, relationship building and relationship selling. I am so glad that you brought up what Alistair brought up in the, uh, in the keynote here today, right? Recognizing all those heroes, all those superstars who just right. do incredible work with us and being able to call out why the customer experience part of the story, both for CDW and for right. Cisco, is so incredibly vital to everything we do. Brian, this has been such a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank like you. I said, uh, from all of us here at Cisco, I, I, we probably don't ever say it enough. We are so grateful for the partnership with CDW. We love what you do and we love what we were able to do together. As are we, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. Really, really appreciate it. All right. All right, so we are heading into our next innovation talk coming up very shortly. Pop that up on the monitor when you can so I can uh, check out what's going on over there and get a sense of what's happening over in that innovation space. I'll kind of keep an eye on that and you and I will talk to each other in the meantime. Remember, keep reaching out to us, please, using hashtag Cisco Live, whatever social media platform that you like to operate on, that is great. Our social media team is over back in the hub, which is about a million miles that way, as we walk across the show floor. But they are out there paying attention to every tweet, every post, every comment, every thought, photo, video, whatever it is that you put up there. Not only are they going to respond to you and continue to communicate and connect with you, but we will disperse that all across our Cisco ecosystem. Any opportunity that we have to reach out to all of you all around the world, wherever you happen to be, please give us that chance. If you miss any part of the broadcast, remember you will find all of the replays live over on Cisco.com, so we urge you to check that out as well. This is coming to you in 11 languages on Cisco.com. Wherever you want to go, we're going to follow you. We're going to do it in the right language. So, let's talk very briefly about what's coming up in this innovation talk, the next stage of hybrid work, delivering unrivaled experiences. We've got Javed Khan with us, Senior VP and GM of Collaboration here at Cisco, along with Greg Durai, Senior VP and GM of Networking Experiences and Campus Connectivity. Fantastic story here. And they are welcoming in Chris D'Amato, who is VP of Technical Services at Broadridge. So again, another great customer story coming at all of you here in this next innovation talk. So, we just talked about it a moment ago here with Brian, right? What does the future of work look like? If we're navigating in a hybrid environment, what does that look like? How do we adapt? Not only the methodologies of what's happening within our offices, but how do we adapt within our applications? How people access those applications? BYOD, how do we keep everything secure so that it's native and it's easily accessible to whoever wants it? but at the same time, make sure that people who should not have access to that capability are blocked out. How do we let all of that happen? Well, we always say that work is not just where you go. We can talk about physical spaces all the time. Work is where employees want to be. Where are they going to perform at their peak? Where are they going to be best at what they do and how do we maximize their time and their abilities? Well, employees want a workplace that nurtures them that nurtures their abilities, that creates that sense where they can just go out and do what they are best at, enabling better connections, fostering collaboration, and again, allowing them to behave securely. Because security, it's got to be native to everything. You heard it in the keynote yesterday, you heard it in the keynote today, security is a massive talk. Not only throughout Cisco, in our end-to-end -end portfolio, but all across the Cisco Live Show floor here in Las Vegas that week, this week. Well, what do we do? We combine IT, HR, real estate, everything has to work together. This cannot be siloed. We can't separate out these different capabilities. We have to make sure that we combine everything that a workplace has got to be to make sure that employees are feeling confident and feeling comfortable in everything they do. So, in the innovation talk, which we're going to head into in just a moment here, we'll learn how to support some new work styles. We're going to make the office more of a magnet instead of a mandate and deliver great expectations. We're going to head into the innovation talk right now. We'll meet you back in the studio as soon as it's done. Away we go. Places that nurture creativity, enable connections, and foster collaboration. And to do this, IT, HR, and real estate must work as one. So in this talk, we're going to discuss uh, support new work styles, make the office a magnet, avoiding a mandate, and deliver exceptional experiences across networking, security, and collaboration to deliver on the promise of hybrid work. Please join me in welcoming to the stage from the Cisco networking team, 
Greg Durai. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vegas. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all the viewers, hybrid viewers all around the world. Wednesday afternoon, 2.30, the energy from the party bus is hitting, right? I'll try to do my best. Here to talk about the next stage of hybrid work. Uh, I'm Greg Durai, SVP GM of Cisco Networking Business. Joining me will also be Javed Khan, SVP GM of our Collab business. And we have a very special guest, Chris DeMardo from Broadridge Financials, who are going to talk about how to make hybrid work work, right? But right now, let's go. Hybrid work is changing again. Can you just imagine, just three years ago, all of us went home, and we thought we were going to get screwed, but we didn't. We, we actually found out business models that worked, right? And we thought that was hybrid work. And then a year later, we thought if we get two shots and we open the offices, everyone will come back to office, right? They didn't. And so we had to reinvent again. And that reinvention is again happening because of the recession. Because in all the conversations that we have here at Cisco, there's one thing that's common across all verticals. The real estate conversation is getting real, real fast. 30 to 50%. Imagine that, 50% target reduction in real estate costs. That's what facilities owners are planning. Why is that? Because if you look at peak occupancy between pre-pandemic and now, it's just at 60%, right? So that's a simple math. 40% of the buildings have been empty for a substantial long period of time, leading to that. Why have they been empty, right? Let's go to my team. We had two managers in my team, and this is the come back to work. One of them decided to mandate, sort of, three to four days, uh, please come back to work, right? It was a polite mandate. The other gave lunch, two days, buffet. Which team do you think came back to work, right? It's a team that gave the lunch, but then after 30 days, they start complaining about lack of vegan options. It's not a sustainable strategy, right? You need to make the office a magnet, not a mandate. You need to make the commute worth it. And it's not just a commute. Let me tell you about my friend, a single mom. She has two kids, and during the pandemic, she got a dog, right? Now she has to drop her two kids early, leave her dog in daycare, miss her workout to come to work. We got to make it worthwhile for her and every one of us, right? Because we make compromises to come to work. So it's not about lunch, it's about collaboration, right? We really need to make this workspace about collaboration. And it's not just in a carpeted setting, right? Like hospitals, things are hybrid. I recently went to an ER room where the triage process started hybrid. Javed, we need the mini, WebEx mini in all hospitals. Hybrid because the doctors Took time normally, right? You go into a waiting room and then they take you to another room and make you wait for 15 more minutes. Remember that process? Now the triage happens a lot earlier with hybrid, with nurses, so the doctor can engage with more patients, right? Or take retail or take even the MGM resorts. How many of us do collab calls from the room? Those rooms are no longer just for sleeping, right? They have a collaboration, so things are changing. And we need to think through how we redesign for that world. You saw G2 present this morning in the keynote. We have just two simple pillars. You need to reimagine workspaces. From the ground up, workspace could be a kitchen, could be a car, could be an office for collaboration, right? And then you need to reimagine how work is done in those workspaces, right? We talked of business models changing. We need to figure that out. And because of that, the role of the network and how you secure, manage, and use AI to make everything predictable and resilient in the network becomes super important. At Cisco, we think we have a blueprint. We have done three buildings, London, One Pen, and Atlanta. State of the art, really rethought everything. And I saw rethought everything, it's the furniture. It's the color of the fabric in that couch, to the acoustics, to the POE, to the network, to the collab devices, it's amazing. Let's take a look at one of those buildings, Cisco Atlanta office. Hybrid work is here to stay. And many leading organizations will see it as an opportunity for competitive advantage. At Cisco, we see the office as a platform to advance our strategic enterprise goals. 
Atlanta has been an important community for Cisco for a very long time. Our commitment to both the city and community were key considerations when we selected this site, including attracting the best talent as we bring new jobs into the community. Our real estate team has done an incredible job in using data to help us understand where we have underutilized locations. Based on this, we've been divesting our underutilized assets, which provides the financial opportunity for us to invest in and modernize strategic locations. These are important investments to make as our space becomes a strategic advantage in helping us achieve our sustainability goals. LEED's focus on energy efficiency and optimizing energy performance inspired our design team to install low voltage power over ethernet infrastructure. This also simplified our ability to tie together various building systems and make adjustments to the employee experience based on dynamic occupancy. All right, so that was Atlanta. Uh, you know, you all should go and visit it. But what is beneath that building or in that building? Three floors, hundreds of people, 60 of my favorite devices, Catalyst 9300 switch, 115 WebEx endpoints, 1,700 IoT sensors, right? And then Cisco Catalyst wireless access points as well, right? And, and you have to take a different approach when you design these buildings. It is no longer network for connectivity. It's actually network for digitization, right? It's not just about moving packets, which we do very well. It's about the network for power and energy savings. It's about the network of how you can give a next-gen experience, whether it's collab, right, like our people, navigation experience in those smart buildings. And that is why the announcement yesterday that we did is super exciting, the Cisco Networking Cloud platform, right? Because what that platform does is it gives this ability to do scalable automation, right? Like So you can scale multiple devices, onboard it, network insights or data flowing through an API value creation for an ecosystem of partners to live on top of it. So you can go after three outcomes. I'm gonna talk of three outcomes that are important in the smart buildings sense. Sustainable, predictable and manageable, secure for IoT. All right, so which one should we go first? Las Vegas, let's spin the wheel, please. All right, I was just kidding. <laughs> Sustainable. <laughs> let's go after sustainable outcomes, right? Like, what we have observed, and I'm sure this is everyone saying, nine of 10 companies have sustainability as a strategic initiative, nine of 10. But only 20% of them have a plan. From personal experience, I can tell you, hope is not a strategy, right? You need to have a plan. And you can actually have a plan very easily if you start doing that network as a utility that I spoke about. Here is a POE-powered workspace in the same Atlanta office. You see the before and the after. Whenever I see the before and after, I relate very well to the before. I see no line of sight to the after, I mean, in general world, right? But that's not the case here. With POE-powered switches, the clutter is gone, and it's the desk is POE-powered. The collab devices are POE-powered, right? So it's just clean. And more than clean and good looking, which, which we, we'll take, it saves you energy, right? What we saw in the Atlanta office was that with just doing nothing except those POE powered desks and lampshades, and we got about a 20% reduction, right? Straight off the bat in power consumption. And then when we use the information from spaces, where you know the location and how people move around in the building, and, and you can be smarter about what you shut down what you power on, power off, you saw another 40% reduction from that, right? So huge power savings in these smart buildings if you operate it with the right network and it feeds the right software on top of it. And what is that network, right? It is the Catalyst 9K switches, it's a Cisco wireless access points, Meraki sensors, Meraki cameras, and of course, Cisco collaboration devices, right? All of it. All of it feeds information to spaces, and including real estate sensors, carbon monoxide sensors. And you can use that information very intelligently, and Javed will talk more about it, to power outcomes, right? That is a smart building. It is a software-defined building, literally. That's what you're getting if you build it right from the ground up. Of course, none of the technology matters if at the end of the day there's connectivity issues, right? The story I say, this is a... West Coast prestigious university, and there's some power outage because of a storm, and 
water was out because some more was out. For three days, no one complained, okay? How long do you think they waited when the Wi-Fi was down? Five minutes. And so that's how important it is. As the calls came, like, what do you expect me to do? Talk to my roommate? It's impossible, right? And so that's how today's world is. Everything is connected, and even a normal conversation happens like that. You need to really have, be predictable and manageable. And this morning, Jonathan and Mohit talked about Thousand Eyes Network Assurance, right? And they talked about in the context of SaaS. But actually, Thousand Eyes Network Assurance with Cisco WebEx devices can give you that same assurance for collaboration as well, right? Because Thousand Eyes agent, thanks to Java and team, is that in every room OS device? Is that in every WAN edge? Is that in every Cat 9K switch? So let's take a look, right? So you can go to any meeting, select any end device in that meeting, and look at the complete path all the way from that end node to the WebEx data node. And you can look at jitter, network jitter, latency, and any part of this path, right? And not just that, from straight from the control center in WebEx, if you want, you can go directly to Thousand Eyes as well by clicking on that cloud icon. And you go into Thousand Eyes, and you can look at live what's happening. But you can also go and troubleshoot something that happened, right? Somebody complained here, uh, Vikash complained that a meeting was not well for him from home. You can troubleshoot that, right? And so this is the cool thing. Even if a remote user or a remote laptop is at home, you can troubleshoot the entire path, and you can say it's actually your home Wi-Fi that's down. It's not the WebEx data node. That's the power of Thousand Eyes. And if you invest a little bit of AI behind it, you can actually fix these problems before they occur. Right? That's cool. Sure, Mohit may not get that many appreciation. Mohit is the Thousand Eyes founder, but we'll take that. Right? We'll take that. Last is secure for IT and OT, right? I talked of sustainable buildings, I talked of predictable, and now secure for IT and OT. What's happening here is a perfect storm. So many IoT sensors, what, 1,700 in that building? Smart lighting, mobility, and all these devices often are headless, unmanaged, right? It's easy to hack, and that's a perfect storm. Just by having perimeter security and agent security, things are not going to work, right? You need something different. Um, let me tell you a story. I always tell stories in my talks. I, I was in a taxi coming to this event, and I asked the taxi driver, hey, what do I need to do to consistently win when I gamble, right? This is, this is what I wanted to understand. And, 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 and the driver said something important. He said, to consistently win, you have to own the casino. <laughs> and that's the same thing with security. To consistently beat, you need to own the network. Guess who owns the network? Cisco. Every packet that flows. We know. So if we can share that information, context, posture, with our security team, I think we can beat any hacker in the world. And that's the strategy, right? You saw Jitu talk about this morning of scaling zero trust across the network, across all domains. Centralized policy management, you share it across domain. Security intelligence, true operational simplicity, and you connect everything in the security uh, ecosystem, including all the rich information we have in Cisco ICE and Cisco DNA Center to everything that the Talos engine. That is how you can have comprehensive end-to-end -end security in a smart building, right? And you've got to make it simple, though, right? True simplicity. You can't expose this, so you have to have a lot of AI ops. That's why you saw in the keynote yesterday and today the AI ops behind networking and security. I just want to give one example of how we use AI ops to make your world simple in our world, right, in the networking world. This is Cisco DNA Center, now rebranded as Catalyst Center with ICE. What we do for those unmanaged endpoints is oftentimes you have no clue, at least I don't, what those 1,700 endpoints are about, right? But the network does. Based on the flow of traffic, it can actually classify. This is a fire alarm. Hey, this is a carbon monoxide sensor. And, and then basis that classification, it give, can give you a trust score. Not only did it onboard as a fire alarm, it is behaving like a fire alarm. And you can trust that, you can segment it makes things simple. I spoke for a, 
a while now, but I hope you've got how you can drive outcomes through building the right network. But it's not just about the plumbing, right? It's about the collaboration. Whether it's a conference room, open space, or hot desk, right? I, I just got a gift from Aruna, who's in the WebEx team, of uh, WebEx Mini. It changed my kitchen and my life, right? And now to talk more about it, let me invite to the stage SVP GM of a collaboration business unit, Javed Khan. Craig is, Craig is funny. Um, the first part of that presentation was him saying, it's not the network, Javed, it's the applications. <laughs> no, just, just joking. Actually, when you have a network like that, you can now deliver amazing collaboration experiences on top of that. And the alignment between the networking team and the collaboration team has never been better. As you've noticed, we also aligned on our uh, outfits for today. <laughs> But I'm going to show you how our collaboration portfolio and built on top of the enterprise-grade network that Greg just talked about can deliver some amazing experiences. So what have we been up to inside the collaboration team? We've developed for your workspaces a comprehensive line of purpose-built collaboration devices for every kind of workspace. For your conference room, we built the room series set of devices. These devices actually plug into your existing monitor or TV. The device takes care of the rest. If you're looking for an integrated collaboration device, you've got the board series, uh, board series of devices. There's one right there. It's an integrated video conferencing device. It's also a fully functional whiteboard. It's great for open spaces as well. And then we build the desk series. You've got the desk series devices here, two of them up here. Again, integrated video devices, great for the executive desk, also really good for open spaces and for your home office as well. But today, I'm, ex I'm excited because we announced this week another device. It's part of our room series set of devices. So I'm going to roll a video. Let's take a look. Work. It begins as a focused solo act, then becomes a concert of minds, a meeting. And what do you need to meet better? Sophisticated image capture and dual cameras that keep everyone in focus so it feels as if the whole team is at one table. A three-channel stereo speaker array so every word is heard crystal clear. And intuitive tools that allow everyone a moment in the spotlight. Share with one tap and connect any device anywhere. Today, work demands flexibility so teams can focus on what matters and make great ideas sing. The Cisco Roombar Pro leverages advanced intelligent technology to create an elevated meeting experience for the hybrid era. It's simple, scalable, powerful. The Cisco Roombar Pro. Isn't that a beautiful device? So that's the new Cisco Roombar Pro, specifically designed for medium-sized conference rooms. Now, the engineer in me really wanted to show you this next slide. You know what this is? Actually, we're going to go ahead and look at that device. What is that thing? Actually, I'm an engineer, so I really wanted to show you this. This is the PCB inside our video conferencing devices, because a couple of years ago, the engineering team made a conscious decision to standardize on the NVIDIA platform. So all of our video conferencing devices are built on top of the NVIDIA stack. Now, well, the reason we did that was because we knew AI was going to play a very important role going forward. And thanks to that design decision, we are now able to deliver amazing experiences because of the AI that's embedded in this device. So this is the Xavier series of devices, uh, of in, in video chips. So I'm going to show you next some of the experiences that we've built into these devices. Let's roll the video. Hi, Dad, and hello, Vegas. We're calling in from our lab here in Oslo. And right now, our camera mode is set to group. But for a setup like this, we can do a lot better. If we enable frames, you can see all of us a lot more clearly. However, in the meeting with a designated presenter, you might want to enable speaker mode for full focus. These are all capabilities that are already available in our devices as a part of our cinematic meeting experience. 
but let's enable frames again. Now, in this lab, we have a setup with three quad cams running a quite early stage demo. This will be a camera agnostic solution, but we would like to show you the experience that we will bring to the market and why that's important. Now, as I turn around to address Anna on the opposite side of the table, you can only see the back of my head. You're losing out on my facial expressions and you don't feel like you're a part of the conversation anymore. So that's why multiple cameras are needed in order to bring the best view at any moment. So what happened right now, our side camera that we have in the room picked it. Yes, Anne-Marie, our AI director is able to pick the best camera. Using our multiple cameras and our Table Microphone Pro, which is multi-directional, we are able to give our director eyes, ears, and brains in a meeting room, allowing it to pick the best view at any moment. And that switching happens automatically. So depending on who's speaking, you're able to follow the meeting even when it's happening across the table. And that concludes the demo. Over to you, Frida. Thanks, guys, and hello, Vegas. Welcome to Oslo. In this space, we've enabled Meeting Zone. And with Meeting Zone, we can define the active meeting area, making sure that only those needed are the ones seen in the call. Let's disable Meeting Zone and zoom out. As you can see, we have some really curious colleagues outside this meeting room. I guess they are keen to join this demo. Now, let's enable frames. This would be the typical view without Meeting Zone. But when we enable Meeting Zone again, we get rid of all distractions. And setting and changing the zone is easy. We simply draw an outline for the attendees that we want to capture. From there, it's easy to see the people who are outside the space versus those in the meeting. But the Meeting Zone will also be found automatically. This solves the issue for meeting rooms with glass walls, just like the one we're in today. Combining data from our intelligent cameras and audio, our devices learn where the outline of the meeting room actually is. And that's it from Oslo. Enjoy Cisco Live. Aren't those experiences amazing? <laughs> we, we are building on decades of experience, and this is not just about audio intelligence. It's audio intelligence combined with video intelligence combined with the power of the large language models that modern AI is enabling today. Yeah. We think we are way, way ahead of our competition because of the design choices we've made. Next, I want to talk about a topic that I know is important to all of you. Right. I know some of you have standardized on using the Microsoft ecosystem. In fact, even at Cisco, we use Microsoft. But you know what? We still got your back. Cisco devices now natively support Microsoft Teams rooms. And this, by the way, is available now. And just this week, Microsoft certified the Desk Pro and the Room Bar, and there's a lot more devices to come. You've got uh, the Desk Pro over here running the, the recently certified version of Microsoft Teams rooms. So this now gives you choice. You can actually choose the native WebEx experience that's running on those devices. That has support for Zoom and Microsoft as well or you can run the native Microsoft Teams Room experience. And in this experience, you get all the powerful AI features that you just saw earlier. So it actually makes your Microsoft Teams Rooms experience better. Now, in the native WebEx experience, we've integrated with the calendar. So you don't need to worry about your next meeting. You just hit the Join button. So frankly, as Jitu mentioned earlier, I must agree, there is no real reason for you to be buying anybody else's hardware, even if you're using Microsoft. Now, Greg mentioned earlier that 89% of companies have, a, have sustainability as a strategic initiative. Um, he also mentioned that sustainability was a primary goal for us when we designed our Pen1 and uh, Atlanta offices. Um, but we are taking this further with Control Hub. Earlier this year, we announced that we are bringing some of this data into Control Hub so that you can get a view into your scope to CO2 emissions. So we announced a feature which is Carbon Emissions Insights. It shows you the scope to CO2 emissions from our devices, and it gives you tools so you can adjust those emissions. This is now in beta. Actually, we are taking this further. Later this year, Control Hub will also include data from our data centers. So you will be able to see data center carbon emissions for your usage of meetings, calling, and messaging from our cloud. Nobody else in the industry lets you do this today. 
Now, the same data that is powering Carbon Emissions Insights also powers Cisco Spaces. So Cisco Spaces, you saw that, you saw that in the keynote earlier today. It's running on the board over there. Cisco Spaces aggregates data from across your entire Cisco portfolio. So it's collecting data from your Meraki devices. It's connect, collecting data from switches. Of course, from the collaboration devices. All these devices now become sensors for things like occupancy, air quality, humidity, and a lot, lot more. Now, what does that allow you to do? It, it makes your employee experience better because now they can see building occupancy. They can reserve a conference room or simply just use that to navigate their way around. It makes IT lives easier because you can now optimize your real estate, reduce energy usage, and help drive sustainability. So that's how we are reimagining workspaces. Let's talk about how we are reimagining work. Now, collaboration is not just about meetings. There's a whole spectrum of interactions. There's a phone call. There's large events like these. That is why we built the WebEx suite. We purpose built the WebEx suite for today's work, no matter how you interact. By the way, some of those interactions are synchronous. Others are asynchronous. In the WebEx suite, we've included messaging, meeting, calling, whiteboarding, webinar, polling, and asynchronous video, all in a simple suite. And, and, and all of this is built on the same platform, so you, so you get all of those fantastic experiences across all of those tools. Now, one of the most fundamental pieces of the WebEx suite is actually good old-fashioned calling. And I'm pleased to announce that we now have 11 million plus WebEx calling users. And I'm really, really proud of what the team's accomplished here in a very, very short time. We've always been the de facto standard when it came to calling, on-premise calling, and now we are delivering the same enterprise-grade calling product from our cloud. 11 million plus WebEx calling users and counting. Thank you. Now, we haven't stopped there. Today, we are making one more announcement with one of our largest calling partners, AT&T. I see Doug in the audience there. Thank you for that partnership. Today, we are launching WebEx Go with AT&T. It's a mobile solution for today's hybrid workforce. With WebEx Go from AT&T, you will get a single number as your WebEx identity. It's enterprise-grade ready. It's ready for mobile, and it's, it can be completely managed. It's secure and compliant, and it's available on your mobile phone through AT&T. Now, earlier today, Jitu talked about AI. Now, he, he showed you some of the AI features thanks to the advancements in large language models. There's a ton coming later this year, but I want to talk to you about three features because we don't have enough time. So I'd like to start by talking about um, meeting transcripts. You know, you sometimes miss a meeting. I often miss a meeting. And, and at the end, of the end of the meeting, you get a recording. It's a 60, 90-minute recording. It has a transcript. How many of you actually sit through the 60-minute recording? I have the data, very, very few of you. Right? Now, wouldn't it be great if, using the advancements in large language models, you could get a summary of the meeting with chapters and notes? We'll be launching this feature, Catch Me Up, later this year as part of our meetings platform. Second interesting feature we're going to be launching later this year or earlier next year, with AI, we can deliver now high-definition meetings with low bandwidth connections. So many of our laptops are equipped with poor cameras. Sometimes you might have a high-definition camera, but the network doesn't have the ability to send high-definition video. So with the new super-resolution feature that we are building, the original video, which may be 1080p, can now be downscaled to 270p, as you can see over here. That's what's transmitted over the wire. And then using AI, we can now upscale that to 1080p. And then smart relighting. Using video intelligence, we can detect the lighting in your room. So if you're working from home, from a dark room, or burning the midnight oil, we can adjust the lighting so that you always look best when you're in a WebEx meeting. Now, hybrid work is not just about working from home or office. Hybrid work is often work when you're in the car. I actually take a lot of calls from the car. Uh, so we've been working hard with all of the car manufacturers to integrate WebEx into the various platforms. Uh, last year, we announced a partnership with Ford, and we've taken that further in the last year. We now have partnerships with Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, 
just this, this week we announced support for Audi cars as well. And of course, we've got support for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. So I think we have all of you covered. The same WebEx experience now available from, from your car. So I talked about the WebEx suite. The WebEx suite includes WebEx events, VidCast, Slido, and whiteboarding, four new workloads we've added over the last year. All of these workloads are now available as part of the WebEx suite. So Jitu talked about this earlier today. You don't need to buy a separate tool when you use the WebEx suite, and we will continue to add new workloads as the nature of work continues to expand. It is the only solution out there that is a complete solution for hybrid work. Now, I know we've talked a lot about reimagining workspaces and how Cisco can help you reimagine work, but we wanted to invite over one of our customers who's using WebEx to tell us more about their, exp uh, about their experiences. So Chris DeMato, who's VP of Technical Services at Broadridge Financial, is going to be joining us. He's been at Broadridge for 20 years and oversees enterprise collaboration, which includes unified communications, messaging, mobility, and m and We've asked him to come over here to chat with us about how Broadrich is using WebEx. Uh, let's welcome Chris Tomato on stage. Chris. Thank you for joining us all the way from New York. So, so let's start by telling us uh, a little bit more about yourself and Broadrich. Chris Tomato, Vice President of Enterprise Collaboration. I've been with the organization 20 years. It's pretty unheard of. As everyone knows, uh, we're a global fintech leader. Uh, back in 2007, we spun off of ADP Clearing and we became Broadridge Financial. We're now fintech. We went from 4,500 associates to now today 17,000 plus employees. We have 44 offices globally and about $5 billion in revenue. And we're one of the Cisco's uh, customers Premier customers, okay. right? So, so tell us more about um, your organization's transition to hybrid work. It's been uh, three years. Uh, how has uh, I think everybody? Changed yeah, that? I think everybody in this room has gone through the struggle, right? We we were put in a situation where we were forced to go home. Broadridge is unique in the sense that we are fintech. Back in 2015, we put um, a big investment to beef up our infrastructure. We have a lot of regulated business. On uh, the GTO side, there's two business units, uh, main business units within Broadridge. So we put a lot of investment into beefing up our VPNs and making sure that we can be hybrid, even before the pandemic hit. Pandemic hits, prior to that, people were doing conference calls on, um, you know, just doing normal conference calls on telephony. Send everybody home, and we're telling everyone now we're peered with WebEx and the cloud and you have to join a conference call from an endpoint. Mm -hmm. One button to push. It sounds easy, but it was a struggle for the first 30 days, and I think everyone got used to it, and at the end of the day, we are here where we are now. What about your campus? How are you thinking about your workspaces and campus footprint? Great question. So back in 2018, I was put on a project where we had 93 offices. We've now consolidated to approximately 44 offices, like I said earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, taking those offices, we, we tried to reimagine. We're closing offices, we're retaining employees, and again, like you guys said before, how do we make the office area a magnet, getting people back into the office? So we invested some of that money, the money that we had uh, obviously saved from the closures of the office, we put back into reimagining the workspaces again, fitting more conference rooms, more huddle rooms, making it more like a lounge experience for associates to come back. Free coffee always helps, free lunch. Uh, so that was a big um, uptick for us. We're now starting to see people come back to the office where we have approximately, and very good on metrics, right? I have a, uh, I made my team put together a uh, metrics dashboard where it feeds in all our collaboration tools, all our, te all our telephony into one dashboard. So. When I have to, you know, every three years when you have to up and pay your bill, you can tell senior leadership, listen, it's being used. You can tell by the metrics, right? Uh, 17,000 employees were doing 33 million uh, uh, chat messages a month, thousands, 1,200 hours of uh, conference, uh, conference room hours. We're leveraging the technology, so we're a great example of, you know, the story behind yeah. the consolidation. 
Yeah, you've been a fantastic customer, and your team doesn't hesitate to give us feedback. But what about uh, as a user of WebEx, uh, which which would be one of your favorite favorite WebEx tool? Uh, yeah. uh, favorite tool. There's a couple of them. I really think for all enterprise global businesses, you have to have video on interrupt. Video interrupt is very important. We have our end users go into conference rooms, whether it is a Zoom meeting, whether it is a Teams meeting, uh, uh, Google Meet, they can go in, press a button, join a meeting. Sales and marketing were blown away. And, and again, going back to user adoption, that was a little bit of a struggle when people came in. We had these new conference rooms, and how do you use them, right? We went through the whole adoption, three phases, directions in the room, videos, and actually, you know, another plug for Cisco, but the customer success group, which is an extension of your organization, very, very important that you leverage your uh, customer success uh, program. Because I'm here in Vegas now, and there I have my customer uh, success person training our uh, associates on this new medical system right now. So again, kudos to Cisco. Yeah. Yeah, I think as, as, as our customers go through this transition, there's some unique challenges depending upon who you are, and that's why the role of the customer success organization is so important. And then, yes, the interop, you know, I think the most stressful part is often just joining the meeting, and uh, yeah. I love that feature, too. We've, we've worked hard to make that really, really easy. And another one, too, another good example would be vidcast. We're seeing a lot of um, uh, positive feedback. We have to reinvent how we're doing meetings. I don't know if anyone sends, you guys a recording of a meeting, it's an hour long, no one's watching the, the recording of the meeting. So Vidcast has been a huge uh, success, especially with our sales and marketing. And uh, again, for anyone who doesn't know, it's initially, it is uh, essentially, it's uh, summarizing a, a meeting within five minutes and sending it out. You could send it externally, internally, you're able to edit the video, highlight points. You're also able to look at how many people watched it and develop metrics. So it's uh, great. That's another tool. I had a. I had a yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite tools because the hardest part for me is sometimes just trying to find a time to, uh, so that I can align everybody's schedule. And now I can record this on the weekend and send it out and actually get instant feedback from the team. So great work by that team. Uh, now, you are uh, a fairly large uh, fintech organization dealing with millions, trillions of dollars, um, I hear. Yeah, true. So that must present some unique Trillions go through our, yeah, yeah, trillions. So that must present some uh, unique challenges uh, from a collaboration uh, standpoint. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I look at this question and I say to myself, it's, you know, every enterprise organization has to have multiple collaboration tools. You can't just have one tool, right? So it's, it, it's important. Uh, obviously, our trading systems don't use, you know, uh, it's our, our user base that are communicating. But you have to have multiple collaboration tools to be successful in any enterprise organization. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. That's a great conversation. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I love how Broadridge, Broadridge is embracing hybrid work. And of course, uh, they're using Cisco products to do it. So that helps as well. Um, so Greg and I have really enjoyed being here today uh, with, uh, with all of you. Thank you for joining us. I think we can all agree that hybrid work is uh, here to stay. We are uh, never uh, going to go back to the way things were. Uh, but the good news is that Cisco can actually help you adapt and actually thrive in this new world. Uh, in fact, if you want to see any of our spaces, whether it's the uh, uh, Atlanta office you saw earlier, or the Pen One office, or San Jose, scan this QR code uh, and reserve a spot. We are happy to show you how we are working every single day. And please come and see us at the World of Solutions. If you haven't already seen some of these experiences, um, uh, the team is uh, there to demo the experiences that you saw uh, today. Uh, so thank you for joining. Enjoy the rest of the day and the concert later today. Thank you, Java. Welcome to the Cisco TV broadcast studio. We are so glad to have had you with us all day so far here on the live broadcast. We just wrapped up our final innovation talk of the day on the next stage of hybrid work. 
delivering unrivaled experiences. Javed Khan, Greg Durai, Chris D'Amato, VP of Technical Services at Broadridge. They look at the workplace of the future and why employees want a workplace that really nurtures their creativity, enables their connection, fosters that great collaboration. How do we make the office a magnet rather than a mandate? How do we deliver those exceptional experiences across networking, security, and collaboration. We just found out. Now, speaking of collaboration, Rob Boyd is out in the Showcase Collaboration Zone all the way over there to build on our iTalk session story. Rob. Yes, sir, Steve, thank you so much. I am in the hybrid work area, and I've got two of the best gentlemen that could possibly explain because there's a lot of ideas that we can grasp, we can take here to do our work in a much more efficient manner, especially when it comes to work with people. So Grant, Sonora, welcome. I'm not gonna try and do last names or titles. We'll have it on the screen. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We're in front of what I understand, what I historically know is like DNA spaces. I know we've changed Cisco the names. Spaces. Cisco, the Cisco spaces. spaces now. But the important part is we've got this physical environment coming together with the virtual environment because this is kind of the nature of how we work today. Do you mind walking us through what's important to understand here? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the big change that we're going through. You know, hybrid work is changing yet again. Uh, it's never going to stay static, but the big piece that we're seeing is as we come back to the office, even though we're only at 60% capacity across the ecosystem, uh, we're seeing that the workplace has become a collaborative space. It's for we work as opposed to, to me work. And so that's where the network, the collaboration system, and platforms like Spaces really have to come together to create that environment for creative work at the end of the day. I mean, how are you seeing this play out with some of your teams? So what we want to do is to make sure we create the office as a magnet uh, and not a mandate. You want to get people back in doing that by themselves, right? And when you do that, you come back, just like he said, for the right type of things. And when you then get in there, you might have scheduled meetings and scheduled discussion and creative sessions but all of a sudden, you might need a meeting room or you need a space for yourself. Then we have a tool like space, Cisco Spaces that you see behind me here. This is actually the floor plan of the ninth floor of our New York office. And you can see here, green rooms are available, reds are occupied. You have lots of statistics here from all of these. You know, floor occupancy is low today. Airport air quality is excellent. CO2 level is good, temperature, everything. And then, you might want to look into a specific room. Brooklyn Bridge is, uh, is occupied. You see here the stats again. You see there is only one person in this very, very big room. So it's actually being un underutilized. And the other thing we can do, let's say I walk in there and I need somewhere to sit. I'll go over, I'll go to the room finder. And here I can actually decide, you know, I need, need something for uh, 30 minutes for one person. I'll. I'll select that and that will actually point me to the right room. I can reserve that for three minutes, walk over and make that shared space mine. Yeah, and I think the power in all of this is the fact that we're getting all of the data through the network in terms of how people are moving through the space mm -hmm. and what they're using. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing in spaces like Atlanta and Pen One in New York City is that the team is able to take this information almost like a programmable building and start changing the way we use the spaces, turn on lights, raise the shades, and we've driven a 40% savings in our electricity cost just by taking the power of the network data to deliver these kind of experiences. Well, what I love is you're taking advantage of the sensors in these devices, but we've heard throughout, especially the keynote, that we're, we're not, it's not about the endpoint device, it's all about how do we work everything together, but we're also viewing everything together, which reminds me, because we only got about a minute and a half left, I can't help but notice. We made an announcement with the Roombar Pro 2, your lovely assistant here, I think has got that. I love it, we got props. What's, well, yeah, props, we love props. What's important about the Roombar 2? How's this gonna change things? So, first of all, it has all of these statistics that we bring into it, but this is brand new. It has 20 times the AI capability of the previous platform. We worked thoroughly with NVIDIA. We have the brand new chipset from NVIDIA in here that has all of the oomph we need for, uh, for that going forward, and also with the brand new camera and design. But what's unique with Cisco is that we bring together the meeting backend with the device and app front end on top of the network infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I'm a little worried about not being the <laughs> smartest person in the room anymore with this 
this so you coming used in. to be the smartest person? Well, I don't That's know if I can claim nice. that exactly, but now you I guess that worry first. is I've taken off the table. I've only got about 30 day. seconds Great. left, but I do want to ask you about, uh, you can set that down if you want. I don't know how heavy it is. It's, I mean, it's he very looks, portable. You don't look him. like you're struggling yeah. at all. Okay, stay there. So, uh, Thousand Eyes. Yes. We talk about these integrations. Visibility is so important to everything we do, and, you know, the input quality of the, of the entire experience is very dependent on a lot of things we can't see or control. How is this going to help us do this? How is it going to appear to our customers? So we are now integrating our devices with Thousand Eyes, and then we get the power of Thousand Eyes, and we can expose that through Control Hub. And we are unique as Cisco, being able to bring the infrastructure together with the collaboration solution. Yeah, and the thing I'm most excited about is it's working even when you're not in the conference room. Exactly. So you can know if I'm having a problem at a point, if I'm making the connection to a particular switch of the network, I can see the hop, even if you're not there, even yeah. if there's only one person in that room. Uh, I'm, Thousand Eyes has always just majorly impressed yeah. me because I'm like, oh great, we can visualize all this stuff that I just assumed I had to go flip a coin. You know, and no, we don't, and we can address it. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Guys, if you're here physically, you need to come by, check out the booth. This kind of stuff is available online as well, so definitely investigate it because we need answers that create a magnet rather than a mandate. No one's going to come back just because we told them to. Let's make it attractive for them, shall we? Back to you, Steve. Well done, Rob. Well said. By the way, if you could have Schnorra go ahead and bring my sound bar over to me now. Uh, it's just, it's, it's pretty easy. He can just walk straight across the showcase and bring that. I'll yeah, be Steve waiting for it right here. As soon as you uh, have a chance. Yeah, I'll be waiting on that. Rob, fantastic job as always. I'm always so grateful for the amazing work that you do out there. So thank you for bringing those stories to us. G2 Patel brought so much value and thought leadership to our two Cisco Live keynotes yesterday and today. Well, Davis Wolman had a chance to sit down with G2 to talk about AI and security, cloud, networking cloud, hybrid, and how we can really stay ahead of the competition. Let's listen in. Thanks for joining us. I am here with G2 Patel, a man who needs no introduction. He is our security and collab leader here at Cisco. G2, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to launch. This is your first again. Cisco Live. This is indeed my first Cisco. You enjoying Live. it? I'm enjoying the heck out of it. That's great. Uh, getting to do stuff like this is actually some of my favorite stuff. So, so thanks for, you, for joining. You got to get better hobbies, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's. I'll have to take you up on that. Sure. Let's launch right in. We're going to talk about AI. Seems to be everywhere right now. Uh, everywhere we look, and it's also baked into a lot of our Cisco products. What can we expect in the future as we move forward? First, you should expect a lot of innovation with AI because all of our platforms will have an underlying fabric of AI. I don't think this is just a passing fad. It is something that's going to be a fundamental shift and humanity is going to get impacted pretty dramatically as a result of AI. I think there's a huge amount of opportunity on the upside that we should all capitalize on. I also think that we have to be very responsible in the way that we move forward with AIs because there's downsides to it. And so we have a responsible AI framework. We think about that in a very diligent way before we just roll out code. Um, but in general, what you should think about with AI is it's going to be, it's going to make user experiences completely different. We're going to have AI infrastructure um, that will be a huge opportunity for us because we'll be able to power infrastructure and networking for AI data centers. Um, there's going to be uh, the ability to have AI to go out and protect cyber attacks. There's going to be AI for going out and making sure that we get more productive. AI for figuring out how to get better visibility on what's happening in the environment. So you should just expect that everywhere. I love it and I love that we're getting ahead of it, that we're on top of it. That's a priority, clearly. G2, marrying the security cloud and the networking cloud has long been a wish list item for a lot of IT leaders. Uh, what are some benefits that we're going to see immediately on that? Well, firstly, we should think about like what was what's the core premise and why are we even in the security business? Because you can't be in the connectivity business if you are not in the protection business. Right. You know? And so it's a core essential of what we need to do. And if you think about those as two isolated platforms that don't talk to each other, that wouldn't make any sense. Right. So they have to be tightly integrated. Now, we well, the way that we like to do it is they're loosely coupled and tightly integrated. We want to provide choice and freedom for customers to say, hey, I want to buy security from you even if I have networking from somewhere else or vice versa. Right. Yeah. But our security cloud and our networking cloud are going to work better than anyone else. And so we, we, you should expect a continued level of integration between our security and networking clouds because it just makes the world safer, it makes them better connected, and um, we are the best at both. Absolutely. Um, we also want to talk a little bit about hybrid work, something near and dear to your heart. What can we expect on hybrid work uh, moving forward here? You know, it's, um, it's really interesting because hybrid work is the new norm, but I think organizations have struggled in getting back post-pandemic 
into this kind of mixed mode of working where some people work at home, some people work in the office. There's been a lot of mandates. I don't think mandates always work well. Um, and um, you know what you have to do is create more of a magnet for people wanting to come back into work. And what we're trying to do is build magical experiences for people where the distance is removed. And if you have four people in a conference room, three people not in the conference room, no one should feel left out. Everyone should feel like they're kind of right there and, um, and immersed in the conversation. And the kind of innovations that we've made with AI reduce the fatigue factor, make sure that you have more focus, you come across more professional on the far end, uh, the experiences are much more immersive. Um, there's, there's a tremendous amount of um, excitement with uh, partnering with an ecosystem of providers like Microsoft and Apple and others. And so I, I just feel like there's, there's in general, there's a lot of opportunity for hybrid work. And we have done an amazing job of having, we have a very unique business in that we have hardware and we have software. And the hardware works with any of the providers and the software works with, um, with, um, with a large you know, kind of ecosystem of vendors. So we, we just have a unique advantage in this space and it continues to keep getting better every day. I'd probably say that in my 30 year career, I haven't seen the level of innovation that I've seen from both my teams in the past, um, past 18 months my word. ever in my life. That's I'm incredible. so proud of the teams. Yeah, that's eight, I mean that's that's amazing, and it I mean, makes you excited about the future, doesn't it? It sure does. Yeah. Um, I want to move into a little bit of our product line and launch this week. Yeah. Uh, new XDR, new firewalls. Uh, the list goes on. Yeah. How excited are you about this new product line? It's it's very transformational because all the products that we have, they aren't point solutions. They are all part of the security cloud platform. You know. So what we have done is we've said we just launched XDR at RSA. Uh, a few weeks ago, but then we have now the SOC assistant and the policy assistant, a new firewall and multi-cloud defense and uh, secure access. And these things seem like a lot of different technologies that are being thrown, being thrown at people, but what, the, what it basically does is allows people to connect securely from anywhere at any time right. and not have to think about security as a user and have the cognitive load go down dramatically for an IT administrator on how they manage a security environment and that be completely tied into the network. Absolutely, and while that all happens, you got to secure it end to end, which we do. So speaking of security, a lot of bad actors out there right now. They're, How are we staying getting ahead? more and more sophisticated. Yeah, what are we, what are we doing to uh, stay one step ahead of them? Well, so there's, there's a couple things that are really important. One is we have a ton of technology on preventing bad actors from being able to infiltrate your environment, right? And so all of the things that we, we talked about on, around network security and secure access and um, identity and all of these areas, we've, we've actually got a fair amount of work that's going yeah. on. But breaches are going to happen. But it's a matter of um, when they happen, not if they're going to happen. Now, as these um, breaches occur, we need to make sure that we're also very good at detecting a breach and responding and remediating that in near real time. Yeah. And so it's not just about preventing things from happening, but when bad things happen, can we provide the, the tooling and the technology and the data so that customers can be resilient enough to get back to normal as quickly as possible? Well, in the end user, you don't want them to feel that there was any sort of lapse in, in your service or anything like that, that's right? right? And that's Reduce the cognitive load, improve the manageability, get better economics, and make sure that the efficacy goes up. That's what we're trying to do. Efficacy, experience, economics. Well, you nailed it right there. I mean, my goodness. Uh, you know, with all these product launches and everything like that, you're kind of conducting a symphony here, G2. You see a future in uh, potentially maybe music or something like that? Zero chance. <laughs> okay. Actually, uh, I love listening to music. I can't sing to save my life. <laughs> I know how to sing one song, it's The Gambler. Oh, well, I mean, and it, I, I can go out of room in no time. Okay, phenomenal. <laughs> yes, so uh, you should not want me to be a musician. Well, you But know. I admire musicians, I think what they do is amazing, and I, uh, I'd prefer to be in the software industry. Okay, well, fair enough. <laughs> Kenny Rogers, sorry, he's gonna have to wait. Kenny Rogers is gonna have to wait. G2, thank you so much for your time, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome, and thank you for attending. We got lots more to come here in Cisco Live Vegas. Stay tuned. Well, G2, thank you so much for the motivation, the inspiration, brilliant job in the keynotes yesterday and today. And Davis, who's sitting right over there, fantastic job on that interview. We're going to get him up here in just a moment. We are at the very end of our day, but we are looking forward to the customer celebration tonight with Gwen Stefani and Blake Shelton. The only thing missing is all of you. While you are watching here on the stream, you got to be here in the room with us. Come on in and join us so you can be part of the celebration as well. We really appreciate it. Guys, come on in with me. Stay with us here on the broadcast.
broadcast. We're going to meet you right back here at 8 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow morning for the Cisco Live what? Brunch. On behalf of Annie and Nish and Rob <laughs> and Davis and myself, everybody, thank you so much. Have a great night. Bye, all. Bye. Bye. family is tied to the future of our home. Let's gather resources and partners, steer toward our greatest challenges and accelerate. For the benefit, for all. Cisco has made it its purpose to power an inclusive future for all. Where will we be in 50 years? Let's go see. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Humans and nature. We're in this together.